This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant Section 30 The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant Transcendental Doctrine of Elements Part Second Transcendental Logic Second Division Transcendental Dialectic Book Two Of the Dialectical Procedure of Pure Reason Chapter Two The Antinomy of Pure Reason Section Nine Of the Empirical Use of the Regulative Principle of Reason with Regard to the Cosmological Ideas 1 and 2. The Solution of the Transcendental Mathematical Ideas, and Introductory to the Solution of the Dynamical Ideas. Section 9. Of the Empirical Use of the Regulative Principle of Reason with Regard to the Cosmological Ideas. We have shown that no transcendental use can be made either of the conceptions of reason or of understanding. We have shown, likewise, that the demand of absolute totality in the series of conditions in the world of sense arises from a transcendental employment of reason, resting on the opinion that phenomena are to be regarded as things in themselves. It follows that we are not required to answer the question respecting the absolute quantity of a series whether it is in itself limited or unlimited. We are only called upon to determine how far we must proceed in the empirical regress from condition to condition in order to discover, in conformity with the rule of reason, a full and correct answer to the questions proposed by reason itself. The principle of reason is hence valid only as a rule for the extension of a possible experience. Its invalidity as a principle constitutive of phenomena in themselves having been sufficiently demonstrated. And thus, too, the antinomial conflict of reason with itself is completely put an end to, inasmuch as we have not only presented a critical solution of the fallacy lurking in the opposite statements of reason, but have shown the true meaning of the ideas which gave rise to these statements. The dialectical principle of reason has, therefore, been changed into a doctrinal principle. But in fact, if this principle, in the subjective signification which we have shown to be its only true sense, may be guaranteed as a principle of the unceasing extension of the employment of our understanding, its influence and value are just as great as if it were an axiom for the a priori determination of objects. For such an axiom could not exert a stronger influence on the extension and rectification of our knowledge otherwise than by procuring, for the principles of the understanding, the most widely expanded employment in the field of experience. 1. Solution of the cosmological idea of the totality of the composition of phenomena in the universe. Here, as well as in the case of the other cosmological problems, the ground of the regulative principle of reason is the proposition that, in our empirical regress, no experience of an absolute limit and consequently no experience of a condition, which is itself absolutely unconditioned, is discoverable. And the truth of this proposition itself rests upon the consideration that such an experience must represent to us phenomena as limited by nothing, or the mere void, on which our continued regress by means of perception must abut, which is impossible. Now, this proposition, which declares that every condition attained in the empirical regress must itself be considered empirically conditioned, contains the rule in terminis, which requires me 
to whatever extent I may have proceeded in the ascending series, always to look for some higher member in the series, whether this member is to become known to me through experience or not. Nothing further is necessary, then, for the solution of the first cosmological problem than to decide whether, in the regress to the unconditioned quantity of the universe, as regards space and time, this never-limited ascent ought to be called a regressus in infinitum or in indefinitum. The general representation which we form in our minds of the series of all past states or conditions of the world, or of all the things which at present exist in it, is itself nothing more than a possible empirical regress which is cogitated, although in an undetermined manner, in the mind, and which gives rise to the conception of a series of conditions for a given object. Footnote. The cosmical series can neither be greater nor smaller than the possible empirical regress upon which its conception is based. And as this regress cannot be a determinate infinite regress, still less a determinate finite, absolutely limited, it is evident that we cannot regard the world as either finite or infinite because the regress, which gives us the representation of the world, is neither finite nor infinite. Back to text. Now, I have a conception of the universe, but not an intuition, that is, not an intuition of it as a whole. Thus, I cannot infer the magnitude of the regress from the quantity or magnitude of the world, and determine the former by means of the latter. On the contrary, I must first of all form a conception of the quantity or magnitude of the world from the magnitude of the empirical regress. But of this regress, I know nothing more than that I ought to proceed from every given member of the series of conditions to one still higher. But the quantity of the universe is not thereby determined, and we cannot affirm that this regress proceeds in infinitum. Such an affirmation would anticipate the members of the series which have not yet been reached, and represent the number of them as beyond the grasp of any empirical synthesis. It would consequently determine the cosmical quantity prior to the regress, although only in a negative manner, which is impossible. For the world is not given in its totality in any intuition. Consequently, its quantity cannot be given prior to the regress. It follows that we are unable to make any declaration respecting the cosmical quantity in itself, not even that the regress in it is a regress in infinitum. We must only endeavor to attain to a conception of the quantity of the universe in conformity with the rule which determines the empirical regress in it. But this rule merely requires us never to admit an absolute limit to our series, how far soever we may have proceeded in it, but always on the contrary to subordinate every phenomenon to some other as its condition, and consequently to proceed to this higher phenomenon. Such a regress is, therefore, the regressus in indefinitum which, as not determining a quantity in the object, is clearly distinguishable from the regressus in infinitum. It follows from what we have said that we are not justified in declaring the world to be infinite in space, or as regards past time. For this conception of an infinite given quantity is empirical, but we cannot imply the conception of an infinite quantity to the world as an object of the senses. I cannot say, the regress from a given perception to everything limited either in space or time proceeds in infinitum, for this presupposes an infinite cosmical quantity. Neither can I say, it is finite, 
for an absolute limit is likewise impossible in experience. It follows that I am not entitled to make any assertion at all regarding the whole object of experience, the world of sense. I must limit my declarations to the rule according to which experience, or empirical knowledge, is to be attained. To the question, therefore, respecting the cosmical quantity, the first and negative answer is, the world has no beginning in time and no absolute limit in space. For, in the contrary case, it would be limited by a void time on the one hand and by a void space on the other. Now, since the world, as a phenomenon, cannot be thus limited in itself, for a phenomenon is not a thing in itself, it must be possible for us to have a perception of this limitation by a void time and a void space. But such a perception, such an experience, is impossible, because it has no content. Consequently, an absolute cosmical limit is empirically, and therefore absolutely, impossible. Footnote. The reader will remark that the proof presented above is very different from the dogmatical demonstration given in the antithesis of the first antinomy. In that demonstration, it was taken for granted that the world is a thing in itself, given in its totality, prior to all regress, and a determined position in space and time was denied to it, if it was not considered as occupying all time and all space. Hence our conclusion differed from that given above, for we inferred in the antithesis the actual infinity of the world. Back to text. From this follows the affirmative answer. The regress in the series of phenomena as a determination of the cosmical quantity proceeds in indefinitum. This is equivalent to saying the world of sense has no absolute quantity, but the empirical regress, through which alone the world of sense is presented to us on the side of its conditions, rests upon a rule, which requires it to proceed from every member of the series as conditioned to one still more remote, whether through personal experience or by means of history or the chain of cause and effect, and not to cease at any point in this extension of the possible empirical employment of the understanding. And this is the proper and only use which reason can make of its principles. The above rule does not prescribe an unceasing regress in one kind of phenomena. It does not, for example, forbid us in our ascent from an individual human being through the line of his ancestors to expect that we shall discover at some point of the regress a primeval pair, or to admit, in the series of heavenly bodies, a sun at the farthest possible distance from some center. All that it demands is a perpetual progress from phenomena to phenomena, even although an actual perception is not presented by them, as in the case of our perceptions being so weak as that we are unable to become conscious of them, since they nevertheless belong to possible experience. Every beginning is in time, and all limits to extension are in space. But space and time are in the world of sense. Consequently, Phenomena in the world are conditionally limited, but the world itself is not limited, either conditionally or unconditionally. For this reason, and because neither the world nor the cosmical series of conditions to a given conditioned can be completely given, our conception of the cosmical quantity is given only in and through the regress and not prior to it, in a collective intuition. But the regress itself is really nothing more than the determining of the cosmical quantity, and cannot therefore give us 
any determined conception of it, still less a conception of a quantity which is, in relation to a certain standard, infinite. The regress does not, therefore, proceed to infinity, an infinity given, but only to an indefinite extent. For the purpose of presenting to us a quantity, realized only in and through the regress itself. Two. Solution of the cosmological idea of the totality of the division of a whole given in intuition. When I divide a whole which is given in intuition, I proceed from a conditioned to its conditions. The division of the parts of the whole, subdivisio or decompositio, is a regress in the series of these conditions. The absolute totality of this series would be actually attained and given to the mind if the regress could arrive at simple parts. But if all the parts in a continuous decomposition are themselves divisible, the division, that is to say, the regress, proceeds from the conditioned to its conditions in infinitum, because the conditions, the parts, are themselves contained in the conditioned, and, as the latter is given in a limited intuition, the former are all given along with it. The regress cannot, therefore, be called a regressus in indefinitum, as happened in the case of the preceding cosmological idea, the regress in which proceeded from the conditioned to the conditions not given contemporaneously and along with it, but discoverable only through the empirical regress. We are not, however, entitled to affirm of a whole of this kind, which is divisible in infinitum, that it consists of an infinite number of parts. For although all the parts are contained in the intuition of the whole, the whole division is not contained therein. The division is contained only in the progressing decomposition, in the regress itself, which is the condition of the possibility and actuality of the series. Now, as this regress is infinite, all the members, parts, to which it attains must be contained in the given whole as an aggregate. But the complete series of division is not contained therein. For this series, being infinite in succession, and always incomplete, cannot represent an infinite number of members, and still less a composition of these members into a whole. To apply this remark to space, every limited part of space presented to intuition is a whole, the parts of which are always spaces, to whatever extent subdivided. Every limited space is hence divisible to infinity. Let us again apply the remark to an external phenomenon enclosed in limits, that is, a body. The divisibility of a body rests upon the divisibility of space, which is the condition of the possibility of the body as an extended whole. A body is consequently divisible to infinity, though it does not, for that reason, consist of an infinite number of parts. It certainly seems that, as a body must be cogitated as substance in space, the law of divisibility would not be applicable to it as substance. For we may, and ought to grant, in the case of space, that division or decomposition, to any extent, never can utterly annihilate composition. That is to say, the smallest part of space must still consist of spaces. Otherwise, space would entirely cease to exist, which is impossible. But the assertion on the other hand, that when all composition in matter 
is annihilated in thought, nothing remains, does not seem to harmonize with the conception of substance, which must be properly the subject of all composition, and must remain, even after the conjunction of its attributes in space, which constituted a body, is annihilated in thought. But this is not the case with substance in the phenomenal world, which is not a thing in itself cogitated by the pure category. Phenomenal substance is not an absolute subject. It is merely a permanent sensuous image, and nothing more than an intuition, in which the unconditioned is not to be found. But although this rule of progress to infinity is legitimate and applicable to the subdivision of a phenomenon as a mere occupation or filling of space, it is not applicable to a whole consisting of a number of distinct parts and constituting a quantum discretum, that is to say, an organized body. It cannot be admitted that every part in an organized whole is itself organized and that, in analyzing it to infinity, we must always meet with organized parts, although we may allow that the parts of the matter which we decompose in infinitum may be organized. For the infinity of the division of a phenomenon in space rests altogether on the fact that the divisibility of a phenomenon is given only in and through this infinity, that is, an undetermined number of parts is given, while the parts themselves are given and determined only in and through the subdivision. In a word, the infinity of the division necessarily presupposes that the whole is not already divided in se. Hence, our division determines a number of parts in the whole a number which extends just as far as the actual regress in the division, while, on the other hand, the very notion of a body organized to infinity represents the whole as already and in itself divided. We expect, therefore, to find in it a determinate, but at the same time infinite, number of parts, which is self-contradictory. For we should thus have a whole containing a series of members which could not be completed in any regress, which is infinite, and at the same time complete, in an organized composite. Infinite divisibility is applicable only to a quantum continuum, and is based entirely on the infinite divisibility of space. But, in a quantum discretum, the multitude of parts or units is always determined, and hence always equal to some number. To what extent a body may be organized, experience alone can inform us. And although, so far as our experience of this or that body has extended, we may not have discovered any inorganic part, such parts must exist in possible experience. But how far the transcendental division of a phenomenon must extend, we cannot know from experience. It is a question which experience cannot answer. It is answered only by the principle of reason, which forbids us to consider the empirical regress in the analysis of extended body as ever absolutely complete. Concluding remark on the solution of the transcendental mathematical ideas and introductory to the solution of the dynamical ideas. We presented the antinomy of pure reason in a tabular form, and we endeavored to show the ground of this self-contradiction on the part of reason and the only means of bringing it to a conclusion, namely, by declaring both contradictory statements to be false. 
we represented in these antinomies the conditions of phenomena as belonging to the conditioned according to relations of space and time, which is the usual supposition of the common understanding. In this respect, all dialectical representations of totality in the series of conditions to a given conditioned were perfectly homogeneous. The condition was always a member of the series along with the conditioned, and thus the homogeneity of the whole series was assured. In this case, the regress could never be cogitated as complete, or, if this was the case, a member really conditioned was falsely regarded as a primal member, consequently as unconditioned. In such an antinomy, therefore, we did not consider the object, that is, the conditioned, but the series of conditions belonging to the object, and the magnitude of that series. And thus arose the difficulty, a difficulty not to be settled by any decision regarding the claims of the two parties, but simply by cutting the knot, by declaring the series proposed by reason to be either too long or too short for the understanding, which could, in neither case, make its conceptions adequate with the ideas. But we have overlooked, up to this point, an essential difference existing between the conceptions of the understanding which reason endeavors to raise to the rank of ideas. Two of these, indicating a mathematical and two a dynamical synthesis of phenomena. Hitherto, it was necessary to signalize this distinction, for, just as in our general representation of all transcendental ideas, we considered them under phenomenal conditions, so, in the two mathematical ideas, our discussion is concerned solely with an object in the world of phenomena. But as we are now about to proceed to the consideration of the dynamical conceptions of the understanding, and their adequateness with ideas, we must not lose sight of this distinction. We shall find that it opens up to us an entirely new view of the conflict in which reason is involved. For, while in the first two antinomies, both parties were dismissed, on the ground of having advanced statements based upon false hypothesis, in the present case, the hope appears of discovering a hypothesis which may be consistent with the demands of reason, and the judge completing the statement of the grounds of claim, which both parties had left in an unsatisfactory state, the question may be settled on its own merits, not by dismissing the claimants, but by a comparison of the arguments on both sides. If we consider merely their extension, and whether they are adequate with ideas, the series of conditions may be regarded as all homogeneous. But the conception of the understanding which lies at the basis of these ideas contains either a synthesis of the homogeneous, presupposed in every quantity, in its composition, as well as in its division, or of the heterogeneous, which is the case in the dynamical synthesis of cause and effect, as well as of the necessary and the contingent. Thus, it happens that in the mathematical series of phenomena, no other than a sensuous condition is admissible, a condition which is itself a member of the series, while the dynamical series of sensuous conditions admits a heterogeneous condition which is not a member of the series, but, as purely intelligible, lies out of and beyond it. And thus reason is satisfied, and an unconditioned placed at the head of the series of phenomena, without introducing confusion into, or discontinuing it, contrary to the principles of the understanding. Now, from the fact that the dynamical ideas admit 
a condition of phenomena which does not form a part of the series of phenomena, arises a result which we should not have expected from an antinomy. In former cases, the result was that both contradictory dialectical statements were declared to be false. In the present case, we find the conditioned in the dynamical series connected with an empirically unconditioned but non-sensuous condition, and thus satisfaction is done to the understanding on the one hand, and to reason on the other. Footnote. For the understanding cannot admit among phenomena a condition which is itself empirically unconditioned, but if it is possible to cogitate an intelligible condition, one which is not a member of the series of phenomena, for a conditioned phenomenon, without breaking the series of empirical conditions, such a condition may be admissible as empirically unconditioned, and the empirical regress continue regular, unceasing, and intact. Back to text. While, moreover, the dialectical arguments for unconditioned totality in mere phenomena fall to the ground, both propositions of reason may be shown to be true in their proper signification. This could not happen in the case of the cosmological ideas, which demanded a mathematically unconditioned unity, for no condition could be placed at the head of the series of phenomena except one which was itself a phenomenon, and consequently a member of the series. End section 9 of the empirical use of the regulative principle of reason with regard to the cosmological ideas 1 and 2. This recording is in the public domain. Section 31. The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant. Transcendental Doctrine of Elements. Part 2nd. Transcendental Logic. Second Division. Transcendental Dialectic. Book 2. Of the Dialectical Procedure of Pure Reason. Chapter 2. The Antinomy of Pure Reason. Section 9. Of the empirical use of the regulative principle of reason with regard to the cosmological ideas. 3. Solution of the cosmological idea of the totality of the deduction of cosmical events from their causes. There are only two modes of causality cogitable, the causality of nature or of freedom. The first is the conjunction of a particular state with another preceding it in the world of sense, the former following the latter by virtue of a law. Now, as the causality of phenomena is subject to conditions of time, and the preceding state, if it had always existed, could not have produced an effect which would make its first appearance at a particular time, the causality of a cause must itself be in effect, must itself have begun to be, and therefore, according to the principle of the understanding, itself requires a cause. We must understand, on the contrary, by the term freedom, in the cosmological sense, a faculty of the spontaneous origination of a state, the causality of which, therefore, is not subordinated to another cause determining it in time. Freedom is, in this sense, a pure transcendental idea, which, in the first place, contains no empirical element, the object of which, in the second place, cannot be given or determined in any experience, because it is a universal law of the very possibility of experience that everything which happens must have a cause, that, consequently, the causality of a cause, being itself 
something that has happened, must also have a cause. In this view of the case, the whole field of experience, how far soever it may extend, contains nothing that is not subject to the laws of nature. But, as we cannot by this means attain to an absolute totality of conditions in reference to the series of causes and effects, reason creates the idea of a spontaneity, which can begin to act of itself, and without any external cause determining it to action, according to the natural law of causality. It is especially remarkable that the practical conception of freedom is based upon the transcendental idea, and that the question of the possibility of the former is difficult only as it involves the consideration of the truth of the latter. Freedom, in the practical sense, is the independence of the will of coercion by sensuous impulses. A will is sensuous in so far as it is pathologically affected by sensuous impulses. It is termed animal, arbitrium brutum, when it is pathologically necessitated. The human will is certainly an arbitrium sensitivum, not brutum, but liberum, because sensuousness does not necessitate its action, a faculty existing in man of self-determination, independently of all sensuous coercion. It is plain that, if all causality in the world of sense were natural, and natural only, every event would be determined by another according to necessary laws, and that, consequently, phenomena, in so far as they determine the will, must necessitate every action as a natural effect from themselves. And thus, all practical freedom would fall to the ground with the transcendental idea, for the latter presupposes that although a certain thing has not happened, it ought to have happened, and that, consequently, its phenomenal cause was not so powerful and determinative as to exclude the causality of our will, a causality capable of producing effects, independently of, and even in opposition to, the power of natural causes, and capable, consequently, of spontaneously originating a series of events. Here, too, we find it to be the case as we generally found in the self-contradictions and perplexities of a reason which strives to pass the bounds of possible experience, that the problem is properly not physiological but transcendental. The question of the possibility of freedom does indeed concern psychology, but, as it rests upon dialectical arguments of pure reason, its solution must engage the attention of transcendental philosophy. Before attempting this solution, a task which transcendental philosophy cannot decline, it will be advisable to make a remark with regard to its procedure in the settlement of the question. If phenomena were things in themselves, and time and space forms of the existence of things, condition and conditioned would always be members of the same series, and thus would arise in the present case the antinomy common to all transcendental ideas, that their series is either too great or too small for the understanding. The dynamical ideas, which we are about to discuss in this and the following section, possess the peculiarity of relating to an object not considered as a quantity, but as an existence, and thus, in the discussion of the present question, we may make abstraction of the quantity of the series of conditions, and consider merely the dynamical relation of the condition to the conditioned. The question, then, suggests itself, whether freedom is possible, and, if it is, whether it can consist with the universality of the natural law of causality, and, consequently, whether we enounce a proper disjunctive proposition when we say, every effect must have its origin either in nature or in freedom, or 
whether both cannot exist together in the same event in different relations. The principle of an unbroken connection between all events in the phenomenal world, in accordance with the unchangeable laws of nature, is a well-established principle of transcendental analytic, which admits of no exception. The question, therefore, is whether an effect determined according to the laws of nature can at the same time be produced by a free agent, or whether freedom and nature mutually exclude each other. And here the common but fallacious hypothesis of the absolute reality of phenomena manifests its injurious influence in embarrassing the procedure of reason. For if phenomena are things in themselves, freedom is impossible. In this case, nature is the complete and all-sufficient cause of every event, and condition and conditioned cause and effect are contained in the same series, and necessitated by the same law. If, on the contrary, phenomena are held to be, as they are in fact, nothing more than mere representations, connected with each other in accordance with empirical laws, they must have a ground which is not phenomenal. But the causality of such an intelligible cause is not determined or determinable by phenomena, although its effects, as phenomena, must be determined by other phenomenal existences. This cause and its causality exist, therefore, out of and apart from the series of phenomena, while its effects do exist and are discoverable in the series of empirical conditions. Such an effect may therefore be considered to be free in relation to its intelligible cause, and necessary in relation to the phenomena from which it is a necessary consequence, a distinction which stated in this perfectly general and abstract manner, must appear in the highest degree subtle and obscure. The sequel will explain. It is sufficient at present to remark that, as the complete and unbroken connection of phenomena is an unalterable law of nature, freedom is impossible on the supposition that phenomena are absolutely real. Hence, those philosophers who adhere to the common opinion on this subject can never succeed in reconciling the ideas of nature and freedom. Possibility of Freedom in Harmony with the Universal Law of Natural Necessity That element in a sensuous object which is not itself sensuous I may be allowed to term intelligible. If, accordingly, an object which must be regarded as a sensuous phenomenon possesses a faculty which is not an object of sensuous intuition, but by means of which it is capable of being the cause of phenomena, the causality of an object or existence of this kind may be regarded from two different points of view. It may be considered to be intelligible as regards its action, the action of a thing which is a thing in itself and sensuous as regards its effects, the effects of a phenomenon belonging to the sensuous world. We should, accordingly, have to form both an empirical and an intellectual conception of the causality of such a faculty or power, both, however, having reference to the same effect. This twofold manner of cogitating a power residing in a sensuous object does not run counter to any of the conceptions which we ought to form of the world of phenomena, or of a possible experience. Phenomena, not being things in themselves, must have a transcendental object as a foundation, which determines them as mere representations, and there seems to be no reason why we should not ascribe to this transcendental object in addition to the property of self-phenomenization, a causality whose effects are to be met with in the world of phenomena, although it is not itself a phenomenon. But every effective cause must possess a character, that is to say, 
a law of its causality, without which it would cease to be a cause. In the above case, then, every sensuous object would possess an empirical character, which guaranteed that its actions, as phenomena, stand in complete and harmonious connection, conformably to unvarying natural laws, with all other phenomena, and can be deduced from these as conditions, and that they do thus, in connection with these, constitute a series in the order of nature. This sensuous object must, in the second place, possess an intelligible character, which guarantees it to be the cause of those actions as phenomena, although it is not itself a phenomenon nor subordinate to the conditions of the world of sense. The former may be termed the character of the thing as a phenomenon, the latter the character of the thing as a thing in itself. Now this active subject would, in its character of intelligible subject, be subordinate to no conditions of time, for time is only a condition of phenomena and not of things in themselves. No action would begin or cease to be in this subject. It would consequently be free from the law of all determination of time, the law of change, namely, that everything which happens must have a cause in the phenomena of a preceding state. In one word, the causality of the subject, in so far as it is intelligible, would not form part of the series of empirical conditions which determine and necessitate an event in the world of sense. Again, this intelligible character of a thing cannot be immediately cognized, because we can perceive nothing but phenomena, but it must be capable of being cogitated in harmony with the empirical character, for we always find ourselves compelled to place, in thought, a transcendental object at the basis of phenomena, although we can never know what this object is in itself. In virtue of its empirical character, this subject would at the same time be subordinate to all the empirical laws of causality, and, as a phenomenon and member of the sensuous world, its effects would have to be accounted for by a reference to preceding phenomena. Eternal phenomena must be capable of influencing it, and its actions, in accordance with natural laws, must explain to us how its empirical character, that is, the law of its causality, is to be cognized in and by means of experience. In a word, all requisites for a complete and necessary determination of these actions must be presented to us by experience. In virtue of its intelligible character, on the other hand, although we possess only a general conception of this character, the subject must be regarded as free from all sensuous influences and from all phenomenal determination. Moreover, as nothing happens in this subject, for it is a noumenon, and there does not consequently exist in it any change demanding the dynamical determination of time, and for the same reason, no connection with phenomena as causes, this active existence must in its actions be free from and independent of natural necessity. For this necessity exists only in the world of phenomena. It would be quite correct to say that it originates or begins its effects in the world of sense from itself, although the action productive of these effects does not begin in itself. We should not be, in this case, affirming that these sensuous effects began to exist of themselves because they are always determined by prior empirical conditions, by virtue of the empirical character, which is the phenomenon of the intelligible character, and are possible only as constituting a continuation of the series of natural causes. And thus, nature and freedom, each in the complete and absolute signification of these terms, 
can exist without contradiction or disagreement in the same action. Exposition of the cosmological idea of freedom in harmony with the universal law of natural necessity. I have thought it advisable to lay before the reader at first merely a sketch of the solution of this transcendental problem in order to enable him to form, with greater ease, a clear conception of the course which reason must adopt in the solution. I shall now proceed to exhibit the several momenta of this solution, and to consider them in their order. The natural law that everything which happens must have a cause that the causality of this cause, that is, the action of the cause, which cannot always have existed, but must be itself an event, for it precedes in time some effect which it has originated, must have itself a phenomenal cause by which it is determined, and consequently all events are empirically determined in an order of nature. This law, I say, which lies at the foundation of the possibility of experience, and of a connected system of phenomena or nature, is a law of the understanding, from which no departure, and to which no exception, can be admitted. For to accept even a single phenomenon from its operation is to exclude it from the sphere of possible experience, and thus to admit it to be a mere fiction of thought, or phantom of the brain. Thus we are obliged to acknowledge the existence of a chain of causes in which, however, absolute totality cannot be found. But we need not detain ourselves with this question, for it has already been sufficiently answered in our discussion of the antinomies into which reason falls when it attempts to reach the unconditioned in the series of phenomena. If we permit ourselves to be deceived by the illusion of transcendental idealism, we shall find that neither nature nor freedom exists. Now the question is, whether, admitting the existence of natural necessity in the world of phenomena, it is possible to consider an effect as, at the same time, an effect of nature and an effect of freedom, or whether these two modes of causality are contradictory and incompatible. No phenomenal cause can absolutely and of itself begin a series. Every action, in so far as it is productive of an event, is itself an event or occurrence, and presupposes another state in which its cause existed. Thus everything that happens is but a continuation of a series, and an absolute beginning is impossible in the sensuous world. The actions of natural causes are, accordingly, themselves effects, and presuppose causes preceding them in time. A primal action which forms an absolute beginning is beyond the causal power of phenomena. Now, is it absolutely necessary that, granting that all effects are phenomena, the causality of the cause of these effects must also be a phenomenon, and belong to the empirical world? Is it not rather possible that, although every effect in the phenomenal world must be connected with an empirical cause, according to the universal law of nature, this empirical causality may be itself the effect of a non-empirical and intelligible causality, its connection with natural causes remaining, nevertheless, intact. Such a causality would be considered in reference to phenomena as the primal action of a cause, which is, in so far, therefore not phenomenal, but by reason of this faculty or power intelligible, although it must, at the same time, as a link in the chain of nature, be regarded as belonging to the sensuous world. A belief in the reciprocal causality of phenomena is necessary 
if we are required to look for and to present the natural conditions of natural events, that is to say, their causes. This being admitted as unexceptionably valid, the requirements of the understanding, which recognizes nothing but nature in the region of phenomena, are satisfied, and our physical explanations of physical phenomena may proceed in their regular course, without hindrance and without opposition. But it is no stumbling block in the way, even assuming the idea to be of pure fiction, to admit that there are some natural causes in the possession of a faculty which is not empirical but intelligible, inasmuch as it is not determined to action by empirical conditions, but purely and solely upon grounds brought forward by the understanding, this action being still, when the cause is phenomenized, in perfect accordance with the laws of empirical causality. Thus, the acting subject as a causal phenomenon would continue to preserve a complete connection with nature and natural conditions, and the phenomenon only of the subject, with all its phenomenal causality, would contain certain conditions which, if we ascend from the empirical to the transcendental object, must necessarily be regarded as intelligible. For, if we attend, in our inquiries with regard to causes in the world of phenomena, to the directions of nature alone, we need not trouble ourselves about the relation in which the transcendental subject, which is completely unknown to us, stands to these phenomena and their connection in nature. The intelligible ground of phenomena in this subject does not concern empirical questions. It has to do only with pure thought, and, although the effects of this thought and action of the pure understanding are discoverable in phenomena, these phenomena must nevertheless be capable of a full and complete explanation, upon purely physical grounds, and in accordance with natural laws. And in this case, we attend solely to their empirical, and omit all consideration of their intelligible character, which is the transcendental cause of the former, as completely unknown, except in so far as it is exhibited by the latter as its empirical symbol. Now let us apply this to experience. Man is a phenomenon of the sensuous world, and, at the same time, therefore, a natural cause, the causality of which must be regulated by empirical laws. As such, he must possess an empirical character like all other natural phenomena. We remark this empirical character in his actions, which reveal the presence of certain powers and faculties. If we consider inanimate, or merely animal, nature, we can discover no reason for ascribing to ourselves any other than a faculty which is determined in a purely sensuous manner. But man, to whom nature reveals herself only through sense, cognizes himself not only by his senses, but also through pure apperception, and this in actions and internal determinations, which he cannot regard as sensuous impressions. He is thus to himself, on the one hand, a phenomenon, but, on the other hand, in respect of certain faculties, a purely intelligible object, intelligible because its action cannot be ascribed to sensuous receptivity. These faculties are understanding and reason. The latter, especially, is in a peculiar manner distinct from all empirically conditioned faculties, for it employs ideas alone in the consideration of its objects, and by means of these determines the understanding, which then proceeds to make an empirical use of its own conceptions, which, like the ideas of reason, are pure and non-empirical. 
that reason possesses the faculty of causality, or that, at least, we are compelled so to represent it, is evident from the imperatives which, in the sphere of the practical, we impose on many of our executive powers. The words, I ought, express a species of necessity and imply a connection with grounds which nature does not and cannot present to the mind of man. Understanding knows nothing in nature but that which is, or has been, or will be. It would be absurd to say that anything in nature ought to be other than it is in the relations of time in which it stands. Indeed, the ought, when we consider merely the course of nature, has neither application nor meaning. The question, what ought to happen in the sphere of nature, is just as absurd as the question, what ought to be the properties of a circle? All that we are entitled to ask is, what takes place in nature, or, in the latter case, what are the properties of a circle? But the idea of an ought or of duty indicates a possible action the ground of which is a pure conception, while the ground of a merely natural action is, on the contrary, always a phenomenon. This action must certainly be possible under physical conditions, if it is prescribed by the moral imperative ought. But these physical or natural conditions do not concern the determination of the will itself. They relate to its effect alone, and the consequences of the effect in the world of phenomena. Whatever number of motives nature may present to my will, whatever sensuous impulses, the moral ought, it is beyond their power to produce. They may produce a volition which, so far from being necessary, is always conditioned, a volition to which the ought enunciated by reason sets an aim and a standard, gives permission or prohibition. Be the object what it may, purely sensuous, as pleasure, or presented by pure reason, as good, reason will not yield to grounds which have an empirical origin. Reason will not follow the order of things presented by experience, but, with perfect spontaneity, rearranges them according to ideas, with which it compels empirical conditions to agree. It declares, in the name of these ideas, certain actions to be necessary which nevertheless have not taken place, and which perhaps never will take place, and yet presupposes that it possesses the faculty of causality in relation to these actions, for, in the absence of this supposition, it could not expect its ideas to produce certain effects in the world of experience. Now, let us stop here, and admit it to be at least possible that reason does stand in a really causal relation to phenomena. In this case, it must, pure reason as it is, exhibit an empirical character. For every cause presupposes a rule according to which certain phenomena follow as effects from the cause. And every rule requires uniformity in these effects. And this is the proper ground of the conception of a cause as a faculty or power. Now this conception of a cause may be termed the empirical character of reason, and this character is a permanent one, while the effects produced appear, in conformity with the various conditions which accompany and partly limit them, in various forms. Thus the volition of every man has an empirical character which is nothing more than the causality of his reason in so far as its effects in the phenomenal world manifest the presence of a rule according to which we are enabled to examine in their several kinds and degrees the actions of this causality 
and the rational grounds for these actions, and, in this way, to decide upon the subjective principles of the volition. Now, we learn what this empirical character is only from phenomenal effects, and from the rule of these which is presented by experience. And for this reason, all the actions of man in the world of phenomena are determined by his empirical character, and the cooperative causes of nature. If, then, we could investigate all the phenomena of human volition to their lowest foundation in the mind, there would be no action which we could not anticipate with certainty and recognize to be absolutely necessary from its preceding conditions. So far as relates to this empirical character, therefore, there can be no freedom, and it is only in the light of this character that we can consider the human will, when we confine ourselves to simple observation and, as is the case in anthropology, institute a physiological investigation of the motive causes of human actions. But when we consider the same actions in relation to reason, not for the purpose of explaining their origin, that is, in relation to speculative reason, but to practical reason, as the producing cause of these actions, we shall discover a rule and an order very different from those of nature and experience. For the declaration of this mental faculty may be that what has and could not but take place in the course of nature ought not to have taken place. Sometimes, too, we discover, or believe that we discover, that the ideas of reason did actually stand in a causal relation to certain actions of man, and that these actions have taken place because they were determined not by empirical causes, but by the act of the will upon grounds of reason. Now, granting that reason stands in a causal relation to phenomena, can an action of reason be called free when we know that, sensuously, in its empirical character, it is completely determined and absolutely necessary? But this empirical character is itself determined by the intelligible character, the latter we cannot cognize, we can only indicate it by means of phenomena, which enable us to have an immediate cognition only of the empirical character. Footnote. The real morality of actions, their merit or demerit, and even that of our own conduct, is completely unknown to us. Our estimates can relate only to their empirical character. How much is the result of the action of free will, how much is to be ascribed to nature, and to blameless error, or to a happy constitution of temperament, Mary to Fortune, no one can discover, nor, for this reason, determine with perfect justice. Back to text. An action, then, in so far as it is to be ascribed to an intelligible cause, does not result from it in accordance with empirical laws. That is to say, not the conditions of pure reason, but only their effects in the internal sense, precede the act. Pure reason, as a purely intelligible faculty, is not subject to the conditions of time. The causality of reason in its intelligible character does not begin to be. It does not make its appearance at a certain time, for the purpose of producing an effect. If this were not the case, the causality of reason would be subservient to the natural law of phenomena, which determines them according to time, and as a series of causes and effects in time. It would consequently cease to be freedom, and become a part of nature. We are therefore justified in saying, if reason stands in a causal relation to phenomena, 
it is a faculty which originates the sensuous condition of an empirical series of effects. For the condition, which resides in the reason, is non-sensuous, and therefore cannot be originated or begin to be. And thus we find, what we could not discover in any empirical series, a condition of successive series of events in itself empirically unconditioned. For in the present case, the condition stands out of and beyond the series of phenomena. It is intelligible, and it consequently cannot be subjected to any sensuous condition, or to any time determination by a preceding cause. But, in another respect, the same cause belongs also to the series of phenomena. Man is himself a phenomenon. His will has an empirical character, which is the empirical cause of all his actions. There is no condition, determining man and his volition in conformity with his character, which does not itself form part of the series of effects in nature, and is subject to their law the law according to which an empirically undetermined cause of an event in time cannot exist. For this reason, no given action can have an absolute and spontaneous origination, all actions being phenomena and belonging to the world of experience. But it cannot be said of reason that the state in which it determines the will is always preceded by some other state determining it. For reason is not a phenomenon, and therefore not subject to sensuous conditions, and consequently, even in relation to its causality, the sequence or conditions of time do not influence reason, nor can the dynamical law of nature which determines the sequence of time according to certain rules be applied to it. Reason is consequently the permanent condition of all actions of the human will. Each of these is determined in the empirical character of the man, even before it has taken place. The intelligible character, of which the former is but the sensuous schema, knows no before or after, and every action, irrespective of the time relation in which it stands with other phenomena, is the immediate effect of the intelligible character of pure reason, which, consequently, enjoys freedom of action, and is not dynamically determined either by internal or external preceding conditions. This freedom must not be described, in a purely negative manner, as independence of empirical conditions. For in this case, the faculty of reason would cease to be a cause of phenomena. But it must be regarded positively as a faculty which can spontaneously originate a series of events. At the same time, it must not be supposed that any beginning can take place in reason. On the contrary, reason, as the unconditioned condition of all action of the will, admits of no time conditions, although its effect does really begin in a series of phenomena, a beginning which is not, however, absolutely primal. I shall illustrate this regulative principle of reason by an example from its employment in the world of experience. Proved, it cannot be, by any amount of experience, or by any number of facts, for such arguments cannot establish the truth of transcendental propositions. Let us take a voluntary action, for example, a falsehood, by means of which a man has introduced a certain degree of confusion into the social life of humanity, which is judged, according to the motives from which it originated, and the blame of which and of the evil consequences arising from it, is imputed to the offender. We at first proceed to examine the empirical character of the offense, and for this purpose we endeavor to penetrate 
to the sources of that character, such as a defective education, bad company, a shameless and wicked disposition, frivolity, and want of reflection, not forgetting also the occasioning causes which prevailed at the moment of the transgression. In this, the procedure is exactly the same as that pursued in the investigation of the series of causes which determine a given physical effect. Now, although we believe the action to have been determined by all these circumstances, we do not the less blame the offender. We do not blame him for his unhappy disposition, nor for the circumstances which influenced him, nay, not even for his former course of life, for we presuppose that all these considerations may be set aside, that the series of preceding conditions may be regarded as having never existed, and that the action may be considered as completely unconditioned in relation to any state preceding, just as if the agent commenced with it an entirely new series of effects. Our blame of the offender is grounded upon a law of reason which requires us to regard this faculty as a cause, which could have, and ought to have, otherwise determined the behavior of the culprit, independently of all empirical conditions. This causality of reason we do not regard as a cooperating agency, but as complete in itself. It matters not whether the sensuous impulses favored or opposed the action of this causality. The offense is estimated according to its intelligible character. The offender is decidedly worthy of blame the moment he utters a falsehood. It follows that we regard reason, in spite of the empirical conditions of the act, as completely free, and therefore, as in the present case, culpable. The above judgment is complete evidence that we are accustomed to think that reason is not affected by sensuous conditions, that in it no change takes place, although its phenomena, in other words, the mode in which it appears in its effects, are subject to change, that in it no preceding state determines the following, and consequently that it does not form a member of the series of sensuous conditions which necessitate phenomena according to natural laws. Reason is present, and the same, in all human actions and at all times, but it does not itself exist in time, and therefore does not enter upon any state in which it did not formerly exist. It is, relatively to new states or conditions, determining, but not determinable. Hence, we cannot ask, why did not reason determine itself in a different manner? The question ought to be thus stated. Why did not reason employ its power of causality to determine certain phenomena in a different manner? but this is a question which admits of no answer. For a different intelligible character would have exhibited a different empirical character. And when we say that, in spite of the course which his whole former life had taken, the offender could have refrained from altering the falsehood, this means merely that the act was subject to the power and authority, permissive or prohibitive, of reason. Now, reason is not subject in its causality to any conditions of phenomena or of time, and a difference in time may produce a difference in the relation of phenomena to each other, for these are not things, and therefore not causes in themselves. But it cannot produce any difference in the relation in which the action stands to the faculty of reason. Thus, then, in our investigation into free actions and the causal power which produced them, we arrive at an intelligible cause, beyond which, however, we cannot go. 
although we can recognize that it is free, that is, independent of all sensuous conditions, and that, in this way, it may be the sensuously unconditioned condition of phenomena. But for what reason the intelligible character generates such and such phenomena, and exhibits such and such an empirical character under certain circumstances, it is beyond the power of our reason to decide. The question is as much above the power and the sphere of reason as the following would be. Why does the transcendental object of our external sensuous intuition allow of no other form than that of intuition in space? But the problem, which we were called upon to solve, does not require us to entertain any such questions. The problem was merely this, whether freedom and natural necessity can exist without opposition in the same action. To this question we have given a sufficient answer, for we have shown that, as the former stands in a relation to a different kind of condition from those of the latter, the law of the one does not affect the law of the other, and that, consequently, both can exist together in independence of and without interference with each other. The reader must be careful to remark that my intention in the above remarks has not been to prove the actual existence of freedom as a faculty in which resides the cause of certain sensuous phenomena. For, not to mention that such an argument would not have a transcendental character, nor have been limited to the discussion of pure conceptions, all attempts at inferring from experience what cannot be cogitated in accordance with its laws must ever be unsuccessful. Nay, more, I have not even aimed at demonstrating the possibility of freedom, for this, too, would have been a vain endeavor, inasmuch as it is beyond the power of the mind to cognize the possibility of a reality or of a causal power by the aid of mere a priori conceptions. Freedom has been considered in the foregoing remarks only as a transcendental idea, by means of which reason aims at originating a series of conditions in the world of phenomena with the help of that which is sensuously unconditioned, involving itself, however, in an antinomy with the laws which itself prescribes for the conduct of the understanding. That this antinomy is based upon a mere illusion, and that nature and freedom are at least not opposed, this was the only thing in our power to prove and the question which it was our task to solve. End 3. Solution of the Cosmological Ideas of the Totality of the Deduction of Cosmical Events from Their Causes This recording is in the public domain. Section 32. The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant. Transcendental Doctrine of Elements. Part 2nd. Transcendental Logic. Second Division. Transcendental Dialectic. Book 2 of The Dialectical Procedure of Pure Reason. Chapter 2. The Antinomy of Pure Reason. Section 9 of the empirical use of the regulative principle of reason with regard to the cosmological ideas. 4. Solution of the cosmological idea of the totality of the dependence of phenomenal existences. And Concluding Remarks on the Antinomy of Pure Reason. In the preceding remarks, we considered the changes in the world of sense as constituting a dynamical series, in which 
each member is subordinated to another as its cause. Our present purpose is to avail ourselves of this series of states or conditions as a guide to an existence which may be the highest condition of all changeable phenomena, that is, to a necessary being. Our endeavor to reach, not the unconditioned causality, but the unconditioned existence of substance. The series before us is therefore a series of conceptions, and not of intuitions, in which the one intuition is the condition of the other. But it is evident that, as all phenomena are subject to change and conditioned in their existence, the series of dependent existences cannot embrace an unconditioned member, the existence of which would be absolutely necessary. It follows that, if phenomena were things in themselves, and, as an immediate consequence from this supposition, condition and conditioned belonged to the same series of phenomena, the existence of a necessary being, as the condition of the existence of sensuous phenomena, would be perfectly impossible. An important distinction, however, exists between the dynamical and the mathematical regress. The latter is engaged solely with the combination of parts into a whole, or with the division of a whole into its parts, and therefore are the conditions of its series parts of the series, and to be consequently regarded as homogeneous, and for this reason as consisting, without exception, of phenomena. In the former regress, on the contrary, the aim of which is not to establish the possibility of an unconditioned whole consisting of given parts, or of an unconditioned part of a given whole, but to demonstrate the possibility of the deduction of a certain state from its cause, or of the contingent existence of substance from that which exists necessarily, it is not requisite that the condition should form part of an empirical series along with the conditioned. In the case of the apparent antinomy with which we are at present dealing, there exists a way of escape from the difficulty, for it is not impossible that both of the contradictory statements may be true in different relations. All sensuous phenomena may be contingent, and consequently possess only an empirically conditioned existence, and yet there may also exist a non-empirical condition of the whole series, or, in other words, a necessary being. For this necessary being, as an intelligible condition, would not form a member, not even the highest member, of the series. The whole world of sense would be left in its empirically determined existence uninterfered with and uninfluenced. This would also form a ground of distinction between the modes of solution employed for the third and fourth antinomies, for, while in the consideration of freedom in the former antinomy, the thing itself, the cause, substantia phenomenon, was regarded as belonging to the series of conditions, and only its causality to the intelligible world. We are obliged in the present case to cogitate this necessary being as purely intelligible, and as existing entirely apart from the world of sense, as an ens extra mundanum, for otherwise it would be subject to the phenomenal law of contingency and dependence. In relation to the present problem, therefore, the regulative principle of reason is that everything in the sensuous world possesses an empirically conditioned existence, that no property of the sensuous world possesses unconditioned necessity, that we are bound to expect, and, so far as is possible, to seek for the empirical condition of every member in the series of conditions, and that there is no sufficient reason to justify us in deducing any existence from a condition which lies out of and beyond the empirical series, or in regarding any existence as independent and self-subsistent, 
although this should not prevent us from recognizing the possibility of the whole series being based upon a being which is intelligible, and for this reason, free from all empirical conditions. But it has been far from my intention in these remarks to prove the existence of this unconditioned and necessary being, or even to evidence the possibility of a purely intelligible condition of the existence of all sensuous phenomena. As bounds were set to reason, to prevent it from leaving the guiding thread of empirical conditions and losing itself in transcendent theories which are incapable of concrete presentation, so it was my purpose, on the other hand, to set bounds to the law of the purely empirical understanding, and to protest against any attempts on its part at deciding on the possibility of things, or declaring the existence of the intelligible to be impossible, merely on the ground that it is not available for the explanation and exposition of phenomena. It has been shown, at the same time, that the contingency of all the phenomena of nature and their empirical conditions is quite consistent with the arbitrary hypothesis of a necessary, although purely intelligible, condition, that no real contradiction exists between them, and that, consequently, both may be true. The existence of such an absolutely necessary being may be impossible, but this can never be demonstrated from the universal contingency and dependence of sensuous phenomena, nor from the principle which forbids us to discontinue the series at some member of it, or to seek for its cause in some sphere of existence beyond the world of nature. Reason goes its way in the empirical world, and follows, too, its peculiar path in the sphere of the transcendental. The sensuous world contains nothing but phenomena which are mere representations and always sensuously conditioned. Things in themselves are not, and cannot be, objects to us. It is not to be wondered at, therefore, that we are not justified in leaping from some member of an empirical series beyond the world of sense, as if empirical representations were things in themselves existing apart from their transcendental ground in the human mind, and the cause of whose existence may be sought out of the empirical series. This would certainly be the case with contingent things, but it cannot be with mere representations of things, the contingency of which is itself merely a phenomenon, and can relate to no other regress than that which determines phenomena, that is, the empirical. But to cogitate an intelligible ground of phenomena as free, moreover, from the contingency of the latter, conflicts neither with the unlimited nature of the empirical regress, nor with the complete contingency of phenomena. And the demonstration of this was the only thing necessary for the solution of this apparent antinomy. For, if the condition of every conditioned, as regards its existence, is sensuous, and for this reason a part of the same series, it must be itself conditioned, as was shown in the antithesis of the fourth antinomy. The embarrassments into which a reason which postulates the unconditioned necessarily falls must, therefore, continue to exist, or the unconditioned must be placed in the sphere of the intelligible. In this way, its necessity does not require, nor does it even permit, the presence of an empirical condition, and it is, consequently, unconditionally necessary. The empirical employment of reason is not affected by the assumption of a purely intelligible being. It continues its operations on the principle of the contingency of all phenomena, proceeding from empirical conditions to still higher and higher conditions, themselves empirical. Just as little does this regulative principle exclude the assumption of an intelligible cause, when the question regards merely the pure employment of reason in relation to ends or aims. For, in this case, an intelligible cause signifies merely the transcendental and, to us unknown, 
ground of the possibility of sensuous phenomena, and its existence, necessary and independent of all sensuous conditions, is not inconsistent with the contingency of phenomena, or with the unlimited possibility of regress which exists in the series of empirical conditions. Concluding Remarks on the antinomy of pure reason. So long as the object of our rational conceptions is the totality of conditions in the world of phenomena, and the satisfaction, from this source, of the requirements of reason, so long are our ideas transcendental and cosmological. But when we set the unconditioned, which is the aim of all our inquiries, in a sphere which lies out of the world of sense and possible experience, our ideas become transcendent. They are then not merely serviceable towards the completion of the exercise of reason, which remains an idea, never executed, but always to be pursued. They detach themselves completely from experience, and construct for themselves objects, the material of which has not been presented by experience and the objective reality of which is not based upon the completion of the empirical series, but upon pure a priori conceptions. The intelligible object of these transcendent ideas may be conceded as a transcendental object, but we cannot cogitate it as a thing determinable by certain distinct predicates relating to its internal nature for it has no connection with empirical conceptions. Nor are we justified in affirming the existence of any such object. It is, consequently, a mere product of the mind alone. Of all the cosmological ideas, however, it is that occasioning the fourth antinomy which compels us to venture upon this step. For the existence of phenomena, always conditioned and never self-subsistent, requires us to look for an object different from phenomena, an intelligible object, with which all contingency must cease. But, as we have allowed ourselves to assume the existence of a self-subsistent reality out of the field of experience, and are therefore obliged to regard phenomena as merely a contingent mode of representing intelligible objects employed by beings which are themselves intelligences. No other course remains for us than to follow analogy and employ the same mode in forming some conception of intelligible things, of which we have the least knowledge which nature taught us to use in the formation of empirical conceptions. Experience made us acquainted with the contingent, but we are at present engaged in the discussion of things which are not objects of experience, and must, therefore, deduce our knowledge of them from that which is necessary absolutely and in itself, that is, from pure conceptions. Hence, the first step which we take out of the world of sense obliges us to begin our system of new cognition with the investigation of a necessary being, and to deduce from our conceptions of it all our conceptions of intelligible things. This we propose to attempt in the following chapter. End chapter 2 of the deduction of the pure conceptions of the understanding. This recording is in the public domain. Section 33 of the Critique of Pure Reason The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant Transcendental Doctrine of Elements Part Second Transcendental Logic Second Division Transcendental Dialectic Book Two Of the Dialectical Procedure of Pure Reason Chapter Three The Ideal 
of Pure Reason. Sections 1 and 2. Section 1. Of the Ideal in General. We have seen that pure conceptions do not present objects to the mind, except under sensuous conditions, because the conditions of objective reality do not exist in these conceptions, which contain, in fact, nothing but the mere form of thought. They may, however, when applied to phenomena, be presented in concreto, for it is phenomena that present to them the materials for the formation of empirical conceptions, which are nothing more than concrete forms of the conceptions of the understanding. But ideas are still further removed from objective reality than categories, for no phenomenon can ever present them to the human mind in concreto. They contain a certain perfection, attainable by no possible empirical cognition, and they give to reason a systematic unity to which the unity of experience attempts to approximate, but can never completely attain. But still further removed than the idea from objective reality is the ideal, by which term I understand the idea, not in concreto but in individuo, as an individual thing, determinable or determined by the idea alone. The idea of humanity in its complete perfection supposes not only the advancement of all the powers and faculties which constitute our conception of human nature to a complete attainment of their final aims but also everything which is requisite for the complete determination of the idea. For of all contradictory predicates, only one can conform with the idea of the perfect man. What I have termed an ideal was in Plato's philosophy an idea of the divine mind, an individual object present to its pure intuition, the most perfect of every kind of possible beings, and the archetype of all phenomenal existences. Without rising to these speculative heights, we are bound to confess that human reason contains not only ideas, but ideals, which possess, not like those of Plato, creative but certainly practical power, as regulative principles, and form the basis of the perfectibility of certain actions. Moral conceptions are not perfectly pure conceptions of reason, because an empirical element of pleasure or pain lies at the foundation of them. In relation, however, to the principle, whereby reason sets bounds to a freedom which is in itself without law, and consequently, when we attend merely to their form, they may be considered as pure conceptions of reason. Virtue and wisdom in their perfect purity are ideas. But the wise man of the Stoics is an ideal, that is to say, a human being existing only in thought and in complete conformity with the idea of wisdom. As the idea provides a rule, so the ideal serves as an archetype for the perfect and complete determination of the copy. Thus the conduct of this wise and divine man serves us as a standard of action, with which we may compare and judge ourselves, which may help us to reform ourselves, although the perfection it demands can never be attained by us. Although we cannot concede objective reality to these ideals, they are not to be considered as chimeras. On the contrary, they provide reason with a standard, which enables it to estimate, by comparison, the degree of incompleteness in the objects presented to it. But to aim at realizing the ideal in an example in the world of experience, to describe, for instance, the character of the perfectly wise man in a romance, is impracticable. Nay, more, there is something absurd in the attempt, and the result must be little edifying, as the natural limitations, which are continually breaking in upon the perfection and completeness of the idea, destroy the illusion in the story, and throw an air of suspicion even on what is good in the idea, which hence appears fictitious and unreal. Such is the constitution of the ideal of reason, which is always based upon determinate conceptions, and serves as a rule and a model for limitation or of criticism. Very different is the nature of the ideals of the imagination. Of these it is impossible to present an intelligible conception. They are a kind of monogram, drawn according to no determinate rule, and forming rather a vague picture, the production of many diverse experiences, than a determinate image. 
Such are the ideals which painters and physiognomists profess to have in their minds, and which can serve neither as a model for production nor as a standard for appreciation. They may be termed, though improperly, sensuous ideals, as they are declared to be models of certain possible empirical intuitions. They cannot, however, furnish rules or standards for explanation or examination. In its ideals, reason aims at complete and perfect determination, according to a priori rules, and hence it cogitates an object which must be completely determinable in conformity with principles, although all empirical conditions are absent, and the conception of the object is on this account transcendent. Section 2 of the Transcendental Ideal Prototypon Transcendentale Every conception is, in relation to that which is not contained in it, undetermined and subject to the principle of determinability. This principle is that, of every two contradictorily opposed predicates, only one can belong to a conception. It is a purely logical principle, itself based upon the principle of contradiction, inasmuch as it makes complete abstraction of the content and attends merely to the logical form of the cognition. But again, everything, as regards its possibility, is also subject to the principle of complete determination, according to which one of all the possible contradictory predicates of things must belong to it. This principle is not based merely upon that of contradiction, for, in addition to the relation between two contradictory predicates, it regards everything as standing in a relation to the sum of possibilities, as the sum total of all predicates of things, and, while presupposing this sum as an a priori condition, presents to the mind everything as receiving the possibility of its individual existence from the relation it bears to, and the share it possesses in, the aforesaid sum of possibilities. Footnote 64. Thus this principle declares everything to possess a relation to a common correlate, the sum total of possibility, which, if discovered to exist in the idea of one individual thing, would establish the affinity of all possible things, from the identity of the ground of their complete determination. The determinability of every conception is subordinate to the universality. Algemenheit universalitis of the principle of excluded middle, the determination of a thing to the totality, allheit universitis, of all possible predicates. End footnote. The principle of complete determination relates to the content and not to the logical form. It is the principle of the synthesis of all the predicates which are required to constitute the complete conception of a thing and not a mere principal analytical representation, which announces that one of two contradictory predicates must belong to a conception. It contains, moreover, a transcendental presupposition, that, namely, of the material for all possibility, which must contain a priori the data for this or that particular possibility. The proposition, everything which exists is completely determined, means not only that one of every pair of given contradictory attributes, but that one of all possible attributes, is always predicable of the thing. In it the predicates are not merely compared logically with each other, but the thing itself is transcendentally compared with the sum total of all possible predicates. The proposition is equivalent to saying, To attain to a complete knowledge of a thing, it is necessary to possess a knowledge of everything that is possible and to determine it thereby in a positive or negative manner. The conception of complete determination is consequently a conception which cannot be presented in its totality in concreto, and is therefore based upon an idea, which has its seat in the reason. The faculty which prescribes to the understanding the laws of its harmonious and perfect exercise now, although this idea of the sum total of all possibility, in so far as it forms the condition of the complete determination of everything, is itself undetermined in relation to the predicates which may constitute this sum total, and we cogitate in it merely the sum total of all possible predicates, we nevertheless find, upon closer examination, 
that this idea, as a primitive conception of the mind, excludes a large number of predicates, those deduced, and those irreconcilable with others, and that it is evolved as a conception completely determined a priori. Thus it becomes the conception of an individual object, which is completely determined by and through the mere idea, and must consequently be termed an ideal of pure reason. When we consider all possible predicates, not merely logically, but transcendentally, that is to say, with reference to the content which may be cogitated as existing in them a priori, we shall find that some indicate a being, others merely a non-being. The logical negation expressed in the word not does not properly belong to a conception, but only to the relation of one conception to another in a judgment and is consequently quite insufficient to present to the mind the content of a conception. The expression not mortal does not indicate that a non-being is cogitated in the object. It does not concern the content at all. A transcendental negation, on the contrary, indicates non-being in itself, and is opposed to transcendental affirmation, the conception of which of itself expresses a being. Hence, this affirmation indicates a reality, because in and through it objects are considered to be something, to be things, while the opposite negation, on the other hand, indicates a mere want, or privation, or absence. And, where such negations alone are attached to a representation, the non-existence of anything corresponding to the representation. Now a negation cannot be cogitated as determined, without cogitating at the same time the opposite affirmation. The man born blind has not the least notion of darkness, because he has none of the light. The vagabond knows nothing of poverty, because he has never known what it is to be in comfort. Footnote 65 The investigations and calculations of astronomers have taught us much that is wonderful but the most important lesson we have received from them is the discovery of the abyss of our ignorance in relation to the universe, an ignorance the magnitude of which reason, without the information thus derived, could never have conceived. This discovery of our deficiencies must produce a great change in the determination of the aims of human reason. End footnote. The ignorant man has no conception of his ignorance because he has no conception of knowledge. All conceptions of negatives are accordingly derived or deduced conceptions, and realities contain the data and, so to speak, the material or transcendental content of the possibility and complete determination of all things. If, therefore, a transcendental substratum lies at the foundation of the complete determination of things, a substratum which is to form the fund from which all possible predicates of things are to be supplied, this substratum cannot be anything else than the idea of a sum total of reality, omnitudo realitatis. In this view, negations are nothing but limitations, a term which could not, with propriety, be applied to them, if the unlimited, the all, did not form the true basis of our conception. This conception of a sum total of reality is the conception of a thing in itself, regarded as completely determined, and the conception of an ens realissimum is the conception of an individual being, inasmuch as it is determined by that predicate of all possible contradictory predicates, which indicates and belongs to being. It is, therefore, a transcendental ideal which forms the basis of the complete determination of everything that exists, and is the highest material condition of its possibility a condition on which must rest the cogitation of all objects with respect to their content. Nay, more, this ideal is the only proper ideal of which the human mind is capable, because in this case alone a general conception of a thing is completely determined by and through itself, and cognized as a representation of an individuum. The logical determination of a conception is based upon a disjunctive syllogism the major of which contains the logical division of the extent of a general conception. The minor limits this extent to a certain part. 
while the conclusion determines the conception by this part. The general conception of a reality cannot be divided a priori, because, without the aid of experience, we cannot know any determinate kinds of reality, standing under the former as the genus. The transcendental principle of the complete determination of all things is therefore merely the representation of the sum total of all reality. It is not a conception which is the genus of all predicates under itself, but one which comprehends them all within itself. The complete determination of a thing is consequently based upon the limitation of this total of reality. So much being predicated of the thing, while all that remains over is excluded. A procedure which is in exact agreement with that of the disjunctive syllogism and the determination of the objects in the conclusion by one of the members of the division. It follows that reason, in laying the transcendental ideal at the foundation of its determination of all possible things, takes a course in exact analogy with that which it pursues in disjunctive syllogisms. A proposition which formed the basis of the systematic division of all transcendental ideas, according to which they are produced in complete parallelism with the three modes of syllogistic reasoning employed by the human mind. It is self-evident that reason, in cogitating the necessary complete determination of things, does not presuppose the existence of a being corresponding to its ideal, but merely the idea of the ideal, for the purpose of deducing from the unconditional totality of complete determination. The ideal is therefore the prototype of all things, which, as defective copies, ectipa, receive from it the material of their possibility, and approximate to it more or less, though it is impossible that they can ever attain to its perfection. The possibility of things must therefore be regarded as derived, except that of the thing which contains in itself all reality, which must be considered to be primitive and original. For all negations, and they are the only predicates by means of which all other things can be distinguished from the ans realismum, are mere limitations of a greater and a higher, nay, the highest, reality. And they consequently presuppose this reality, and are, as regards their content, derived from it. The manifold nature of things is only an infinitely various mode of limiting the conception of the highest reality which is their common substratum, just as all figures are possible only as different modes of limiting infinite space. The object of the ideal of reason, an object existing only in reason itself, is also termed the primal being, ans originarium, as having no existence superior to him, the supreme being, ans summum, and as being the condition of all other beings which rank under it, the being of all beings, ans and tium. But none of these terms indicate the objective relation of an actually existing object to other things, but merely that of an idea to conceptions, and our investigations into this subject still leave us in perfect uncertainty with regard to the existence of this being. A primal being cannot be said to consist of many other beings with an existence which is derivative, for the latter presuppose the former, and therefore cannot be constitutive parts of it. It follows that the ideal of the primal being must be cogitated as simple. The deduction of the possibility of all other things from this primal being cannot, strictly speaking, be considered as a limitation, or as a kind of division of its reality, for this would be regarding the primal being as a mere aggregate, which has been shown to be impossible although it was so represented in our first rough sketch. The highest reality must be regarded rather as the ground than as the sum total of the possibility of all things. And the manifold nature of things be based not upon the limitation of the primal being itself, but upon the complete series of effects which flow from it. And thus all our powers of sense, as well as all phenomenal reality, may be with propriety regarded as belonging to this series of effects, while they could not have formed parts of the idea considered as an aggregate. 
Pursuing this track, and hypothesizing this idea, we shall find ourselves authorized to determine our notion of the Supreme Being by means of the mere conception of a highest reality, as one, simple, all-sufficient, eternal, and so on, in one word, to determine it in its unconditioned completeness by the aid of every possible predicate. The conception of such a being is the conception of God in its transcendental sense, and thus the idea of pure reason is the object matter of a transcendental theology. But, by such an employment of the transcendental idea, we should be overstepping the limits of its validity and purpose. For reason placed it, as the conception of all reality, at the basis of the complete determination of things, without requiring that this conception be regarded as the conception of an objective existence. Such an existence would be purely fictitious, and the hypothesizing of the content of the idea into an ideal, as an individual being, is a step perfectly unauthorized. Nay, more, we are not even called upon to assume the possibility of such an hypothesis, as none of the deductions drawn from such an ideal would affect the complete determination of things in general, for the sake of which alone is the idea necessary. It is not sufficient to circumscribe the procedure and the dialectic of reason. We must also endeavor to discover the sources of this dialectic that we may have it in our power to give a rational explanation of this illusion, as a phenomenon of the human mind. For the ideal, of which we are at present speaking, is based not upon an arbitrary, but upon a natural idea. The question hence arises, how happens it that reason regards the possibility of all things as deduced from a single possibility, that, to wit, of the highest reality, and presupposes this as existing in an individual and primal being? The answer is ready. It is at once presented by the procedure of transcendental analytic. The possibility of sensuous objects is a relation of these objects to thought, in which something, the empirical form, may be cogitated a priori, while that which constitutes the matter, the reality of the phenomenon, that element which corresponds to sensation, must be given from without, as otherwise it could not even be cogitated by, nor could its possibility be presentable to the mind. Now a sensuous object is completely determined, when it has been compared with all phenomenal predicates, and represented by means of these either positively or negatively. But, as that which constitutes the thing itself, the real in a phenomenon, must be given and that in which the real of all phenomena is given is experience. One, soul, and all-embracing. The material of the possibility of all sensuous objects must be presupposed as given in a whole, and it is upon the limitation of this whole that the possibility of all empirical objects, their distinction from each other and their complete determination, are based. Now, no other objects are presented to us besides sensuous objects, and these can be given only in connection with a possible experience. It follows that a thing is not an object to us unless it presupposes the whole or sum total of empirical reality as the condition of its possibility. Now, a natural illusion leads us to consider this principle, which is valid only of sensuous objects, as valid with regards to things in general. And thus, we are induced to hold the empirical principle of our conceptions of the possibility of things, as phenomena, by leaving out this limitative condition to be a transcendental principle of the possibility of things in general. We proceed afterwards to hypothesize this idea of the sum total of all reality, by changing the distributive unity of the empirical exercise of the understanding into the collective unity of an empirical whole a dialectical illusion, and by cogitating this whole or sum of experience as an individual thing, containing in itself all empirical reality. This individual thing or being is then, by means of the above-mentioned transcendental surreption, substituted for our notion of a thing which stands at the head of the possibility of all things, 
the real conditions of whose complete determination it presents. Footnote 66 This ideal of the ans realissimum, although merely a mental representation, is first objectivized, that is, has an objective existence attributed to it, then hypostasized, and finally by the natural progress of reason to the completion of unity personified, as we shall show presently. For the regulative unity of experience is not based upon phenomena themselves, but upon the connection of the variety of phenomena by the understanding in a consciousness, and thus the unity of the supreme reality and the complete determinability of all things seem to reside in a supreme understanding and consequently in a conscious intelligence. End footnote. End of section. Section 34 The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant Transcendental Doctrine of Elements Part 2nd Transcendental Logic Second Division Transcendental Dialectic Book 2 Of the Dialectical Procedure of Pure Reason Chapter 3 The Ideal of Pure Reason Sections 3 and 4. Recording by M. L. Cohen, Cleveland, Ohio, March 2007. Of the arguments employed by speculative reason in proof of the existence of a supreme being. Notwithstanding the pressing necessity which reason feels to form some presupposition that shall serve the understanding as a proper basis for the complete determination of its conceptions, the idealistic and factitious nature of such a presupposition is all too evident to allow reason for a moment to persuade itself into a belief of the objective existence of a mere creation of its own thought. But there are other considerations which compel reason to seek out some resting place in the regress from the conditioned to the unconditioned, which is not given as an actual existence from the mere conception of it, although it alone can give completeness to the series of conditions. And this is the natural course of every human reason even of the most uneducated, although the path at first entered it does not always continue to follow. It does not begin from conceptions, but from common experience, and requires a basis in actual existence. But this basis is insecure, unless it rests upon the immovable rock of the absolutely necessary. And this foundation is itself unworthy of trust, if it leave under and above it empty space if it do not fill all and leave no room for a why or wherefore, if it be not in one word infinite in its reality. If we admit the existence of some one thing, whatever it may be, we must also admit that there is something which exists necessarily. For what is contingent exists only under the condition of some other thing, which as its cause, and from this we must go on to conclude the existence of a cause which is not contingent, and which consequently exists, necessarily and unconditionally. Such is the argument by which reason justifies its advances towards a primal being. Now reason looks round for the conception of a being that may be admitted, without inconsistency, to be worthy of the attribute of absolute necessity, not for the purpose of inferring a priori from the conception of such a being its subjective existence, parens, for if reason allowed itself to take this course, it would not require a basis and given an actual existence, but merely the support of pure conceptions, close parens, but for the purpose of discovering among all our conceptions of possible things, that conception which possesses no element inconsistent with the idea of absolute necessity. For that there must be some absolutely necessary existence, it regards as a truth already established. Now, if it can remove every existence incapable of supporting the attribute of absolute necessity, excepting one, this must be the absolutely necessary being, whether its necessity is comprehensible by us, that is, deductible for the conception of it alone, or not. Now that, the conception of which contains a therefore to every wherefore, which is not defective in any respect whatever, 
which is all sufficient as a condition, seems to be the being of which we can justly predict absolute necessity, for this reason, that, possessing the conditions of all that is possible, it does not and cannot itself require any condition, and thus it satisfies, in one respect at least, the requirements of the conception of absolute necessity. In this view, it is superior to all other conceptions which, as deficient and incomplete, do not possess the characteristic of independence of all higher conditions. It is true that we cannot infer from this what does not contain in itself the supreme and complete condition. The condition of all other things must possess only a conditioned existence, but as little can we assert the contrary, for this supposed being does not possess the only characteristic which can enable reason to cognize by means of an a priori conception the unconditioned and necessary nature of its existence. The conception of an ans realism is that which best agrees with the conception of an unconditioned and necessary being. The former conception does not satisfy all the requirements of the latter, but we have no choice. We are obliged to adhere to it, for we find that we cannot do without the existence of a necessary being. And even, although we admit it, we find it out of our power to discover in the whole sphere of possibility any being that could advance well-grounded claims in such a distinction. The following is, therefore, the natural course of human reason. It begins by persuading itself of the existence of some necessary being. In this being, it recognizes the characteristics of unconditioned existence. It then seeks the conception of that which is independent of all conditions and finds it in that which is itself the sufficient condition of all other things, in other words, in that which contains all reality. But the unlimited all is an absolute unity, and is conceived by the mind as a being, one and supreme, and thus reason concludes that the supreme being, as the primal basis of all things, possesses an existence which is absolutely necessary. This conception must be regarded as in some degree satisfactory if we admit the existence of a necessary being and consider that there exists a necessity for a definite and final answer to these questions. In such a case, we cannot make a better choice, or rather, we have no choice at all, but feel ourselves obliged to declare in favor of the absolute unity of complete reality as the highest source of the possibility of things. But if there exists no motive for coming to a definite conclusion, and we may leave the question unanswered till we have fully weighed both sides, in other words, when we are merely called upon to decide how much we happen to know about the question, and how much we merely flatter ourselves that we know, the above conclusion does not appear to be so great advantage, but, on the contrary, seems defective in the grounds upon which it is supported. 4. Admitting the truth of all that has been said, that namely the inference from a given existence, parentheses my own for example, and parentheses, to the existence of an unconditioned and necessary being is valid and unassailable, that in the second place we must consider a being which contains all reality, and consequently all the conditions of other things, to be absolutely unconditioned, and admitting too that we have thus discovered the conception of a thing to which may be attributed, without inconsistency, absolute necessity, it does not follow from all this that the conception of a limited being, in which the supreme reality does not reside, is therefore incompatible with the idea of absolute necessity. For although I do not discover the element of the unconditioned in the conception of such a being, an element which is manifestly existent in the sum total of all conditions, I am not entitled to conclude that its existence is therefore conditioned, just as I am not entitled to affirm, in a hypothetical syllogism, that where a certain condition does not exist, parens, in the present completeness as far as pure conceptions are concerned, close parens, the condition does not exist either. On the contrary, we are free to consider all limited beings as likewise unconditionally necessary, although we are unable to infer this from the general conception which we have of them. Thus conducted, this argument is incapable of giving us the least notion of the properties of a necessary being and must be in every respect without result. This argument continues, however, to possess a weight and an authority which, in spite of its objective insufficiency, 
it has never been divested of. For, granting that certain responsibilities lie upon us, which, as based on the ideas of reason, deserve to be respected and submitted to, although they are incapable of a real or practical application to our nature, or, in other words, would be responsibilities without motives, except upon the supposition of a supreme being to give effect and influence to the practical laws, in such a case we should be bound to obey our conceptions which, although objectively insufficient, do, according to the standard of reason, preponderate over and are superior to any claims that may be advanced from any other quarter. The equilibrium of doubt would in this case be destroyed by a practical addition. Indeed, reason would be compelled to condemn herself if she refused to comply with the demands of the judgment, no superior to which we know, however defective her understanding of the grounds of these demands might be. This argument, although in fact transcendental, inasmuch as it rests upon the intrinsic insufficiency of the contingent, is so simple and natural that the commonest understanding can appreciate its value. We see things around us change, arise, and pass away. They or their condition must therefore have a cause. The same demand must again be made of the cause itself, as a datum of experience. Now it is natural that we should place the highest causality just where we place the supreme causality, in that being which contains the conditions of all possible effects, and the conception of which is so simple as that of an all-embracing reality. This highest cause, then, we regard as absolutely necessary, because we find it absolutely necessary to rise to it, and do not discover any reason for proceeding beyond it. Thus, among all nations, through the darkest polytheism glimmer some faint sparks of monotheism, to which these idolaters have been led, not from reflection and profound thought, but by the study and natural progress of the common understanding. There are only three modes of proving the existence of a deity, on the grounds of speculative reason. All the paths conducting to this end begin either from the determinate experience and the peculiar constitution of the world of sense, and rise according to the laws of causality from it to the highest cause existing apart from the world, or from a purely indeterminate experience, that is, some empirical existence, or abstraction is made of all experience, and the existence of a supreme cause is concluded from a priori conceptions alone. The first is the physiotheological argument, the second the cosmological, the third the ontological. More there are not and more there cannot be. I shall show it as unsuccessful on the one path, the empirical, as on the other, the transcendental, and that it stretches its wings in vain to soar beyond the world of sense by the mere might of speculative thought. As regards the order in which we must discuss those arguments, it will be exactly the reverse of that in which reason, in the progress of its development, attains to them, the order in which they are placed above. For it will be made manifest to the reader that, although experience presents the occasion and the starting point, it is the transcendental idea of reason which guides it in its pilgrimage and is the goal of all its struggles. I shall therefore begin with an examination of the transcendental argument, and afterwards inquire what additional strength has accrued to this mode of proof from the addition of the empirical element. Section Roman numeral 4 of the impossibility of an ontological proof of the existence of God. It is evident from what has been said that the conception of an absolute necessary being is a mere idea, the objective reality of which is far from being established by the mere fact it is a need of reason. On the contrary, this idea serves merely to indicate a certain unattainable perfection and rather limits the operations than, by the presentation of new objects, extends the sphere of the understanding. But a strange anomaly meets us at the very threshold, for the inference from a given existence in general to an absolutely necessary existence seems to be correct and unavoidable, while the conditions of the understanding refuse to aid us in forming any conception of such a being. Philosophers have always talked of an absolutely necessary being, and have nevertheless declined to take the trouble of conceiving whether, and how, a being of this nature is even cogitable, not to mention that its existence is actually demonstrable. 
A verbal definition of the conception is certainly easy enough. It is something the non-existence of which is impossible. But does this definition throw any light upon the conditions which render it impossible to cogitate the non-existence of a thing? Conditions which we wish to ascertain, that we may discover whether we think anything in the conception of such a being or not? For the mere fact that I throw away, by means of the word unconditioned, all the conditions which the understanding habitually requires in order to regard anything as necessary, is very far from making clear whether by means of the conception of the unconditionally necessary I think of something, or really of nothing at all. Nay, more, this chance conception, now become so current, may have endeavored to explain by examples which seem to render any inquiries regarding its intelligibility quite needless. Every geometrical proposition, a triangle has three angles, it was said is absolutely necessary, and thus people talked of an object which lay out of the sphere of understanding, as if it were perfectly plain what the conception of such a being meant. All the examples adduced have been drawn, without exception, from judgments and not from things. But the unconditioned necessity of a judgment does not form the absolute necessity of a thing. On the contrary, the absolute necessity of a judgment is only a conditioned necessity of a thing or of the predicate in a judgment. The proposition above mentioned does not announce that three angles necessarily exist, but upon condition that a triangle exists, three angles must necessarily exist in it. And thus this logical necessity has been the source of the greatest delusions. Having formed an a priori conception of a thing, the content of which was made to embrace existence, we believed ourselves, safe in concluding that, because existence belongs necessarily to the object of the conception, parens, that is, under the condition of my positing this thing as given, close parens, the existence of the thing is also posited necessarily, and that it is therefore absolutely necessary merely because its existence has been cogitated in the conception. If, in an identical judgment, I annihilate the predicate in thought and retain the subject, a contradiction is the result, and hence I say the former belongs necessarily to the latter. But if I suppress both subject and predicate in thought, no contradiction arises, for there is nothing at all and therefore no means of forming a contradiction. To suppose the existence of a triangle, and not that of its three angles, is self-contradictory, but to suppose the non-existence of both triangle and angles is perfectly admissible. And so it is with the conception of an absolutely necessary being. Annihilate its existence in thought, and you annihilate the thing itself with all its predicates. How then can there be any room for contradiction? Externally, there is nothing to give rise to a contradiction for a thing cannot be necessary externally nor internally for, by the annihilation of suppression of the thing itself, its internal properties are also annihilated. God is omnipotent. That is a necessary judgment. His omnipotence cannot be denied if the existence of a deity is posited, the existence, that is, of an infinite being, the two conceptions being identical. But when you say, God does not exist, neither omnipotence nor any other predicate is affirmed. They must all disappear with the subject, and in this judgment there cannot exist the least self-contradiction. You have thus seen that when the predicate of a judgment is annihilated in thought along with its subject, no internal contradiction can arise, be the predicate what it may. There is no possibility of evading the conclusion. You find yourselves compelled to declare... There are certain subjects which cannot be annihilated in thought. But this is nothing more than saying, there exist subjects which are absolutely necessary, the very hypothesis which you are called upon to establish. For I find myself unable to form the slightest conception of a thing which, when annihilated in thought with all its predicates, leaves behind a contradiction. And contradiction is the only criterion of impossibility in the sphere of pure a priori conceptions. Against these general considerations, the justice of which no one can dispute, one argument is adduced, which is regarded as furnishing a satisfactory demonstration from the fact. It is affirmed that there is one and only one conception in which the non-being or annihilation of the object is self-contradictory, and this is the conception of an ans realissimum. It possesses, you say, all reality, and you feel yourselves justified in admitting the possibility of such a being. Friends, 
This I am willing to grant for the present, although the existence of a conception which is not self-contradictory is far from being sufficient to prove the possibility of an object. Close parens. Footnote. A conception is always possible if it is not self-contradictory. This is the logical criterion of possibility distinguishing the object of such conception from the nihil negativum. But it may be, notwithstanding, an empty conception, unless the objective reality of the synthesis, but which it has generated, is demonstrated. And proof of this kind must be based upon principles of possible experience, and not upon the principle of analysis or contradiction. This remark may be serviceable as a warning against concluding from the possibility of a conception, which is logical, the possibility of a thing, which is real. End footnote. Now the notion of all reality embraces in it that of existence. The notion of all existence lies, therefore, in the conception of this possible thing. If this thing is annihilated in thought, the internal possibility of the thing is also annihilated, which is self-contradictory. I answer. It is absurd to introduce, under whatever term disguised, into the conception of a thing which is to be cogitated solely in reference to its possibility, the conception of its existence. If this is admitted, you will have apparently gained the day, but in reality have announced nothing but a mere tautology. I ask, is the proposition, this or that thing, prens, which I am admitting to be possible, close prens, exists an analytical or a synthetical proposition? If the former, there is no addition made to the subject of your thought by the affirmation of its existence. But then, the conception in your minds is identical with the thing itself, or you have supposed the existence of a thing to be possible, and then inferred its existence from its internal possibility, which is but a miserable tautology. The word reality in the conception of the thing, and the word existence in the conception of the predicate, will not help you out of the difficulty. For supposing you were to term all positing of a thing reality, you have thereby posited the thing with all its predicates in the conception of the subject and assumed its actual existence, and this you merely repeat in the predicate. But if you confess, as every reasonable person must, that every existential proposition is synthetical, how can it be maintained that the predicate of existence cannot be denied without contradiction? a property which is the characteristic of analytical propositions, alone. I should have a reasonable hope of putting an end forever to this sophistical mode of argumentation. By a strict definition of the conception of existence, did not my own experience teach me that the illusion arising from our confounding a logical with a real predicate, parens, a predicate which aids in the determination of a thing, and parens, resists almost all endeavors of explanation and illustration. A logical predicate may be what you please. Even the subject may be predicated of itself, for logic pays no regard to the content of a judgment. But the determination of a conception is a predicate, which adds to and enlarges the conception. It must not, therefore, be contained in the conception. Being is evidently not a real predicate, that is, a conception of something which is added to the conception of some other thing. It is merely the positing of a thing, or of certain determinations in it. Logically, it is merely the copula of a judgment. The preposition, God is omnipotent, contains two conceptions, which have a certain object or content. The word is, is no additional predicate. It merely indicates the relation of the predicate to the subject. Now if I take the subject, parentheses God and parentheses, with all its predicates, Parentheses, omnipotence being one, close parentheses, and say God is, or there is a God, I add no new predicate to the conceptions of God. I merely posit or affirm the existence of the subject with all its predicates. I posit the object in relation to my conception. The content of both is the same, and there is no addition made to the conception, which expresses merely the possibility of the object by my cogitating the object. In the expression, it is, as absolutely given or existing. Thus the real contains no more than the possible. A hundred real dollars contain no more than a hundred possible dollars. For, as the latter indicates the conception, and the former the object, on the supposition that the content of the former was greater than that of the latter, my conception would not be an expression of the whole object, and would consequently be an inadequate conception of it. 
but in reckoning my wealth there may be said to be more in a hundred real dollars than in a hundred possible dollars, that is, in the mere conception of them. For the real object, the dollars, is not analytically contained in my conception, but forms a synthetical addition to my conception, parens, which is merely a determination of my mental state, close parens, although this objective reality, this existence, apart from my conceptions, does not in the least degree increase the aforesaid hundred dollars. By whatever, and by whatever number of predicates, even to the complete determination of it, I may cogitate a thing. I do not in the least augment the object of my conceptions by the addition of the statement, this thing exists. Otherwise, not exactly the same, but something more than what was cogitated in my conception would exist, and I could not affirm that the exact object of my conception had real existence. If I cogitate a thing as containing all modes of reality except one, the mode of reality which is absent is not added to the conception of the thing by the affirmation that the thing exists. On the contrary, the thing exists, if it exists at all, with the same defect as that cogitated in its conception. Otherwise, not that which was cogitated, but something different exists. Now, if I cogitate a being as the highest reality, without defect or imperfection, the question still remains, whether this being exists or not. For, although no element is wanting in the possible real content of my conception, there is a defect in its relation to my mental state. That is, I am ignorant whether the cognition of the object indicated by the conception is possible a posteriori. And here the cause of the present difficulty becomes apparent. If the question regarded an object of sense merely, it would be impossible for me to confound the conception with the existence of a thing. For the conception merely enables me to cogitate an object as according with the general conditions of experience, while the existence of the object permits me to cogitate it as contained in the sphere of actual experience. At the same time, this connection with the world of experience does not in the least augment the conception, although a possible perception has been added to the experience of the mind. But if we cogitate existence by the pure category alone, it is not to be wondered at that we should find ourselves unable to present any criterion sufficient to distinguish it from mere possibility. Whatever be the content of our conception of an object, it is necessary to go beyond it, if we wish to predicate existence of the object. In the case of sensuous objects, this is attained by their connection, according to empirical laws, with some one of my perceptions. But there is no means of cognizing the existence of objects of pure thought, because it must be cognized completely a priori. But all our knowledge of existence, parens, be it immediately by perception, or by inferences connecting some object with a perception, close parens, belongs entirely to the sphere of experience, which is in a perfect unity with itself, and although an existence out of the sphere cannot be absolutely declared to be impossible, it is a hypothesis the truth of which we have no means of ascertaining. The notion of a supreme being is in many respects a highly useful idea, but for the very reason that it is an idea, it is incapable of enlarging our cognition with regard to the existence of things. It is not even sufficient to instruct us as to the possibility of a being which we do not know to exist. The analytical criterion of possibility, which consists in the absence of contradiction and propositions, cannot be denied it. But the connection of real properties in a thing is a synthesis of the possibility of which an a priori judgment cannot be formed, because these realities are not presented to us specifically. And even if this were to happen, a judgment would still be impossible, because the criterion of the possibility of synthetical cognitions must be sought for in the world of experience, to which the object and idea cannot belong. And thus the celebrated Leibniz has utterly failed in his attempt to establish upon a priori grounds the possibility of this sublime ideal being. The celebrated ontological or Cartesian argument for the existence of a supreme being is therefore insufficient. And we may as well hope to increase our stock of knowledge by the aid of mere ideas, as the merchant to augment his wealth by the addition of noughts to his cash account. End of section 34.
Section 35 The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant Transcendental Doctrine of Elements Part 2nd Transcendental Logic Second Division Transcendental Dialectic Book 2 Of the Dialectical Procedure of Pure Reason Chapter 3 The Ideal of Pure Reason Section 5 Of the Impossibility of a Cosmological Proof of the Existence of God Recording by M. L. Cohen, Cleveland, Ohio, March 2007 Of the Impossibility of a Cosmological Proof of the Existence of God it was by no means a natural course of proceeding, but on the contrary, an invention entirely due to the subtlety of the schools to attempt to draw from a mere idea a proof of the existence of an object corresponding to it. Such a course would never have been pursued were it not for that need of reason which requires it to suppose the existence of a necessary being as a basis for the empirical regress, and that, as this necessity must be unconditioned in a priori, reason is bound to discover a conception which shall satisfy, if possible, this requirement, and enable us to attain to the a priori cognition of such a being. This conception was thought to be found in the idea of an ans realissimum, and thus the idea was employed for the attainment of a better defined knowledge of a necessary being, of the existence of which we were convinced or persuaded on other grounds. Thus reason was seduced from her natural courage, and, instead of concluding with the conception of an ans realissimum, an attempt was made to begin with it, for the purpose of inferring from it that idea of a necessary existence which it was in fact called into complete. Thus arose that unfortunate ontological argument, which neither satisfies the healthy common sense of humanity, nor sustains the scientific examination of the philosopher. The cosmological proof, which we are about to examine, retains the connection between absolute necessity and the highest reality, but instead of reasoning from this highest reality to a necessary existence, like the preceding argument, it concludes from the given unconditioned necessity of some being its unlimited reality. The track it pursues, whether rational or sophistical, is at least natural, and not only goes far to persuade the common understanding but shows itself deserving of respect from the speculative intellect, while it contains, at the same time, the outlines of all the arguments employed in natural theology, arguments which always have been, and still will be, in use and authority. These, however adorned and hid under whatever embellishments of rhetoric and sentiment, are at bottom identical with the arguments we are at present to discuss. This proof, Turbi Leibniz the argumentum a contingia mundi, I shall now lay before the reader, and subject to a strict examination. It is framed in the following manner. If something exists, an absolutely necessary being must likewise exist. Now I, at least, exist. Consequently, there exists an absolutely necessary being. The minor contains an experience, the major reasons from a general experience to the existence of a necessary being. Footnote. This inference is too well known to require more detailed discussion. It is based upon the spurious tension of the law of causality, that everything which is contingent has a cause which, if itself contingent, must also have a cause and so on, till the series of subordinated causes must end with an absolutely necessary cause, without which it would not possess completeness. End footnote. Thus the argument really begins at experience, and is not completely a priori or ontological. The object of all possible experience being the world, it is called the cosmological proof. It contains no reference to any peculiar property of sensuous objects, by which this world of sense might be distinguished from the other possible worlds. And in this respect it differs from the physico-theological proof, which is based upon the consideration of the peculiar constitution of our sensuous world. The proof proceeds thus. A necessary being can be determined only in one way, that is, it can be determined by only one of all possible opposed predicates. Consequently, it must be completely determined in and by its conception. But there is only a single conception of a thing possible, 
which completely determines the thing a priori, that is, the conception of the ens realissimum. It follows that the conception of the ens realissimum is the only conception by and in which we can cogitate a necessary being. Consequently, a supreme being necessarily exists. In this cosmological argument are assembled so many sophistical propositions that speculative reason seems to have exerted in it all her dialectical skill to produce a transcendental illusion of the most extreme character. We shall postpone an investigation of this argument for the present and confine ourselves to exposing the stratagem by which it imposes upon us an old argument in a new dress and appeals to the agreement of two witnesses the one with the credentials of pure reason, and the other with those of empiricism. While, in fact, it is only the former who has changed his dress and voice for the purpose of passing himself off for an additional witness. That it may possess a secure foundation, it bases its conclusions upon experience, and thus appears to be completely distinct from the ontological argument, which places its confidence entirely in pure a priori conceptions. But this experience merely aids reason in making one step to the existence of a necessary being. What the properties of this being are cannot be learned from experience, and therefore reason abandons it altogether, and pursues its inquiries in the sphere of pure conception, for the purpose of discovering what the properties of an absolutely necessary being ought to be, that is, what among all possible things contain the conditions parentheses, requisita, close parens, of absolute necessity. Reason believes that it has discovered these requisites in the conception of an ens realissimum, and in it alone, and hence concludes, the ens realissimum is an absolutely necessary being. But it is evident that reason has here presupposed that the conception of an ens realissimum is perfectly adequate to the conception of a being of absolute necessity, that is, that we may infer the existence of the latter from that of the former a proposition which formed the basis of the ontological argument and which is now employed in the support of the cosmological argument, contrary to the wish and professions of its inventors. For the existence of an absolutely necessary being is given in conceptions alone. But if I say, the conception of the ens realissimum is a conception of this kind, and in fact the only conception which is adequate to our idea of necessary being, I am obliged to admit that the latter may be inferred from the former. Thus it is properly the ontological argument which figures in the cosmological and constitutes the whole strength of the latter, while the spurious basis of experience has been of no further use than to conduct us to the conception of absolute necessity, being utterly insufficient to demonstrate the presence of this attribute in any determinate existence or thing. For when we propose to ourselves an aim of this character, we must abandon the sphere of experience and rise to that of pure conceptions, which we examine with the purpose of discovering whether any one contains the conditions of the possibility of an absolutely necessary being. But if the possibility of such a being is thus demonstrated, its existence is also proved. For we may then assert that, of all possible beings, there is one which possesses the attribute of necessity. In other words, this being possesses an absolutely necessary existence. All allusions in an argument are more easily detected when they are presented in the formal manner employed by the schools, which we now proceed to do. If the proposition, quote, every absolutely necessary being is likewise an ens realissimum, end quote, is correct, parens, and it is this which constitutes the nervous probandi of the cosmological argument, it must, like all affirmative judgments, be capable of conversion, the conversio per accidens at least. It follows, then, that some of the entia realissima are absolutely necessary beings. But no ens realissimum is in any respect different from another, and what is valid for some is valid for all. In this present case, therefore, I may employ simple conversion and say, quote, every ens realissimum is a necessary being, end quote. But as this proposition is determined a priori by the conceptions contained in it, the mere conception of an ens realissimum must possess the additional attribute of absolute necessity. But this is exactly what was maintained in the ontological argument, and not recognized by the cosmological, although it formed the real ground of its disguised and illusory reasoning. 
Thus the second mode employed by speculative reason of demonstrating the existence of a supreme being is not only like the first loser in inadequate, but possesses the additional blemish of an ignoratio elinci, professing to conduct us by a new road to the desired goal, but bringing us back, after a shortcut, to the old path which we had deserted at its call. I mentioned above that this cosmological argument contains a perfect nest of dialectical assumptions, which transcendental criticism does not find it difficult to expose and to dissipate. I shall merely enumerate these, leaving it to the reader, who must by this time be well practiced in such matters, to investigate the fallacies residing therein. The following fallacies, for example, are discoverable in this mode of proof. 1. The transcendental principle, quote, everything that is contingent must have a cause, end quote, a principle without significance, except in the sensuous world. For the purely intellectual conception of the contingent cannot produce any synthetical proposition, like that of causality, which is itself without significance or distinguishing characteristic, except in the phenomenal world. But in the present case, it is employed to help us beyond the limits of its sphere. 2. Quote, from the impossibility of an infinite ascending series of causes in the world of sense, a first cause is inferred, end quote. A conclusion which the principles of the employment of reason do not justify, even in the sphere of experience, and still less when an attempt is made to pass the limits of this sphere. 3. Reason allows itself to be satisfied upon insufficient grounds with regard to the completion of this series. It removes all conditions, parens, without which, however, no conception of necessity can take place, close parens, and, as after this it is beyond our power to form any other conceptions, it accepts this as a completion of the conception it wishes to form of the series. 4. The logical possibility of a conception of the total of reality, parens, the criteria of this possibly being the absence of contradiction, close parens, is confounded with the transcendental which requires a principle of the practicability of such a synthesis, a principle which again refers us to the world of experience, and so on. The aim of the cosmological argument is to avoid the necessity of proving the existence of a necessary being priori from mere conceptions, a proof which must be ontological, and of which we feel ourselves quite incapable. With this purpose, we reason from an actual existence, an experience in general, to an absolutely necessary condition of that existence. It is in this case unnecessary to demonstrate its possibility, for after having proved that it exists, the question regarding its possibility is superfluous. Now, when we wish to define more strictly the nature of this necessary being, we do not look out for some being the conception of which would enable us to comprehend the necessity of its being, for if we could do this, an empirical presupposition would be unnecessary. No, we try to discover merely the negative condition, parens, conditio sine qua non, close parens, without which a being would not be absolutely necessary. Now this would be perfectly admissible in every sort of reasoning, from a consequence to its principle, but in the present case it unfortunately happens that the condition of absolute necessity can be discovered in but a single being the conception of which must consequently contain all that is requisite for demonstrating the presence of absolute necessity, and thus entitle me to infer this absolute necessity a priori. That is, it must be possible to reason conversely and say, the thing to which the conception of the highest reality belongs is absolutely necessary. But if I cannot reason thus, and I cannot unless I believe in the sufficiency of the ontological argument, I find insurmountable obstacles in my new path, and am really no farther than the point from which I set out. The conception of a supreme being satisfies all questions a priori regarding the internal determinations of a thing, and is for this reason an ideal without equal or parallel, the general conception of it indicating it as at the same time an ons individuum among all possible things. But the conception does not satisfy the question regarding its existence, which was the purpose of all our inquiries, and, although the existence of a necessary being were admitted, we should find it impossible to answer the question, what of all things in the world must be regarded as such? It is certainly allowable to admit the existence of an all-sufficient being, 
a cause of all possible effects, for the purposes of enabling reason to introduce unity into its mode and grounds of explanation with regard to phenomena. But to assert that such a being necessarily exists is no longer the modest enunciation of an admissible hypothesis, but the boldest declaration of an apodictic certainty, for the cognition of that which is absolutely necessary must itself possess that character. The aim of the transcendental ideal formed by the mind is either to discover a conception which shall harmonize with the idea of absolute necessity, or a conception which shall contain that idea. If the one is possible, so is the other, for reason recognizes that alone as absolutely necessary, which is necessary from its conception. But both attempts are equally beyond our power. We find it impossible to satisfy the understanding upon this point, and as impossible to induce it to remain at rest in relation to this incapacity. Unconditioned necessity, which, as the ultimate support and stay of all existing things, is an indispensable requirement of the mind, is an abyss on the verge of which human reason trembles in dismay. Even the idea of eternity, terrible and sublime as it is, as depicted by Haller, does not produce upon the mental vision such a feeling of awe and terror. For, although it measures the duration of things, it does not support them. We cannot bear, nor can we rid ourselves of the thought that a being, which we regard as the greatest of all possible existences, should say to himself, I am from eternity to eternity. Besides me, there is nothing, except that which exists by my will. Whence then I am? Here all sinks away from under us, and the greatest, as the smallest perfection, hovers without stay or footing in the presence of the speculative reason, which finds it as easy to part with one as with the other. Many physical powers, which evidence their existence by their effects, are perfectly inscrutable in their nature. They elude all our powers of observation. The transcendental object which forms the basis of phenomena and, in connection with it, the reason why our sensibility possesses this rather than that particular kind of conditions are and must ever remain hidden from our mental vision. The fact is there, the reason of the fact we cannot see. But an ideal of pure reason cannot be termed mysterious or inscrutable, because the only credential of its reality is the need of it felt by reason, for the purpose of giving completeness to the world of synthetical unity. An ideal is not even given as a cogitable object, and therefore cannot be inscrutable. On the contrary, it must, as a mere idea, be based on the constitution of reason itself, and on this account must be capable of explanation and solution. For the very essence of reason consists in its ability to give an account of all our conceptions, opinions, and assertions upon objective, or, when they happen to be illusory and fallacious, upon subjective grounds. Subheading Detection and explanation of the dialectical illusions in all transcendental arguments for the existence of a necessary being. And subheading. Both of the above arguments are transcendental. In other words, they do not proceed upon empirical principles. For, although the cosmological argument professed to lay a basis of experience for its edifice of reasoning, it did not ground its procedure upon the peculiar constitution of experience, but upon pure principles of reason in relation to an existence given by empirical consciousness, utterly abandoning its guidance, however, for the purpose of supporting its assertions entirely upon pure conceptions. Now what is the cause, in these transcendental arguments, of the dialectical but natural illusion which connects the conceptions of necessity and supreme reality, and hypothesizes that which cannot be anything but an idea? What is the cause of this unavoidable step on the part of reason? of admitting that some one among all existing things must be necessary while it falls back from the assertion of the existence of such a being as from the abyss? And how does reason proceed to explain this anomaly to itself, and from the wavering condition of a timid and reluctant approbation, always again withdrawn, arrive at a calm and settled insight into its cause? It is something very remarkable that on the supposition that something exists, I cannot avoid the inference that something exists necessarily. Upon this perfectly natural, but not on that account reliable, inference does the cosmological argument rest. 
but let me form any conception whatever of a thing, I find that I cannot cogitate the existence of the thing as absolutely necessary, and that nothing prevents me, be the thing or being what it may, from cogitating its non-existence. I may thus be obliged to admit that all existing things have a necessary basis, while I cannot cogitate any single or individual thing as necessary. In other words, I can never complete the regress through the conditions of existence without admitting the existence of a necessary being, but, on the other hand, I cannot make a commencement from this being. If I must cogitate something as existing necessarily as the basis of existing things, and yet I am not permitted to cogitate any individual thing as in itself necessary, the inevitable inference is that necessity and contingency are not properties of things themselves. Otherwise, an internal contradiction would result, that consequently neither of these principles are objective, but merely subjective principles of reason, the one requiring us to seek from a necessary ground for everything that exists, that is, to be satisfied with no other explanation than that which is complete a priori, the other forbidding us ever to hope for the attainment of this completeness, that is, to regard no member of the empirical world as unconditioned. In this mode of viewing them, both principles in their purely heuristic and regulative character, and as concerning merely the formal interest of reason, are quite consistent with each other. The one says, quote, You must philosophize upon nature, end quote, as if there existed a necessary primal basis of all existing things, solely for the purpose of introducing systematic unity into your knowledge, by pursuing an idea of this character, a foundation which is arbitrarily admitted to be ultimate, while the other warns you to consider no individual determination concerning the existence of things, as such an ultimate foundation that is as absolutely necessary, but to keep the way always open for further progress in the deduction, and to treat every determination as determined by some other. But if all that we perceive must be regarded as conditionally necessary, it is impossible that anything which is empirically given should be absolutely necessary. It follows from this that you must accept the absolutely necessary as out of and beyond the world inasmuch as it is useful only as a principle of the highest possible unity experience, and you cannot discover any such necessary existence in the world, the second rule requiring you to regard all empirical causes of unity as themselves deduced. The philosophers of antiquity regarded all the forms of nature as contingent, while matter was considered by them, in accordance with the judgment of the common reason of mankind, as primal and necessary. But if they had regarded matter, not relatively, as the substratum of phenomena, but absolutely and in it itself, as an independent existence, this idea of absolute necessity would have immediately disappeared. For there is nothing absolutely connecting reason with such an existence. On the contrary, it can annihilate it in thought, always and without self-contradiction. But in thought alone lay the idea of absolute necessity. A regulative principle must, therefore, have been at the foundation of this opinion. In fact, extension and impenetrability, which together constitute our conception of matter, form the supreme empirical principle of the unity of phenomena. And this principle, in so far as it is empirically unconditioned, possesses the property of a regulative principle. But, as every determination of matter which constitutes what is real in it, and consequently impenetrability, is an effect, which must have a cause and is for this reason always derived, the notion of matter cannot harmonize with the idea of a necessary being, in its character of the principle of all derived unity. For every one of its real properties, being derived, must only conditionally be necessary, and can therefore be annihilated in thought, and thus the whole existence of matter can be so annihilated or suppressed. If this were not the case, we should have found in the world of phenomena the highest ground or condition of unity which is impossible, according to the second regulative principle. It follows that matter, and, in general, all that forms part of the world of sense, cannot be a necessary primal being, nor even a principle of empirical unity, but that this being or principle must have its place assigned without the world. And in this way, we can proceed in perfect confidence to deduce the phenomena of the world and their existence from other phenomena, just as if there existed no necessary being, and we can at the same time strive without ceasing towards the attainment of completeness for our deduction, just as if such a being, the supreme condition of all existences, were presupposed by the mind. 
These remarks will have made it evident to the reader that the ideal of the Supreme Being, far from being an announcement of the existence of a being in itself necessary, is nothing more than a regulative principle of reason, requiring us to regard all connection existing between phenomena as if it had its origin from an all-sufficient necessary cause, and basing upon this the rule of a systematic and necessary unity in the explanation of phenomena. We cannot, at the same time, avoid regarding, by a transcendental subreptio, this formal principle as constitutive and hypostasizing this unity. Precisely similar is the case with our notion of space. Space is the primal condition of all forms, which are properly just so many different limitations of it. And thus, although it is merely a principle of sensibility, we cannot help regarding it as an absolutely necessary and self-subsistent thing, as an object given a priori in itself. In the same way, it is quite natural that, as the systematic unity of nature cannot be established as a principle for the empirical employment of reason, unless it is based upon the idea of an ans realissimum, as the supreme cause, we should regard this idea as a real object, and this object, in its character of supreme condition, as absolutely necessary, and that in this way a regulative should be transformed into a constitutive principle. This interchange becomes evident when I regard the supreme being, which, relatively to the world, was absolutely, parentheses, unconditionally, and parentheses, necessary, as a thing per se. In this case, I find it impossible to represent the necessity in or by any conception, and it exists merely in my own mind as the formal condition of thought, but not as a material and hypostatic condition of existence. End of section 35. Section 36 The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant Transcendental Doctrine of Elements Part 2nd Transcendental Logic 2nd Division Transcendental Dialectic Book 2 of the Dialectical Procedure of Pure Reason Chapter 3 The Ideal of Pure Reason Sections 6 and seven. Recording by M. L. Cohen, Cleveland, Ohio, March 2007. The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant of the Impossibility of a Physico Theological Proof. If then neither a pure conception nor the general experience of an existing being can provide a sufficient basis for the proof of the existence of the Deity, we can make the attempt by the only other mode that of grounding our argument upon a determinate experience of the phenomena of the present world, their constitution and disposition, and discover whether we can thus attain to a sound conviction of the existence of a supreme being. This argument we shall term the physico-theological argument. If it is shown to be insufficient, speculative reason cannot present us with any satisfactory proof of the existence of a being corresponding to our transcendental idea. It is evident from the remarks that have been made in the preceding sections that an answer to this question will be far from being difficult or unconvincing. For how can any experience be adequate with an idea? The very essence of an idea consists in the fact that no experience can ever be discovered congruent or adequate with it. The transcendental idea of a necessary and all-sufficient being is so immeasurably great, so high above all that is empirical, which is always conditioned, that we hope in vain to find materials in the sphere of experience sufficiently ample for our conception, and in vain seek the unconditioned among things that are conditioned, while examples, nay even guidance, is denied us by the laws of empirical synthesis. If the Supreme Being forms a link in the chain of empirical conditions, it must be a member of the empirical series, and, like the lower members which it precedes, have its origin in some higher member of the series. If, on the other hand, we disengage it from the chain, and cogitate it as an intelligible being apart from the series of natural causes, how shall reason bridge the abyss that separates the latter from the former? 
all laws respecting the regress from effects to causes, all synthetical additions to our knowledge relate solely to possible experience and the objects of the sensuous world, and apart from them are without significance. The world around us opens before our view so magnificent a spectacle of order, variety, beauty, and conformity to ends, that whether we pursue our observation into the infinity of space in the one direction, or into its inimitable divisions in the other, whether we regard the world in its greatest or its least manifestations, even after we have attained to the highest summit of knowledge which our weak minds can reach, we find that language in the presence of wonders so inconceivable has lost its force, and number its power to reckon, nay, even thought fails to conceive adequately, and our conception of the whole dissolves into an astonishment without power of expression, all the more eloquent that it is dumb. Everywhere around us we observe a chain of causes and effects, of means and ends, of death and birth, and, as nothing has entered of itself into the condition in which we find it, we are constantly referred to some other thing, which itself suggests the same inquiry regarding its cause, and thus the universe must sink into the abyss of nothingness, unless we admit that, besides this infinite chain of contingencies, there exists something that is primal and self-subsistent, something which, as the cause of this phenomenal world, secures its continuance and preservation. This highest cause, what magnitude shall we attribute to it? Of the content of the world we are ignorant. Still less can we estimate its magnitude by comparison with the sphere of the possible. But this supreme cause being a necessity of the human mind, what is there to prevent us from attributing to it such a degree of perfection as to place it above the sphere of all that is possible? This we can easily do, although only by the aid of the faint outline of an abstract conception, by representing this being to ourselves as containing in itself, as an individual substance, all possible perfection, a conception which satisfies that requirement of reason which demands parsimony in principles, which is free from self-contradiction, which even contributes to the extension of the employment of reason and experience, by means of the guidance afforded by this idea to order and system and which in no respect conflicts with any law of experience. This argument always deserves to be mentioned with respect. It is the oldest, the clearest, and that most in conformity with the common reason of humanity. It animates the study of nature, as it itself derives its existence and draws ever new strength from that source. It introduces aims and ends into a sphere in which our observation could not of itself have discovered them, and extends our knowledge of nature by directing our attention to a unity, the principle of which lies beyond nature. This knowledge of nature again reacts upon this idea, its cause, and thus our belief in a divine author of the universe rises to the power of an irresistible conviction. For these reasons, it would be utterly hopeless to attempt to rob this argument of the authority it has always enjoyed. The mind, unceasingly elevated by these considerations, which, although empirical, are so remarkably powerful, and continually adding to their force, will not suffer itself to be depressed by the doubts suggested by subtle speculation. It tears itself out of this state of uncertainty the moment it casts a look upon the wondrous forms of nature and the majesty of the universe and rises from height to height, from condition to condition, till it has elevated itself to the supreme and unconditioned author of all. But although we have nothing to object to the reasonableness and utility of this procedure, but have rather to commend and encourage it, we cannot approve of the claims which this argument advances to demonstrative certainty and to a reception upon its own merits, apart from favor or support by other arguments nor can it injure the cause of morality to endeavor to lower the tone of the arrogant sophist and to teach him that modesty and moderation which are the properties of a belief that brings calm and content into the mind without prescribing to it an unworthy subjection i maintain then that the physico-theological argument is insufficient of itself to prove the existence of a supreme being that it must entrust this to the ontological argument to which it serves merely as an introduction, and that, consequently, this argument contains the only possible ground of proof 
possessed by speculative reason, close parentheses, for the existence of this being. The chief momenta in the physico-theological argument are as follows. 1. We observe in the world manifest signs of an arrangement full of purpose, executed with great wisdom, an argument in whole of a content indescribably various, and of an extent without limits. 2. This arrangement of means and ends is entirely foreign to the things existing in the world. It belongs to them merely as a contingent attribute. In other words, the nature of different things could not of itself, whatever means were employed, harmoniously tend towards certain purposes, were they not chosen and directed for these purposes by a rational and disposing principle, in accordance with certain fundamental ideas. 3. There exists, therefore, a sublime and wise cause, parentheses, or several, close parentheses, which is not merely a blind, all-powerful nature, producing the beings and events which fill the world in unconscious fecundity, but a free and intelligent cause of the world. 4. The unity of this cause may be inferred from the unity of the reciprocal relation existing between the parts of the world, as portions of an artistic edifice, an inference which all our observation favors, and all principles of analogy support. In the above argument, it is inferred from the analogy of certain products of nature with those of human art, when it compels nature to bend herself to its purposes, as in the case of a house, a ship, or a watch, that the same kind of causality, namely understanding and will, resides in nature. It is also declared that the internal possibility of this freely acting nature, friends, which is the source of all art and perhaps also of human reason, close parens, is derivable from another and superhuman art, a conclusion which would perhaps be found incapable of standing the test of subtle transcendental criticism. But to neither of these opinions shall we at present object. We shall only remark that it must be confessed that, if we are to discuss the subject of cause at all, we cannot proceed more securely than with the guidance of the analogy subsisting between nature and such products of design, these being the only products whose cause and modes of organization are completely known to us. Reason would be unable to satisfy her own requirements if she passed from a causality which she does know to obscure and indemonstrable principles of explanation which she does not know. According to the physico-theological argument, the connection and harmony existing in the world evidence the contingency of the form merely, but not of the matter, that is, the substance of the world. To establish the truth of the latter opinion, it would be necessary to prove that all things would be in themselves incapable of this harmony and order unless they were, even as regards their substance, the product of a supreme wisdom. But this would require very different grounds of proof from those presented by the analogy within human art. This proof can at most, therefore, demonstrate the existence of an architect of the world whose efforts are limited by the capabilities of the material with which he works, but not of a creator of the world to whom all things are a subject. Thus the argument is utterly insufficient for the task before us, a demonstration of the existence of an all-sufficient being. If we wish to prove the contingency of the matter, we must have recourse to a transcendental argument, which the physico-theological was constructed expressly to avoid. We infer from the order and design visible in the universe, as a disposition of a thoroughly contingent character, the existence of a cause proportionate thereto. The conception of this cause must contain certain determining qualities, and it must therefore be regarded as the conception of a being which possesses all power, wisdom, and so on, in one word, all perfection, the conception, that is, of an all-sufficient being. For the predicates of very great, astonishing, or measurable power and excellence give us no determinate conception of the thing, nor do they inform us what the thing may be in itself. They merely indicate the relation existing between the magnitude of the object and the observer, who compares it with himself and with his own power of comprehension, and are the mere expressions of praise and reverence by which the object is either magnified or the observing subject depreciated in relation to the object. Where we have to do with the magnitude, prens, of the perfection, close prens, of a thing, we can discover no determinate conception except that which comprehends all possible perfection or completeness, 
and it is only the total parens, omnitudo, close parens, of reality which is completely determined in and through its conception alone. Now it cannot be expected that anyone will be bold enough to declare that he has a perfect insight into the relation which the magnitude of the world he contemplates bear, parens, in its extent, as well as in its content, close parens, to omnipotence, into that order and design in the world to the highest wisdom, and that of the unity of the world to the absolute unity of a supreme being. Physical theology is therefore incapable of presenting a determinate conception of a supreme cause of the world, and is therefore insufficient as a principle of theology, a theology which is itself to be the basis of religion. The attainment of absolute totality is completely impossible on the path of empiricism. And yet this is the path pursued in the physico-theological argument. What means shall we employ to bridge the abyss? After elevating ourselves to admiration of the magnitude of the power, wisdom, and other attributes of the author of the world, and finding we can advance no further, we leave the argument on empirical grounds and proceed to infer the contingency of the world from the order and conformity to aims that are observable in it. From this contingency we infer, by the help of transcendental conceptions alone, the existence of something absolutely necessary, and, still advancing, proceed from the conception of the absolute necessity of the first cause to the completely determined or determining conception thereof, the conception of an all-embracing reality. Thus the physico-theological, failing in its undertaking, recurs in its embarrassment to the cosmological argument, and, as this is merely the ontological argument in disguise, it executes its design solely by the aid of pure reason, although it at first professed to have no connection with its faculty and to base its entire procedure upon experience alone. The physico-theologians have therefore no reason to regard with such contempt the transcendental mode of argument, and to look down upon it with the conceit of clear-sighted observers of nature as the brain cobweb of obscure speculatists. For if they reflect upon and examine their own arguments, they will find that, after following for some time the path of nature and experience, and discovering themselves no nearer the object, they suddenly leave this path and pass into the region of pure possibility, where they hope to reach upon the wings of ideas what had eluded all their empirical investigations. Gaining, as they think, a firm footing after this immense leap, they extend their determinate conception, into the possession of which they have come, they know not how, over the whole sphere of creation, and explain their ideal, which is entirely a product of pure reason, by illustrations drawn from experience, though in a degree miserably unworthy of the grandeur of the object, while they refuse to acknowledge that they have arrived at this cognition or hypothesis by a very different road from that of experience. Thus, the physico-theological is based upon the cosmological, and this upon the ontological proof of the existence of a supreme being. And as besides these three there is no other path open to speculative reason, the ontological proof, on the ground of pure conceptions of reason, is the only possible one. If any proof of a proposition so far transcending the empirical exercise of the understanding is possible at all. Section 7. Critique of all theology based upon speculative principles of reason. If by the term theology I understand the cognition of a primal being, that cognition is based either upon reason alone, friends, theologia rationalis, close friends, or upon revelation, open friends, theologia revelata, close friends, the former cogitates its object either by means of pure transcendental conceptions, as in ans originarium realissimum ans entium, and is termed transcendental theology, or by means of a conception derived from the nature of our own mind as a supreme intelligence, and must then be entitled natural theology. The person who believes in a transcendental theology alone is termed deist. He who acknowledges the possibility of a natural theology also, a theist. The former admits that we can cognize by pure reason alone the existence of a supreme being, but at the same time 
maintains that our conception of this being is purely transcendental, and that all we can say of it is that it possesses all reality, without being able to define it more closely. The second asserts that reason is capable of presenting us, from the analogy with nature, with a more definite conception of this being, and that its operations, as the cause of all things, are the results of intelligence and free will. The former regards the supreme being as the cause of the world, whether by the necessity of his nature or as a free agent, is left undetermined. The latter considers this being as the author of the world. Transcendental theology aims either at inferring the existence of a supreme being from a general experience, without any closer reference to the world to which the experience belongs, and in this case it is called cosmotheology, or it endeavors to cognize the existence of such a being, through mere conceptions, without the aid of experience, and then is termed ontotheology. Natural theology infers the attributes and the existence of an author of the world from the constitution of the order and unity observable in the world, in which two modes of causality must be admitted to exist, those of nature and freedom. Thus it rises from this world to a supreme intelligence, either as a principle of all natural or of all moral order and perfection. In the former case it is termed physical theology in the latter, ethical or moral theology. Footnote. Not theological ethics, for this science contains ethical laws which presuppose the existence of the supreme governor of the world, while moral theology, on the contrary, is the expression of a conviction of the existence of a supreme being founded upon ethical laws. End footnote. As we are wont to understand by the term God not merely an eternal nature, the operations of which are insensate and blind, but a supreme being, who is the free and intelligent author of all things, and it is this latter view alone that can be of interest to humanity, we might, in strict rigor, deny to the deists any belief in God at all, and really regard him merely as a maintainer of the existence of a primal being or thing, the supreme cause of all other things. But, as no one ought to be blamed merely because he does not feel himself justified in maintaining a certain opinion, as if he altogether denied the truth and asserted its opposite, it is more correct, as it is less harsh, to say the deist believes in a god, the theist in a living god, parens, summa intelligentsia, close parens. We shall now proceed to investigate the sources of all these attempts of reason to establish the existence of a supreme being. It may be sufficient in this place to define theoretical knowledge or cognition as knowledge of that which is, and practical knowledge as knowledge of that which ought to be. In this view, the theoretical employment of reason is that by which I cognize a priori, friends, as necessary, close friends, that something is, while the practical is that by which I cognize a priori what ought to happen. Now, if it is indubitably certain though at the same time an entirely conditioned truth, that something is or ought to happen, either a certain determinate condition of this truth is absolutely necessary, or such a condition may be arbitrarily presupposed. In the former case, the condition is postulated, prins, per thesen, close prins, in the latter supposed, prins, per hypothesen, close prins, period. There are certain practical laws, those of morality, which are absolutely necessary. Now, if these laws necessarily presuppose the existence of some being as the condition of the possibility of their obligatory power, this being must be postulated, because the condition from which we reason to this determined condition is itself cognized a priori as absolutely necessary. We shall at some future time show that the moral laws not merely presuppose the existence of a supreme being, but also, as themselves absolutely necessary in a different relation, demand or postulate it, although only from a practical point of view. The discussion of this argument we postpone for the present. When the question relates merely to that which is, not that which ought to be, the condition which is presented in experience is always cogitated as contingent. 
For this reason, its condition cannot be regarded as absolutely necessary, but merely as relatively necessary, or rather as needful. The condition is in itself and a priori a mere arbitrary presupposition in aid of the cognition by reason of the conditioned. If, then, we are to possess the theoretical cognition of the absolute necessity of a thing, we cannot attain to this cognition otherwise than a priori by means of conceptions, while it is impossible in this way to cognize the existence of a cause which bears any relation to an existence given in experience. Theoretical cognition is speculative when it relates to an object or certain conceptions of an object which is not given and cannot be discovered by means of experience. It is opposed to the cognition of nature, which concerns only those objects or predicates which can be presented in a possible experience. The principle that everything which happens, friends, the empirically contingent close friends, must have a cause, is a principle of the cognition of nature but not of speculative cognition. For, if we change it into an abstract principle and deprive it of its reference to experience and the empirical, we shall find that it cannot with justice be regarded any longer as a synthetical proposition, and that it is impossible to discover any modes of transition from that which exists to something entirely different, termed cause. Nay, more, the conception of a cause, likewise that of the contingent, loses, in this speculative mode of employing it, all significance, for its objective reality and meaning are comprehensible from experience alone. When from the experience of the universe, and the things in it, the existence of a cause of the universe is inferred, reason is proceeding not in the natural, but in the speculative method. For the principle of the former announces not that things themselves are substances, but only that which happens or their states, as empirically contingent, have a cause. The assertion that the existence of a substance itself is contingent is not justified by experience. It is the assertion of a reason employing its principles in a speculative manner. If, again, I infer from the form of the universe, from the way in which all things are connected and act and react upon each other, the existence of a cause entirely distinct from the universe. This would again be a judgment of purely speculative reason, because the object in this case, the cause, can never be an object of possible experience. In both these cases, the principle of causality, which is valid only in the field of experience, useless and even meaningless beyond this region, would be diverted from its proper destination. Now I maintain that all attempts of reason to establish a theology by aid of speculation alone are fruitless, that the principles of reason as applied to nature do not conduct us to any theological truths, and consequently that a rational theology can have no existence unless it is founded upon the laws of morality. For all synthetical principles of the understanding are valid only as imminent in experience while the cognition of a supreme being necessitates their being employed transcendentally, and of this the understanding is quite incapable. If the empirical law of causality is to conduct us to a supreme being, this being must belong to the chain of empirical objects, in which case it would be, like all phenomena, itself conditioned. If the possibility of passing the limits of experience can be admitted by means of the dynamical law of the relation of effect to its cause, what kind of conception shall we obtain by this procedure? Certainly not the conception of a supreme being, because experience never presents us with the greatest of all possible effects, and it is only an effect of this character that can witness to the existence of a corresponding cause. If, for the purpose of fully satisfying the requirements of reason, we recognize her right to assert the existence of a perfect and absolutely necessary being, this can be admitted only from favor, and cannot be regarded as a result or irresistible demonstration. The physico-theological proof may add weight to others, if other proofs there are, by connecting speculation with experience, but in itself it rather prepares the mind for theological cognition, and gives it a right and natural direction then establishes a sure foundation for theology. It is now perfectly evident that transcendental questions admit only of transcendental answers, those presented a priori by pure conceptions without the least empirical admixture. 
but the question in the present case is evidently synthetical. It aims at the extension of our cognition beyond the bounds of experience. It requires an assurance respecting the existence of a being corresponding with the idea in our minds to which no experience can ever be adequate. Now it has been abundantly proved that all a priori synthetical cognition is possible only as the expression of the formal conditions of a possible experience, and that the validity of all principles depends upon their imminence in the field of experience, that is, their relation to objects of empirical cognition or phenomena. Thus all transcendental procedure in reference to speculative theology is without result. If anyone prefers doubting the conclusiveness of the proofs of our analytic to losing the persuasion of the validity of these old and time-honored arguments, he at least cannot decline answering the question, how can he pass the limits of all possible experience by the help of mere ideas? If he talks of new arguments, or of improvement upon old arguments, I request him to spare me. There is certainly no great choice in this sphere of discussion as all speculative arguments must at last look for support to the ontological, and I have, therefore, very little to fear from the argumentative fecundity of the dogmatical defenders of a non-sensuous reason. Without looking upon myself as a remarkably combative person, I shall not decline the challenge to detect a fallacy and destroy the pretensions of every attempt of speculative theology. And yet, the hope of better fortune never deserts those who are accustomed to the dogmatical mode of procedure. I shall therefore restrict myself to the simple and equitable demand that such reasoners will demonstrate, from the nature of the human mind as well as from that of other sources of knowledge, how we are to proceed to extend our cognition completely a priori and to carry it to that point where experience abandons us, and no means exists of guaranteeing the objective reality of our conceptions. In whatever way the understanding may have attained to a conception, the existence of the object of the conception cannot be discovered in it by analysis, because the cognition of the existence of the object depends upon the object's being posited and given in itself apart from the conception. But it is utterly impossible to go beyond our conception without the aid of experience, which presents to the mind nothing but phenomena, or to attain by the help of mere conceptions to a conviction of the existence of new kinds of objects or supernatural beings. But although pure speculative reason is far from sufficient to demonstrate the existence of a supreme being, it is of the highest utility in correcting our conception of this being, on the supposition that we can attain to the cognition of it by some other means, in making it consistent with itself and with all other conceptions of intelligible objects, clearing it from all that is incompatible with the conception of an on sumum and eliminating from it all limitations or admixtures of empirical elements. Transcendental theology is still, therefore, notwithstanding its objective insufficiency, of importance in a negative respect. It is useful as a test of the procedure of reason when engaged with pure ideas, no other than a transcendental standard being in this case admissible. For if, from a practical point of view, the hypothesis of a supreme and all-sufficient being is to maintain its validity without opposition, it must be of the highest importance to define this conception in a correct and rigorous manner, as the transcendental conception of a necessary being to eliminate all phenomenal elements, prens, anthropomorphism in its most extended signification, close prens, and at the same time to overflow all contradictory assertions, be they atheistic, deistic, or anthropomorphic. This is, of course, very easy. As the same arguments which demonstrated the inability of human reason to affirm the existence of a supreme being must be alike sufficient to prove the invalidity of its denial. For it is impossible to gain from the pure speculation of reason demonstration that there exists no supreme being, as the ground of all that exists, or that this being possesses none of those properties which we regard as analogical with the dynamic qualities of a thinking being, or that, as the anthropomorphists would have us believe, it is subject to all the limitations which sensibility opposes upon these intelligences which exist in the world of experience. A supreme being is, therefore, for the speculative reason, a mere ideal, though a faultless one, a conception which perfects and crowns the system of human cognition, but the objective reality of which can neither be proved nor disproved by pure reason. 
If this defect is ever supplied by our moral theology, the problematic transcendental theology which has proceeded will have been at least serviceable as demonstrating the mental necessity existing for the conception by the complete determination of it which it has furnished and the ceaseless testing of the conclusions of a reason often deceived by sense and not always in harmony with its own ideas. The attributes of necessity, infinitude, unity, existence apart from the world, parens, and not as a world soul, close parens, eternity, parens, free from conditions of time, close parens, omnipresence, parens, free from conditions of space, close parens, omnipotence and others are pure transcendental predicates, and thus the accurate conception of a supreme being which every theology requires, is furnished by transcendental theology alone. End of section 36section 37 the critique of pure reason by immanuel kant transcendental doctrine of elements part second transcendental logic second division transcendental dialectic book two of the dialectical procedure of pure reason chapter three the ideal of pure reason Appendix Of the Regulative Employment of the Ideas of Pure Reason This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Appendix Of the Regulative Employment of the Ideas of Pure Reason the result of all dialectical attempts of pure reason not only confirms the truth of what we have already proved in our transcendental analytic, namely that all inferences which would lead us beyond the limits of experience are fallacious and groundless, but it at the same time teaches us this important lesson that human reason has a natural inclination to overstep these limits, and that transcendental ideas are as much the natural property of the reason as categories are of the understanding. There exists this difference, however, that while the categories never mislead us, outward objects being always in perfect harmony therewith. Ideas are the parents of irresistible illusions, the severest and most subtle criticism being required to save us from the fallacies which they induce. Whatever is grounded in the nature of our powers will be found to be in harmony with the final purpose and proper employment of these powers. When once we have discovered their true direction and aim, we are entitled to suppose, therefore, that there exists a mode of employing transcendental ideas, which is proper and imminent although when we mistake their meaning and regard them as conceptions of actual things their mode of application is transcendent and delusive for it is not the idea itself but only the employment of the idea in relation to possible experience that is transcendent or imminent an idea is employed transcendentally when it is applied to an object falsely believed to be adequate with and to correspond to it, imminently when it is implied solely to the employment of the understanding in the sphere of experience. Thus all errors of super reptio 
of misapplication are to be ascribed to defects of judgment and not to understanding or reason. Reason never has an immediate relation to an object. It relates immediately to the understanding alone. It is only through the understanding that it can be employed in the field of experience. It does not form conceptions of objects. It merely arranges them and gives to them that unity which they are capable of possessing when the sphere of their application has been extended as widely as possible. Reason avails itself of the conception of the understanding for the sole purpose of producing totality in the different series. This totality the understanding does not concern itself with. Its only occupation is the connection of experiences, by which series of conditions in accordance with conceptions are established. The object of reason is therefore the understanding and its proper destination, as the latter brings unity into the diversity of objects by means of its conceptions, so the former brings unity into the diversity of conceptions by means of ideas. As it sets the final aim of a collective unity to the operations of the understanding, which without this occupies itself with a distributive unity only. I accordingly maintain that transcendental ideas can never be employed as constitutive ideas, that they cannot be conceptions of objects and that, when thus considered, they assume a fallacious and dialectical character. But on the other hand, they are capable of an admirable and indispensably necessary application to objects, as regulative ideas, directing the understanding to a certain aim, the guiding lines towards which all its laws follow and in which they all meet in one point. This point, though a mere idea, focus imaginarius, that is, not a point from which the conceptions of the understanding do really proceed, for it lies beyond the sphere of possible experience, serves notwithstanding to give to these conceptions the greatest possible unity combined with the greatest possible extension. Hence arises the natural illusion which introduces us to believe that these lines proceed from an object which lies out of the sphere of empirical cognition. Just as objects reflected in a mirror appear to be behind it, but this illusion, which we may hinder from imposing upon us, is necessary and unavoidable. If we desire to see not only those objects which lie before us, but those which are at a great distance behind us, that is to say, when in the present case we direct the aims of the understanding beyond every given experience, towards an extension as great as can possibly be attained. If we review our cognitions in their entire extent, we shall find that the peculiar business of reason is to arrange them into a system, that is to say, to give them connection according to a principle. This unity presupposes an idea the idea of the form of a whole, of cognition, preceding the determinate cognition of the parts, and containing the conditions which determine 
a priori to every part its place and relation to the other parts of the whole system. This idea, accordingly, demands complete unity in the cognition of the understanding, not the unity of a contingent aggregate, but that of a system connected according to necessary laws. It cannot be affirmed with propriety that this idea is a conception of an object. It is merely a conception of the complete unity of the conceptions of objects, in so far as this unity is available to the understanding as a rule. Such conceptions of reason are not derived from nature. On the contrary, we employ them from the interrogation and investigation of nature, and regard our cognition as defective so long as it is not adequate to them. We admit that such a thing as pure earth, pure water, or pure air is not to be discovered, and yet we require these conceptions, which have their origin in the reason, so far as regards their absolute purity and completeness, for the purpose of determining the share which each of these natural causes has in every phenomenon. Thus the different kinds of matter are all referred to earths, as mere weight, to salts and inflammable bodies, as pure force, and finally to water and air, as the vehicula of the former, or the machines employed by them in their operations for the purpose of explaining the chemical action and reaction of bodies in accordance with the idea of a mechanism. For, although not actually so expressed, the influence of such ideas of reason is very observable in the procedure of natural philosophers. If reason is the faculty of deducing the particular from the general, and if the general be certain in say and given, it is only necessary that the judgment should subsume the particular under the general, the particular being thus necessarily determined. I shall term this the demonstrative or apodictic employment of reason. If, however, the general is admitted as problematical only and is a mere idea, the particular case is certain, but the universality of the rule which applies to this particular case remains a problem. Several particular cases, the certainty of which is beyond doubt, are then taken and examined for the purpose of discovering whether the rule is applicable to them, and if it appears that all the particular cases which can be collected follow from the rule, its universality is inferred, and at the same time all the causes which have not or cannot be presented to our observation are concluded to be of the same character with those which we have observed. This I shall term the hypothetical employment of reason. The hypothetical exercise of reason by the aid of ideas employed as problematical conceptions is properly not constitutive. That is to say, if we consider the subject strictly, the truth of the rule, which has been employed as a hypothesis, does not follow from the use that is made of it by reason. For how can we know all the possible cases that may arise, some of which may, however, prove exceptions to the universality of the rule? 
This employment of reason is merely regulative, and its sole aim is the introduction of unity into the aggregate of our particular cognitions, and thereby the approximating of the rule to universality. The object of the hypothetical employment of reason is therefore the systematic unity of cognitions, and this unity is the criterion of the truth of a rule. On the other hand, this systematic unity, as a mere idea, is in fact merely a unity projected not to be regarded as given, but only in the light of a problem, a problem which serves, however, as a principle for the various and particular exercise of the understanding in experience directs it with regard to those cases which are not presented to our observation, and introduces harmony and consistency into all its operations. All that can be certain from the above consideration is that this systematic unity is a logical principle, whose aim is to assist the understanding where it can not of itself attain to rules, by means of ideas. To bring all these various rules under one principle, and thus to ensure the most complete consistency and connection that can be attained. But the assertion that objects and the understanding by which they are cognized are so constituted as to be determined to systematic unity, that this may be postulated a priori without any reference to the interest of reason, and that we are justified in declaring all possible cognitions, empirical and others, to possess systematic unity, and to be subject to general principles from which notwithstanding their various character, they are all derivable, such an assertion can be founded only upon a transcendental principle of reason, which would render this systematic unity not subjectively and logically in its character of a method, but objectively necessary. We shall illustrate this by an example. The conceptions of the understanding make us acquainted, among many other kinds of unity, with that of the causality of a substance, which is termed power. The different phenomenal manifestations of the same substance appear at first view to be so very dissimilar that we are inclined to assume the existence of just as many different powers as there are different effects. As in the case of the human mind, we have feeling, consciousness, imagination, memory, wit, analysis, pleasure, desire, and so on. Now, we are required by a logical maxim to reduce these differences to as small a number as possible, by comparing them and discovering the hidden identity which exists. We must inquire, for example, whether or not imagination, connected with consciousness, memory, wit, and analysis are not merely different forms of understanding and reason. The idea of a fundamental power, the existence of which no effort of logic can assure us of, is the problem to be solved. For the systematic representation of the existing variety of powers. The logical principle of reason requires us to produce as great a unity as is possible in the system of our cognitions, 
and the more the phenomena of this and the other power are found to be identical, the more probable does it become that they are nothing but different manifestations of one and the same power, which may be called, relatively speaking, a fundamental power, and so with other cases. These relatively fundamental powers must again be compared with each other, to discover, if possible, the one radical and absolutely fundamental power of which they are but the manifestations. But this unity is purely hypothetical. It is not maintained that this unity does really exist, but that we must, in the interest of reason, that is, for the establishment of principles of the various rules presented by experience, try to discover and introduce it, so far as is practicable, into the sphere of our cognitions. But the transcendental employment of the understanding would lead us to believe that this idea of a fundamental power is not problematic, but that it possesses objective reality and thus the systematic unity of the various powers or forces in a substance is determined by the understanding and erected into an apodictic or necessary principle. For without having attempted to discover the unity of the various powers existing in nature, Nay, even after all our attempts have failed, we notwithstanding presuppose that it does exist, and may be sooner or later discovered. And this reason does, not only, as in the case above adduced, with regard to the unity of substance, but where many substances although all to a certain extent homogeneous are discoverable as in the case of matter in general. Here also does reason presuppose the existence of the systematic unity of various powers, inasmuch as particular laws of nature are subordinate to general laws and parsimony in principles is not merely an economical principle of reason, but an essential law of nature. We cannot understand, in fact, how a logical principle of unity can of right exist, unless we presuppose a transcendental principle by which such a systematic unit, as a property of objects themselves, is regarded as necessary a priori. For with what right can reason, in its logical exercise, require us to regard the variety of forces which nature displays as in effect a disguised unity? and to deduce them from one fundamental force or power, when she is free to admit that it is just as possible that all forces should be different in kind, and that a systematic unity is not conformable to the design of nature. In this view of the case, reason would be proceeding in direct opposition to her own destination, by setting as an aim an idea which entirely conflicts with the procedure and arrangement of nature. Neither can we assert that reason has previously inferred this unity from the contingent nature of phenomena. For the law of reason, which requires us to seek for this unity, is a necessary law, 
inasmuch as without it we should not possess a faculty of reason, nor without reason a consistent and self-accordant mode of employing the understanding, nor in the absence of this any proper and sufficient criterion of empirical truth. In relation to this criterion, therefore, we must suppose the idea of the systematic unity of nature to possess objective validity and necessity. We find this transcendental presupposition lurking in different forms in the principles of philosophers although they have neither recognized it nor confessed to themselves its presence. That the diversities of individual things do not exclude identity of species, that the various species must be considered as merely different determinations of a few genera, and these again as divisions of still higher races, and so on, that accordingly a certain systematic unity of all possible empirical conceptions in so far as they can be deduced from higher and more general conceptions must be sought for, is a scholastic maxim or logical principle, without which reason could not be employed by us for we can infer the particular from the general only in so far as general properties of things constitute the foundation upon which the particular rest. That the same unity exists in nature is presupposed by philosophers in the well-known scholastic maxim which forbids us unnecessarily to augment the number of entities or principles, entia praetere necessitatum non esse multiplicanda. This maxim asserts that nature herself assists in the establishment of this unity of reason, and that the seemingly infinite diversity of phenomena should not deter us from the expectation of discovering beneath this diversity a unity of fundamental properties, of which the aforesaid variety is but a more or less determined form. This unity, although a mere idea, thinkers have found it necessary rather to moderate the desire than to encourage it. It was considered a great step when chemists were able to reduce all salts to two main genera, acids and alkalis, and they regard this difference as itself a mere variety, or different manifestation of one and the same fundamental material. The different kinds of earths stones, and even metals, chemists have endeavored to reduce to three, and afterwards to two, but still not content with this advance, they cannot but think that behind these diversities there lurks but one Janus, nay, that even salts and earths have a common principle. It might be conjectured that this is merely an economical plan of reason, for the purpose of sparing itself trouble, and an attempt of a purely hypothetical character, which when successful gives an appearance of probability to the principle of explanation employed by the reason. But a selfish purpose of this kind is easily to be distinguished from the idea according to which everyone presupposes that this unity is in accordance with the laws of nature, and that reason does not in this case request 
but requires, although we are quite unable to determine the proper limits of this unity. If the diversity existing in phenomena, a diversity not of form, for in this they may be similar, but of content, were so great that the subtlest human reason could never by comparison discover in them the least similarity, which is not impossible. In this case, the logical law of genera would be without foundation. The conception of a genus, nay, all general conceptions, would be impossible, and the faculty of the understanding, the exercise of which is restricted to the world of conceptions, could not exist. The logical principle of genera, accordingly, if it is to be applied to nature, by which I mean objects presented to our senses, presupposes a transcendental principle. In accordance with this principle, homogeneity is necessarily presupposed in the variety of phenomena. Although we are unable to determine a priori the degree of this homogeneity, because without it no empirical conceptions and consequently no experience would be possible. The logical principle of genera, which demands identity in phenomena, is balanced by another principle, that of species, which requires variety and diversity in things, notwithstanding their accordance in the same genus, and directs the understanding to attend to the one no less than the other. This principle of the faculty of distinction acts as a check upon the reason, and reason exhibits in this respect a double and conflicting interest. On the one hand, the interest in the extent, the interest of generality, in relation to genera. On the other hand, that of the content, the interest of individuality, in relation to the variety of species. In the former case, the understanding cogitates more under its conceptions, in the latter it cogitates more in them. The distinction manifests itself likewise in the habits of thought, peculiar to natural philosophers, some of whom the remarkably speculative heads may be said to be hostile to heterogeneity in phenomena and have their eyes always fixed on the unity of genera, while others with a strong empirical tendency aim unceasingly at the analysis of phenomena, and almost destroy in us the hope of ever being able to estimate the character of these according to general principles. The latter mode of thought is evidently based upon a logical principle, the aim of which is the systematic completeness of all cognitions. This principle authorizes me, beginning at the genus, to descend to the various and diverse contained under it, and in this way extension as in the former case unity is assured to the system. For if we merely examine the sphere of the conception which indicates a genus, we cannot discover how far it is possible to proceed in the division of that sphere, just as it is impossible from the consideration of the space occupied by matter 
to determine how far we can proceed in the division of it. Hence, every Janus must contain different species, and these again different subspecies, and as each of the latter must itself contain a sphere, must be of a certain extent, as a conceptus communis. Reason demands that no species or subspecies is to be considered as the lowest possible. For a species or subspecies, being always a conception which contains only what is common to a number of different things, does not completely determine any individual thing or relate immediately to it, and must consequently contain other conceptions, that is, other subspecies under it. This law of specification may be thus expressed, entium veritates non temere sunt minuende. But it is easy to see that this logical law would likewise be without sense or application were it not based upon a transcendental law of specification which certainly does not require that the differences in existing phenomena should be infinite in number. For the logical principle which merely maintains the indeterminateness of the logical sphere of a conception, in relation to its possible division, does not authorize this statement while it does impose upon the understanding the duty of searching for subspecies to every species, and minor differences in every difference. For were there no lower conceptions, neither could there be any higher. Now the understanding cognizes only by means of conceptions, Consequently, how far soever it may proceed in division, never by mere intuition, but always by lower and lower conceptions. The cognition of phenomena in their complete determination, which is possible only by means of the understanding, requires an unceasingly continued specification of conceptions, and a progression to ever smaller differences of which abstraction had been made in the conception of the species, and still more in that of the genus. This law of specification cannot be deduced from experience. It can never present us with a principle of so universal an application. Empirical specification very soon stops in its distinction of diversities, and requires the guidance of the transcendental law as a principle of the reason, a law which imposes on us the necessity of never ceasing in our search for differences even although these may not present themselves to the senses. That absorbent earths are of different kinds could only be discovered by obeying the anticipatory law of reason, which imposes upon the understanding the task of discovering the differences existing between these earths, and supposing that nature is richer in substance than our senses would indicate. The faculty of the understanding belongs to us just as much under the presupposition of differences in the objects of nature as under the condition that these objects are homogeneous. Because we could not possess conceptions nor make any use of our understanding were not the phenomena 
included under these conceptions in some respects dissimilar as well as similar in their character reason thus prepares the sphere of the understanding for the operations of this faculty one by the principle of the homogeneity of the diverse in higher genera two by the principle of the variety of the homogeneous in lower species and to complete the systematic unity it adds three a law of the affinity of all conceptions which prescribes a continuous translation from one species to every other by the gradual increase of diversity we may term these the principles of homogeneity the specification and the continuity of forms the latter results from the union of the two former inasmuch as we regard the systematic connection as complete in thought in the ascent to higher genera as well as in the descent to lower species for all diversities must be related to each other as they all spring from one highest janus descending through the different gradations of a more and more extended determination we may illustrate the systematic unity produced by the three logical principles in the following manner every conception may be regarded as a point which as the standpoint of a spectator has a certain horizon which may be said to enclose a number of things that may be viewed so to speak from that center within this horizon there must be an infinite number of other points each of which has its own horizon smaller and more circumscribed in other words every species contains subspecies according to the principle of specification and the logical horizon consists of smaller horizons subspecies but not of points individuals which possesses no extent but different horizons or genera which include under them so many conceptions may have one common horizon from which as from a midpoint they may be surveyed and we may proceed thus till we arrive at the highest genus or universal and true horizon which is determined by the highest conception and which contains under itself all differences and varieties as genera species and subspecies to this highest standpoint i am conducted by the law of homogeneity as to all lower and more variously determined conceptions by the law of specification now as in this way there exists no void in the whole extent of all possible conceptions and as out of the sphere of these the mind can discover nothing there arises from the presupposition of the universal horizon above mentioned and its complete division the principle non detur vacuum formarum this principle asserts that there are not different primitive and highest genera which stand isolated so to speak from each other but all the various genera are mere divisions and limitations of one highest and universal janus and hence follows immediately the principle detur continuum 
for marum. This principle indicates that all differences of species limit each other and do not admit of transition from one to another by saltus, but only through smaller degrees of the difference between the one species and the other. In one word, there are no species or subspecies which, in view of reason, are the nearest possible to each other, intermediate species or subspecies being always possible. The difference of which, from each of the former, is always smaller than the difference existing between these. The first law, therefore, directs us to avoid the notion that there exist different primal genera, and enounces the fact of perfect homogeneity. The second imposes a check upon this tendency to unity and prescribes the distinction of subspecies. Before proceeding to apply our general conceptions to individuals, the third unites both the former by announcing the fact of homogeneity as existing even in the most various diversity, by means of the gradual transition from one species to another. Thus it indicates a relationship between the different branches or species in so far as they all spring from the same stem. But this logical law of the continuum speciarum, formarum logicarum, presupposes a transcendental principle, lex continui in natura, without which the understanding might be led into error by following the guidance of the former, and thus perhaps pursuing a path contrary to that prescribed by nature. This law must consequently be based upon pure transcendental and not upon empirical considerations. For in the latter case, it would come later than the system, whereas it is really itself the parent of all that is systematic in our cognition of nature. These principles are not mere hypotheses employed for the purpose of experimenting upon nature, although when any such connection is discovered, it forms a solid ground for regarding the hypothetical unity as valid in the sphere of nature, and thus they are, in this respect, not without their use. But we go farther, and maintain that it is manifest that these principles of parsimony in fundamental causes, variety in effects, and affinity in phenomena, are in accordance both with reason and nature, and that they are not mere methods or plans devised for the purpose of assisting us in our observation of the external world. But it is plain that this continuity of forms is a mere idea, to which no adequate object can be discovered in experience, and this for two reasons. First, because the species in nature are really divided, and hence form quanta discreta, and if the gradual progression through their affinity were continuous, the intermediate members lying between two given species must be infinite in number, which is impossible. Secondly, because we cannot make any determinate empirical use of this law, inasmuch as it does not present us 
with any criterion of affinity which could aid us in determining how far we ought to pursue the graduation of differences. It merely contains a general indication that it is our duty to seek for, and if possible, to discover them. When we arrange these principles of systematic unity in the order conformable to their employment in experience, they will stand thus, variety, affinity, unity each of them as ideas being taken in the highest degree of their completeness. Reason presupposes the existence of cognitions of the understanding, which have a direct relation to experience, and aims at the ideal unity of these cognitions, a unity which far transcends all experience or empirical notions. The affinity of the diverse notwithstanding, the differences existing between its parts has a relation to things, but a still closer one to the mere properties and powers of things. For example, imperfect experience may represent the orbits of the planets as circular. But we discover variations from this course, and we proceed to suppose that the planets revolve in a path which, if not circular, is of a character very similar to it. That is to say, the movements of those planets which do not form a circle will approximate more or less to the properties of a circle, and probably form an ellipse. The paths of comets exhibit still greater variations, for so far as our observation extends, they do not return upon their own course in a circular or ellipse. But we proceed to the conjecture that comets describe a parabola, a figure which is closely allied to the ellipse. In fact, a parabola is merely an ellipse with its longer axis produced to an indefinite extent. Thus, these principles conduct us to a unity in the genera of the forms of these orbits. And, proceeding farther, to a unity as regards the cause of the motions of the heavenly bodies, that is, gravitation. But we go on, extending our conquests over nature, and endeavor to explain all seeming deviations from these rules, and even make additions to our system, which no experience can ever substantiate. For example, the theory, in affinity with that of ellipses, of hyperbolic paths of comets, pursuing which these bodies leave our solar system and, passing from sun to sun, unite the most distant parts of the infinite universe, which is held together by the same moving power. The most remarkable circumstance connected with these principles is that they seem to be transcendental, and although only containing ideas for the guidance of the empirical exercise of reason, and although this empirical employment stands to these ideas in an asymptotic relation alone, to use a mathematical term, that is continually approximate, without ever being able to attain to them. They possess, notwithstanding, as a priori synthetical propositions, objective though undetermined validity, and are available as rules for possible experience. In the elaboration of our experience, 
they may also be employed with great advantage as heuristic principles. Footnote 70. A transcendental deduction of them cannot be made, such a deduction being always impossible in the case of ideas, as has already been shown. Footnote 70 from the Greek Eurioko and footnote. We distinguished in the transcendental analytic the dynamical principles of the understanding, which are regulative principles of intuition from the mathematical, which are constitutive principles of intuition. These dynamical laws are, however, constitutive in relation to experience, inasmuch as they render the conceptions without which experience could not exist possible a priori. But the principles of pure reason cannot be constitutive even in regard to empirical conceptions because no sensuous schema corresponding to them can be discovered, and they cannot, therefore, have an object in concreto. Now, if I grant that they cannot be employed in the sphere of experience as constitutive principles, how shall I secure for them employment and objective validity as regulative principles? and in what way can they be so employed? The understanding is the object of reason, as sensibility is the object of the understanding. The production of systematic unity in all empirical operations of the understanding is the proper occupation of reason just as it is the business of the understanding to connect the various content of phenomena by means of conceptions, and subject them to empirical laws. But the operations of the understanding are, without the schemata of sensibility, undetermined, and in the same manner the unity of reason is perfectly undetermined as regards the conditions under which and the extent to which the understanding ought to carry the systematic connection of its conceptions. But although it is impossible to discover in intuition a schema for the complete systematic unity of all the conceptions of the understanding. There must be some analogon of the schema. This analogon is the idea of the maximum of the division and the connection of our cognition in one principle. For we may have a determinate notion of a maximum and an absolutely perfect all the restrictive conditions which are connected with an indeterminate and various content having been abstracted. Thus the idea of reason is analogous with a sensuous schema, with this difference, that the application of the categories to the schema of reason does not present a cognition of any object as is the case with the application of the categories to sensuous schemata, but merely provides us with a rule or principle for the systematic unity of the exercise of the understanding. Now, as every principle which imposes upon the exercise of the understanding a priori compliance with the rule of systematic unity also relates, although only in an indirect manner, to an object of experience. The principles of pure reason will also possess 
objective reality, and validity in relation to experience. But they will not aim at determining our knowledge in regard to any empirical object. They will merely indicate the procedure, following which the empirical and determinate exercise of the understanding may be in complete harmony and connection with itself, a result which is produced by its being brought into harmony with the principle of systematic unity, so far as that is possible and deduced from it. I term all subjective principles which are not derived from observation of the constitution of an object, but from the interest which reason has in producing a certain completeness in her cognition of that object, maxims of reason. Thus there are maxims of speculative reason which are based solely upon its speculative interest, although they appear to be objective principles. When principles which are really regulative are regarded as constitutive and employed as objective principles, contradictions must arise. But if they are considered as mere maxims, there is no room for contradictions of any kind, as they then merely indicate the different interests of reason which occasion differences in the mode of thought. In effect, reason has only one single interest, and the seeming contradiction existing between her maxims merely indicates a difference in and a reciprocal limitation of the methods by which this interest is satisfied. The reasoner has at heart the interest of diversity, in accordance with the principle of specification, another the interest of unity, in accordance with the principle of aggregation. Each believes that his judgment rests upon a thorough insight into the subject he is examining, and yet it has been influenced solely by a greater or lesser degree of adherence to some one of the two principles, neither of which are objective, but originate solely from the interest of reason, and on this account to be termed maxims rather than principles. When I observe intelligent men disputing about the distinctive characteristics of men animals or plants, and even of minerals, those on the one side assuming the existence of certain national characteristics, certain well-defined and hereditary distinctions of family, race, and so on, while the other side maintain that nature has endowed all races of men with the same faculties and dispositions, and that all differences are but the result of external and accidental circumstances. I have only to consider for a moment the real nature of the subject of discussion to arrive at the conclusion that it is a subject far too deep for us to judge of, and that there is little probability of either party being able to speak from a perfect insight into an understanding of the nature of the subject itself. Both have in reality been struggling for the twofold interest of reason, the one maintaining the one interest, the other the other. But this difference between the maxims of diversity and unity may easily be reconciled and adjusted, although, so long as they are regarded as objective principles, they must occasion not only contradictions 
and polemic, but place hindrances in the way of the advancement of truth, until some means is discovered of reconciling these conflicting interests, and bringing reason into union and harmony with itself. The same is the case with the so-called law discovered by Leibniz, and supported with remarkable ability by Bonnet, the law of the continuous gradation of created beings, which is nothing more than an inference from the principle of affinity. For observation and study of the order of nature could never present it to the mind as an objective truth. The steps of this latter, as they appear in experience, are too far apart from each other, and the so-called petty differences between different kinds of animals are in nature commonly so wide separations that no confidence can be placed in such views particularly when we reflect on the great variety of things and the ease with which we can discover resemblances and no faith in the laws which are said to express the aims and purposes of nature on the other hand the method of investigating the order of nature in the light of its principle and the maxim which requires us to regard this order, it being still undetermined how far it extends, as really existing in nature, is beyond doubt a legitimate and excellent principle of reason, a principle which extends farther than any experience or observation of ours and which, without giving us any positive knowledge of anything in the region of experience, guides us to the goal of systematic unity. End of section 37, Appendix Recording by Robert Scott, mojomove411.com M O J O M O V E four one one dot com September the fourteenth, two thousand and seven. Section thirty eight. The Critique of Pure Reason. By Immanuel Kant. Transcendental Doctrine of Elements. Part Second. Transcendental Logic. Second Division. Transcendental Dialectic. Book Two. Of the Dialectical Procedure of Pure Reason. Chapter Three. The Ideal of Pure Reason. Appendix. Of the Ultimate End of the Natural Dialectic of Human Reason. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kirsten Ferreri. The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant. Section 38. Of the Ultimate End of the Natural Dialectic of Human Reason. The ideas of pure reason cannot be, of themselves and in their own nature, dialectical. It is from their misemployment alone that fallacies and illusions arise, for they originate in the nature of reason itself, and it is impossible that this supreme tribunal for all the rights and claims of speculation should be itself undeserving of confidence and promotive of error. It is to be expected, therefore, that these ideas have a genuine and legitimate aim. 
It is true, the mob of sophists raise against reason the cry of inconsistency and contradiction, and affect to despise the government of that faculty, because they cannot understand its constitution, while it is to the beneficial influences alone that they owe the position and the intelligence which enable them to criticize and to blame its procedure. We cannot employ a priori conception with certainty, until we have made a transcendental deduction therefore. The ideas of pure reason do not admit of the same kind of deduction as the categories, but if they are to possess the least objective validity, and to represent anything but mere creations of thought, entia rationis ratio sinantis, a deduction of them must be possible. This deduction will complete the critical task imposed upon pure reason, and it is to this part of our labours that we now proceed. There is a great difference between a thing's being presented to the mind as an object in an absolute sense, or merely as an ideal object. In the former case I employ my conceptions to determine the object. In the latter case nothing is present to the mind but a mere schema, which does not relate directly to an object, not even in a hypothetical sense, but which is useful only for the purpose of representing other objects to the mind, in immediate and indirect manner by means of their relation to the idea in the intellect. Thus I say, the conception of a supreme intelligence is a mere idea, that is to say, its objective reality does not consist in the fact that it has an immediate relation to an object, for in this sense we have no means of establishing its objective validity. It is merely a schema constructed according to the necessary conditions of the unity of reason, the schema of a thing in general, which is useful toward the production of the highest degree of systematic unity in the empirical exercise of reason, in which we deduce this or that object of experience from the imaginary object of this idea, as the ground or cause of the said object of experience. In this way, the idea is properly a heuristic, and not an ostensive, conception. It does not give us any information respecting the constitution of an object. It merely indicates how, under the guidance of the idea, we ought to investigate the constitution and the relations of objects in the world of experience. Now if it can be shown that the three kinds of transcendental ideas, psychological, cosmological, and theological, although not relating directly to any object, nor determining it, do nevertheless, on the supposition of the existence of an ideal object, produce systematic unity in the laws of the empirical employment of the reason, and extend our empirical cognition, without ever being inconsistent or in opposition with it, it must be a necessary maxim of reason to regulate its procedure according to these ideas, and this forms the transcendental deduction of all speculative ideas, not as constitutive principles of the extension of our cognition beyond the limits of our experience, but as regulative principles of the systematic unity of empirical cognition, which is by the aid of these ideas arranged and amended within its own proper limits, to an extent unattainable by the operation of the principles of the understanding alone. I shall make this plainer. Guided by the principles involved in these ideas, we must, in the first place, so connect all the phenomena, actions, and feelings of the mind, as if it were a simple substance, which, endowed with personal identity, possesses a permanent existence, in this life at least, while its states, among which those of the bodies are to be included as external conditions, are in continual change. Secondly, in cosmology, we must investigate the conditions of all natural phenomena, internal as well as external, as if they belonged to a chain infinite and without any prime or supreme member, while we do not on this account deny the existence of intelligible grounds of these phenomena, although we never employ them to explain phenomena, for the simple reason that they are not objects of our cognition. Thirdly, in the sphere of theology, we must regard the whole system of possible experience as forming an absolute but dependent and sensuously conditioned unity, and at the same time as based upon a sole, supreme, and all-sufficient ground existing apart from the world itself, a ground which is a self-subsistent, primeval, and creative reason, in relation to which we so employ our reason in the field of experience, as if all other objects drew their origin from that archetype of all reason. 
In other words, we ought not to deduce the internal phenomena of the mind from a simple thinking substance, but deduce them from each other under the guidance of the regulative idea of a simple being. We ought not to deduce the phenomena, order, and unity of the universe from a supreme intelligence, but merely draw from this idea of a supremely wise cause the rules which must guide reason in its connection of causes and effects. Now there is nothing to hinder us from admitting these ideas to possess an objective and hyperbolic existence, except the cosmological ideas, which lead reason into an antinomy. The psychological and theological ideas are not antinomial. They contain no contradiction. And how, then, can any one dispute their objective reality, since he who denies it knows as little about their possibility as we who affirm? And yet, when we wish to admit the existence of a thing, it is not sufficient to convince ourselves that there is no positive obstacle in the way. It cannot be allowable to regard mere creations of thought, which transcend, though they do not contradict, all our conceptions as real and determinate objects, solely upon the authority of a speculative reason striving to compass its own aims. They cannot therefore be admitted to be real in themselves. They can only possess a comparative reality, that of a schema of the regulative principle of the systematic unity of all cognition. They are to be regarded not as actual things, but as in some measure analogous to them. We abstract from the object of the idea all the conditions which limit the exercise of our understanding, but which, on the other hand, are the sole conditions of our possessing a determinate conception of any given thing. And thus we cogitate a something, of the real nature of which we have not the least conception, but which we represent to ourselves as standing in a relation to the whole system of phenomena, analogous to that in which phenomena stand to each other. By admitting these ideal beings, we do not really extend our cognitions beyond the objects of possible experience. We extend merely the empirical unity of our experience, by the aid of systematic unity, the schema of which is furnished by the idea, which is therefore valid, not as a constitutive but as a regulative principle. For although we posit a thing corresponding to the idea, a something, an actual existence, we do not on that account aim at the extension of our cognition by means of transcendent conceptions. This existence is purely ideal, and not objective. It is the mere expression of the systematic unity which is to be the guide of reason in the field of experience. There are no attempts made at deciding what the ground of this unity may be, or what the real nature of this imaginary being. Thus the transcendental and only determinate conception of God, which is presented to us by a speculative reason, is in the strictest sense deistic. In other words, reason does not assure us of the objective validity of the conception. It merely gives us the idea of something on which the supreme and necessary unity of all experience is based. This something we cannot, following the analogy of a real substance, cogitate otherwise than as the cause of all things operating in accordance with rational laws, if we regard it as an individual object, although we should rest contented with the idea alone as a regulative principle of reason, and make no attempt at completing the sum of the conditions imposed by thought. This attempt is indeed inconsistent with the grand aim of complete systematic unity in the sphere of cognition, a unity to which no bounds are set by reason. Hence it happens that, admitting a divine being, I can have no conception of the internal possibility of its perfection, or of the necessity of its existence. The only advantage of this admission is that it enables me to answer all other questions relating to the contingent, and to give reason the most complete satisfaction as regards the unity which it aims at attaining in the world of experience. But I cannot satisfy reason with regard to this hypothesis itself, and this proves that it is not its intelligence and insight into the subject, but its speculative interest alone which induces it to proceed from a point lying far beyond the sphere of our cognition for the purpose of being able to consider all objects as parts of a systematic whole. Here a distinction presents itself, in regard to the way in which we may cogitate a presupposition, a distinction which is somewhat subtle, but of great importance in transcendental philosophy. I may have sufficient grounds to admit something, or the existence of something, in a relative point of view, suppositio relativa, without being justified in admitting it in an absolute sense, suppositio absoluta. 
This distinction is undoubtedly requisite, in the case of a regulative principle, the necessity of which we recognize, though we are ignorant of the source and cause of that necessity, and which we assume to be based upon some ultimate ground, for the purpose of being able to cogitate the universality of the principle in a more determinate way. For example, I cogitate the existence of a being corresponding to a pure transcendental idea, but I cannot admit that this being exists absolutely and in itself, because all of the conceptions by which I can cogitate an object in a determinate manner fall short of assuring me of its existence. Nay, the conditions of the objective validity of my conceptions are excluded by the idea, by the very fact of its being an idea. The conceptions of reality, substance, causality, nay, even that of necessity in existence, have no significance out of the sphere of empirical cognition, and cannot beyond that sphere determine any object. They may accordingly be employed to explain the possibility of things in the world of sense, but they are utterly inadequate to explain the possibility of the universe itself considered as a whole, because in this case the ground of explanation must lie out of and beyond the world and cannot, therefore, be an object of possible experience. Now, I may admit the existence of an incomprehensible being of this nature, the object of a mere idea, relatively to the world of sense. Although I have no ground to admit its existence absolutely and in itself, for if an idea, that of a systematic and complete unity, of which I shall presently speak more particularly, lies at the foundation of the most extended empirical employment of reason, and if this idea cannot be adequately represented in concreto, although it is indispensably necessary for the approximation of empirical unity to the highest possible degree, I am not only authorized but compelled to realize this idea, that is, to posit a real object corresponding thereto but I cannot profess to know this object. It is to me merely a something to which, as the ground of systematic unity and cognition, I attribute such properties as are analogous to the conceptions employed by the understanding in the sphere of experience. Following the analogy of the notions of reality, substance, causality, and necessity, I cogitate a being which possesses all these attributes in the highest degree, and as this idea is the offspring of my reason alone, I cogitate this being as self-subsistent reason, and as the cause of the universe operating by means of ideas of the greatest possible harmony and unity. Thus I abstract all conditions that would limit my idea, solely for the purpose of rendering systematic unity possible in the world of empirical diversity, and thus securing the widest possible extension for the exercise of reason in that sphere. This I am enabled to do by regarding all connections and relations in the world of sense, as if they were the dispositions of a supreme reason, of which our reason is but a faint image. I then proceed to cogitate this supreme being by conceptions which have properly no meaning or application except in the world of sense. But as I am authorized to employ the transcendental hypothesis of such a being in a relative respect alone, that is, as the substratum of the greatest possible unity in experience, I may attribute to a being which I regard as distinct from the world such properties as belong solely to the sphere of sense and experience. For I do not desire, and am not justified in desiring, to cognize this object of my idea as it exists in itself for I possess no conceptions sufficient for our task, those of reality, substance, causality, nay, even that of necessity in existence, losing all significance and becoming merely the signs of conceptions, without content and without applicability, when I attempt to carry them beyond the limits of a world of sense. I cogitate merely the relation of a perfectly unknown being for the greatest possible systematic unity of experience, solely for the purpose of employing it as the schema of the regulative principle which directs reason in its empirical exercise. It is evident, at the first view, that we cannot presuppose the reality of this transcendental object by means of the conceptions of reality, substance, causality, and so on, because these conceptions cannot be applied to anything that is distinct from the world of sense. Thus, the supposition of a supreme being or cause is purely relative. It is cogitated only in behalf of the systematic unity of experience. Such a being is but a something, of whose existence in itself we have not the least conception. Thus, too, it becomes sufficiently manifest why we are required the idea of a necessary being in relation to objects given by sense, although we can never have the least conception of this being, 
or of its absolute necessity. And now we can clearly perceive the result of our transcendental dialectic, and the proper aim of the ideas of pure reason, which become dialectical solely from misunderstanding and inconsiderateness. Pure reason is in fact occupied with itself, and not with any object. Objects are not presented to it to be embraced in the unity of an empirical conception. It is only the cognitions of the understanding that are presented to it, for the purpose of receiving the unity of a rational conception, that is, of being connected according to a principle. The unity of reason is the unity of system. And this systematic unity is not an objective principle, extending its dominion over objects, but a subjective maxim, extending its authority over the empirical cognition of objects. The systematic connection which reason gives to the empirical employment of the understanding not only advances the extension of that employment, but ensures its correctness, and thus the principle of a systematic unity of this nature is also objective, although only in an indefinite respect, principium vagum. It is not, however, a constitutive principle, determining an object to which it directly relates. It is merely a regulative principle, or maxim, advancing and strengthening the empirical exercise of reason, by the opening up of new paths of which the understanding is ignorant, while it never conflicts with the laws of its exercise in the sphere of experience. But reason cannot cogitate this systematic unity without, at the same time, cogitating an object of the idea, an object that cannot be presented in any experience which contains no concrete example of a complete systematic unity. This being, ens rationis ratio senate, is therefore a mere idea, and is not assumed to be a thing which is real absolutely and in itself. On the contrary, it forms merely the problematical foundation of the connection which the mind introduces among the phenomena of the sensuous world. We look upon this connection, in the light of the above-mentioned idea, as if it drew its origin from the supposed being which corresponds to the idea, and yet all we aim at is the possession of this idea as a secure foundation for the systematic unity of experience, a unity indispensable to reason advantageous to the understanding, and promotive of the interests of empirical cognition. We mistake the true meaning of this idea when we regard it as an announcement, or even as a hypothetical declaration of the existence of a real thing, which we are to regard as the origin or ground of a systematic constitution of the universe. On the contrary, it is left completely undetermined what the nature or properties of this so-called ground may be. The idea is merely to be adopted as a point of view, from which this unity, so essential to reason and so beneficial to the understanding, may be regarded as radiating. In one word, this transcendental thing is merely the schema of a regulative principle, by means of which reason, so far as in her lies, extends the dominion of systematic unity over the whole sphere of experience. The first object of an idea of this kind is the ego, considered merely as a thinking nature or soul. If I wish to investigate the properties of a thinking being, I must interrogate experience. But I find that I can apply none of the categories to this object, the schema of these categories, which is the condition of their application, being given only in sensuous intuition. But I cannot thus attain to the cognition of a systematic unity of all the phenomena of the internal sense, Instead, therefore, of an empirical conception of what the soul really is, reason takes the conception of the empirical unity of all thought, and by cogitating this unity as unconditioned and primitive, constructs the rational conception or idea of a simple substance which is in itself unchangeable, possessing personal identity, and in connection with other real things external to it. In one word, it constructs the idea of a simple self-subsistent intelligence." But the real aim of reason in this procedure is the attainment of principles of systematic unity for the explanation of the phenomena of the soul. That is, reason desires to be able to represent all the determinations of the internal sense as existing in one subject, all powers as deduced from one fundamental power, all changes as mere varieties in the condition of a being which is permanent and always the same and all phenomena in space as entirely different in their nature from the procedure of thought. 
Essential simplicity, with the other attributes predicated of the ego, is regarded as the mere schema of this regulative principle. It is not assumed that it is the actual ground of the properties of the soul. For these properties may rest upon quite different grounds, of which we are completely ignorant, just as the above predicates could not give us any knowledge of the soul as it is in itself, even if we regarded them as valid in respect of it, inasmuch as they constitute a mere idea, which cannot be represented in concreto. Nothing but good can result from a psychological idea of this kind, if we only take proper care not to consider it as more than an idea, that is, if we regard it as valid merely in relation to the employment of reason in the sphere of the phenomena of the soul. Under the guidance of this idea or principle, no empirical laws of corporal phenomena are called in to explain that which is a phenomenon of the internal sense alone. No windy hypotheses of the generation, annihilation, and palingenesis of souls are admitted. Thus the consideration of this object of the internal sense is kept pure, and unmixed with heterogeneous elements, while the investigation of reason aims at reducing all the grounds of an explanation employed in this sphere of knowledge to a single principle. All this is best effected, nay, cannot be effected otherwise than by means of such a schema which requires us to regard this ideal thing as an actual existence. The psychological idea is therefore meaningless and inapplicable, except as the schema of a regulative conception. For if I ask whether the soul is not really of a spiritual nature, it is a question which has no meaning. From such a conception has been abstracted not merely all corporeal nature, but all nature, that is, all the predicates of a possible experience, and consequently all the conditions which enable us to cogitate an object to this conception have disappeared. But if these conditions are absent, it is evident that the conception is meaningless. The second regulative idea of speculative reason is the conception of the universe. For nature is properly the only object presented to us, in regard to which reason requires regulative principles. Nature is twofold thinking and corporeal nature. To cogitate the latter in regards to its internal possibility, that is, to determine the application of the categories to it, no idea is required, no representation which transcends experience. In this sphere, therefore, an idea is impossible, sensuous intuition being our only guide, while in the sphere of psychology we require the fundamental idea, I, which contains a priori a certain form of thought, namely, the unity of the ego. Pure reason has therefore nothing left but nature in general, and the completeness of conditions in nature in accordance with some principle. The absolute totality of the series of these conditions is an idea, which can never be fully realized in the empirical exercise of reason, while it is serviceable as a rule for the procedure of reason in relation to that totality. It requires us, in the explanation of given phenomena, in the regress or ascent in the series, to proceed as if the series were infinite in itself, that is, were prolonged in indefinitum. While on the other hand, where reason is regarded as itself the determining cause, in the region of freedom, we are required to proceed as if we had not before us an object of sense, but of the pure understanding. In this latter case, the conditions do not exist in the series of phenomena, but may be placed quite out of and beyond it, and the series of conditions may be regarded as if it had an absolute beginning from an intelligible cause. All this proves that the cosmological ideas are nothing but regulative principles, and not constitutive, and that their aim is not to realize an actual totality in such series. The full discussion of this subject will be found in its proper place in the chapter on the antinomy of pure reason. The third idea of pure reason, containing the hypothesis of a being which is valid merely as a relative hypothesis, is that of the one and all-sufficient cause of all cosmological series, in other words, the idea of God. We have not the slightest ground absolutely to admit the existence of an object corresponding to this idea. For what can empower or authorize us to affirm the existence of a being of the highest perfection, a being whose existence is absolutely necessary, merely because we possess the conception of such a being? The answer is, it is the existence of the world which renders this hypothesis necessary. But this answer makes it perfectly evident that the idea of this being, 
like all other speculative ideas, is essentially nothing more than a demand upon reason that it shall regulate the connection which it and its subordinate faculties introduce into the phenomena of the world by principles of systematic unity, and consequently that it shall regard all phenomena as originating from one all-embracing being, as the supreme and all-sufficient cause. From this it is plain that the only aim of reason, in this procedure, is the establishment of its own formal rule for the extension of its dominion in the world of experience, that it does not aim at an extension of its cognition beyond the limits of experience, and that consequently this idea does not contain any constitutive principle. The highest formal unity, which is based upon ideas alone, is the unity of all things, a unity in accordance with aim or purpose, and the speculative interest of reason renders it necessary to regard all order in the world as if it originated from the intention and design of a supreme reason. This principle unfolds to the view of reason in the sphere of experience new and enlarged prospects, and invites it to connect the phenomena of the world according to teleological laws, and in this way to attain to the highest possible degree of systematic unity. The hypothesis of a supreme intelligence, as the sole cause of the universe, an intelligence which has for us no more than an ideal existence, is accordingly always of the greatest service to reason. Thus, if we presuppose, in relation to the figure of the earth which is round but somewhat flattened at the poles, or that of mountains or seas, wise designs on the part of an author of the universe, we cannot fail to make, by the light of this supposition, a great number of interesting discoveries. Footnote 71. The advantages which a circular form, in the case of the earth, has over every other, are well known, but few are aware that the slight flattening at the poles, which gives it the figure of a spheroid, is the only cause which prevents the elevation of continents, or even of mountains, perhaps thrown up by some internal convulsion, from continually altering the position of the axis of the earth, and that to some considerable degree in a short time. The great protuberance of the earth under the equator serves to overbalance the impetus of all other masses of earth, and thus to preserve the axis of the earth so far as we can observe in its present position. And yet this wise arrangement has been unthinkingly explained from the equilibrium of the formerly fluid mass. End of footnote 71. If we keep to this hypothesis, as a principle which is purely regulative, even error cannot be very detrimental. For in this case, error can have no more serious consequences than that where we expected to discover a teleological connection, nexus finalis, only a mechanical or physical connection appears. In such a case, we merely fail to find the additional form of unity we expected, but we do not lose the rational unity which the mind requires in its procedure and experience. But even a miscarriage of this sort cannot affect the law in its general and teleological relations. For although we may convict an anatomist of an error when he connects the limb of some animal with a certain purpose, it is quite impossible to prove in a single case that any arrangement of nature, be what it may, is entirely without aim or design. And thus medical physiology, by the aid of a principle presented to it by pure reason, extends its very limited empirical knowledge to the purposes of the different parts of an organized body so far that it may be asserted with the utmost confidence, and with the approbation of all reflecting men, that every organ or bodily part of an animal has its use, and answers a certain design. Now this is a supposition which, if regarded as of a constitutive character, goes much further than any experience or observation of ours can justify. Hence it is evident that it is nothing more than a regulative principle of reason, which aims at the highest degree of systematic unity by the aid of the idea of a causality according to design in a supreme cause, a cause which it regards as the highest intelligence. If, however, we neglect this restriction of the idea to a purely regulative influence, reason is betrayed into numerous errors. For it has then left the ground of experience, in which alone are to be found the criteria of truth, and has ventured into the region of the incomprehensible and unsearchable, on the heights of which it loses its power and collectedness, because it has completely severed its connection with experience. 
The first error which arises from our employing the idea of a supreme being as a constitutive, in repugnance to the very nature of an idea, and not as a regulative principle, is the error of inactive reason, ignava ratio. Footnote 72. This was the term applied by the old dialecticians to a sophistical argument which ran thus, If it is your fate to die of this disease, you will die whether you employ a physician or not. Cicero says that this mode of reasoning has received this appellation, because if followed it puts an end to the employment of reason in the affairs of life. For a similar reason, I have applied this designation to the sophistical argument of pure reason. End of footnote 72 we may so term every principle which requires us to regard investigations of nature as absolutely complete, and allows reason to cease its enquiries, as if it had fully executed its task. Thus the psychological idea of the ego, when employed as a constitutive principle for the explanation of the phenomena of the soul, and for the extension of our knowledge regarding this subject beyond the limits of experience, even to the condition of the soul after death, is convenient enough for the purposes of pure reason, but detrimental and even ruinous to its interests in the sphere of nature and experience. The dogmatizing spiritualist explains the unchanging unity of our personality through all changes of condition from the unity of a thinking substance, the interest which we take in things and events that can happen only after our death, from a consciousness of the immaterial nature of our thinking subject, and so on. Thus he dispenses with all empirical investigations into the cause of these internal phenomena, and with all possible explanations of them, upon purely natural grounds, while at the dictation of a transcendent reason he passes by the imminent sources of cognition in experience, greatly to his own ease and convenience, but to the sacrifice of all genuine insight and intelligence. These prejudicial consequences become still more evident in the case of the dogmatical treatment of our idea of a supreme intelligence, and the theological system of nature, physico-theology, which is falsely based upon it. For in this case, the aims which we observe in nature, and often those which we merely fancy to exist, make the investigation of causes a very easy task, by directing us to refer such and such phenomena immediately to the unsearchable will and counsel of supreme wisdom, while we ought to investigate their causes in the general laws of the mechanism of the matter. We are thus recommended to consider the labor of reason as ended, when we have merely dispensed with its employment, which is guided surely and safely only by the order of nature and the series of changes in the world, which are arranged according to imminent and general laws. This error may be avoided if we do not merely consider from the viewpoint of final aims certain parts of nature, such as the division and structure of a continent, the constitution and direction of certain mountain chains, or even the organization existing in the vegetable and animal kingdoms, but look upon this systematic unity of nature in a perfectly general way, in relation to the idea of a supreme intelligence. If we pursue this advice, we lay as a foundation for all investigation the conformity to aims of all phenomena of nature in accordance with universal laws, for which no particular arrangement of nature is exempt, but only cognized by us with more or less difficulty and we possess a regulative principle of the systematic unity of a teleological connection, which we do not attempt to anticipate or predetermine. All that we do, and ought to do, is to follow out the physico-mechanical connection in nature according to general laws, with the hope of discovering sooner or later the teleological connection also. Thus and thus only can the principle of final unity aid in the extension of the employment of reason in the sphere of experience, without being in any case detrimental to its interests. The second error which arises from the misconception of the principle of systematic unity is that of perverted reason. Perversa ratio, usteron roteron rationis. The idea of systematic unity is available as a regulative principle in the connection of phenomena according to general natural laws, and how far soever we have to travel upon the path of experience to discover some fact or event, this idea requires us to believe that we have approached all the more nearly to the completion of its use in the sphere of nature, although that completion can never be attained. But this error reverses the procedure of reason. 
We begin by hypostatizing the principle of systematic unity, and by giving an anthropomorphic determination to the conception of a supreme intelligence, and then proceed forcibly to impose aims upon nature. Thus not only does teleology, which ought to aid in the completion of unity in accordance with general laws, operate to the destruction of its influence, but it hinders reason from attaining its proper aim, that is, the proof, upon natural grounds, of the existence of a supreme intelligent cause. For, if we cannot presuppose supreme finality in nature a priori, that is, as essentially belonging to nature, how can we be directed to endeavour to discover this unity, and, rising gradually through its different degrees, to approach the supreme perfection of an author of all, a perfection which is absolutely necessary, and therefore cognizable a priori? The regulative principle directs us to presuppose systematic unity absolutely and consequently as following from the essential nature of things, but only as a unity of nature, not merely cognized empirically, but presupposed a priori, although only in an indeterminate manner. But if I insist on basing nature upon the foundation of a supreme ordaining being, the unity of nature is in effect lost, for in this case it is quite foreign and unessential to the nature of things, and cannot be cognized from the general laws of nature and thus arises a vicious circular argument, what ought to have been proved, having been presupposed. To take the regulative principle of systematic unity in nature for a constitutive principle, and to hypostatize and make a cause out of that which is properly the ideal ground of the consistent and harmonious exercise of reason, involves reason in inextricable embarrassments. The investigation of nature pursues its own path under the guidance of the chain of natural causes, in accordance with the general laws of nature, and even follows the light of the idea of an author of the universe, not for the purpose of deducing the finality which it constantly pursues from this supreme being, but to attain to the cognition of his existence from the finality which it seeks in the existence of the phenomena of nature, and if possible, in that of all things, to cognize this being, consequently as absolutely necessary. Whether this latter purpose succeed or not, the idea is and must always be a true one, and its employment, when merely regulative, must always be accompanied by truthful and beneficial results. Complete unity, in conformity with aims, constitutes absolute perfection. But if we do not find this unity in the nature of things which go to constitute the world of experience, that is, of objective cognition, consequently in the universal and necessary laws of nature, how can we infer from this unity the idea of the supreme and absolutely necessary perfection of a primal being, which is the origin of all causality? The greatest systematic unity, and consequently teleological unity, constitutes the very foundation of the possibility of the most extended employment of human reason. The idea of unity is therefore essentially and indissolubly connected with the nature of our reason. This idea is a legislative one, and hence it is very natural that we should assume the existence of a legislative reason corresponding to it, from which the systematic unity of nature, the object of the operations of reason, must be derived. In the course of our discussion of the antinomies, we stated that it is always possible to answer all the questions which pure reason may raise, and that the plea of the limited nature of our cognition, which is unavoidable and proper in many questions regarding natural phenomena, cannot in this case be admitted, because the questions raised do not relate to the nature of things, but are necessarily originated by the nature of reason itself, and relate to its internal constitution. We can now establish this assertion, which at first sight appeared so rash, in relation to the two questions in which reason takes the greatest interest, and thus complete our discussion of the dialectic of pure reason. If, then, the question is asked, in relation to transcendental theology, first, whether there is anything distinct from the world, which contains the ground of cosmical order and connection according to general laws, the answer is, certainly. Footnote 73. After what has been said of the psychological idea of the ego and its proper employment as a regulative principle of the operations of reason, I need not enter into details regarding the transcendental illusion by which the systematic unity of all the various phenomena of the internal sense is hypostasized. The procedure is in this case very similar to that which has been discussed in our remarks on the theological ideal. End of footnote 73. For the world is a sum of phenomena 
There must, therefore, be some transcendental basis of these phenomena, that is, a basis cogitable by the pure understanding alone. If, secondly, the question is asked whether this being is substance, whether it is of the greatest reality, whether it is necessary, and so forth, I answer that this question is utterly without meaning. For all the categories which aid me in forming a conception of an object cannot be employed except in the world of sense, and are without meaning when not applied to objects of actual or possible experience. Out of this sphere they are not properly conceptions, but merely the marks or indices of conceptions, which we may admit, although they cannot, without the help of experience, help us to understand any subject or thing. If, thirdly, the question is whether we may not cogitate this being which is distinct from the world in analogy with the objects of experience, the answer is undoubtedly but only as an ideal and not as a real object. That is, we must cogitate it only as an unknown substratum of the systematic unity, order, and finality of the world, a unity which reason must employ as the regulative principle of its investigation of nature day more, we may admit into the idea certain anthropomorphic elements, which are promotive of the interests of this regulative principle, for it is no more than an idea, which does not relate directly to a being distinct from the world, but to the regulative principle of the systematic unity of the world, by means, however, of a schema of this unity, the schema of a supreme intelligence, who is the wisely designing author of the universe. What this basis of cosmical unity may be in itself we know not. We cannot discover from the idea. We merely know how we ought to employ the idea of this unity in relation to the systematic operation of reason in the sphere of experience. But it will be asked again, can we on these grounds admit the existence of a wise and omnipotent author of the world? Without doubt, and not only so, but we must assume the existence of such a being. But do we thus extend the limits of our knowledge beyond the field of possible experience? By no means, for we have merely presupposed a something of which we have no conception, which we do not know as it is in itself, but in relation to the systematic disposition of the universe, which we must presuppose in all our observation of nature, we have cogitated this unknown being in analogy with an intelligent existence, an empirical conception. That is to say, we have endowed it with those attributes which, judging from the nature of our own reason, may contain the ground of such a systematic unity. This idea is therefore valid only relatively to the employment in experience of our reason. But if we attribute to it an absolute and objective validity, we overlook the fact that it is merely an ideal being that we cogitate, and by setting out from a basis which is not determinable by considerations drawn from experience, we place ourselves in a position which incapacitates us from applying this principle to the empirical employment of reason. But it will be asked further, can I make any use of this conception and hypothesis in my investigations into the world and nature? Yes, for this very purpose was the idea established by reason as a fundamental basis. But may I regard certain arrangements, which seem to have been made in conformity with some fixed aim as the arrangements of design, and look upon them as proceeding from the divine will, with the intervention, however, of certain other particular arrangements disposed to that end? Yes, you may do so, but at the same time you must regard it as indifferent, whether it is asserted that divine wisdom has disposed all things in conformity with his highest aims or that the idea of supreme wisdom is a regulative principle in the investigation of nature, and at the same time a principle of the systematic unity of nature according to general laws, even in those cases where we are unable to discover that unity. In other words, it must be perfectly indifferent to you whether you say, when you have discovered this unity, God has wisely willed it so, or nature has wisely arranged this for it was nothing but the systematic unity which reason requires as a basis for the investigation of nature that justified you in accepting the idea of a supreme intelligence as a schema for a regulative principle. And the further you advance in the discovery of design and finality, the more certain the validity of your idea. But as the whole aim of this regulative principle was the discovery of a necessary and systematic unity in nature, we have, in so far as we attain this, to attribute our success to the idea of a supreme being, while at the same time we cannot, without involving ourselves in contradictions, overlook the general laws of nature, as it was in reference to them alone that this idea was employed. 
we cannot, I say, overlook the general laws of nature, and regard this conformity to aims observable in nature as contingent or hyperphysical in its origin, inasmuch as there is no ground which can justify us in the admission of a being with such properties distinct from and above nature. All that we are authorized to assert is that this idea may be employed as a principle, and that the properties of the being which is assumed to correspond to it may be regarded as systematically connected in analogy with the causal determination of phenomena. For the same reasons we are justified in introducing into the idea of the supreme cause other anthropomorphic elements, for without these we could not predicate anything of it. We may regard it as allowable to cogitate this being as a being with understanding, the feelings of pleasure and displeasure, and the faculties of desire and will corresponding to them. At the same time, we may attribute to this being infinite perfection, a perfection which necessarily transcends that which our knowledge of the order and design in the world authorize us to predicate of it. For the regulative law of systematic unity requires us to study nature on the supposition that systematic and final unity in infinitum is everywhere discoverable, even in the highest diversity. For although we may discover little of this cosmical perfection, it belongs to the legislative prerogative of reason to require us always to seek for and to expect it, while it must always be beneficial to institute all inquiries into nature in accordance with this principle. But it is evident that, by this idea of a supreme author of all, which I place as the foundation of all inquiries into nature, I do not mean to assert the existence of such a being, or that I have any knowledge of its existence, and consequently I do not really deduce anything from the existence of this being, but merely from its idea, that is to say, from the nature of things in this world in accordance with this idea. A certain dim consciousness of the true use of this idea seems to have dictated to the philosophers of all times the moderate language used by them regarding the cause of the world. We find them employing the expressions wisdom and the care of nature and divine wisdom as synonymous, nay, in purely speculative discussion, preferring the former, because it does not carry the appearance of greater pretensions than such as we are entitled to make, and at the same time directs reason to its proper field of action, nature and her phenomena. Thus, pure reason, which at first seemed to promise us nothing less than the extension of our cognition beyond the limits of experience, is found, when thoroughly examined, to contain nothing but regulative principles, the virtue and function of which is to introduce into our cognition a higher degree of unity than the understanding could of itself. These principles, by placing the goal of all our struggles at so great a distance, realize for us the most thorough connection between the different parts of our cognition, and the highest degree of systematic unity. But on the other hand, if misunderstood and employed as constitutive principles of transcendent cognition, they become the parents of illusions and contradictions, while pretending to introduce us to new regions of knowledge. Thus all human cognition begins with intuitions, proceeds from thence to conceptions, and ends with ideas. Although it possesses in relation to all three elements, a priori sources of cognition, which seem to transcend the limits of all experience, a thoroughgoing criticism demonstrates that speculative reason can never, by the aid of these elements, pass the bounds of possible experience, and that the proper destination of this highest faculty of cognition is to employ all methods, and all the principles of these methods, for the purpose of penetrating into the innermost secrets of nature, by the aid of the principles of unity, among all kinds of which teleological unity is the highest, while it ought not to attempt to soar above the sphere of experience, beyond which there lies not for us, but the void inane. The critical examination in our transcendental analytic of all the propositions which profess to extend cognition beyond the sphere of experience, completely demonstrated that they can only conduct us to a possible experience. If we were not distrustful even of the clearest abstract theorems, if we were not allured by specious and inviting prospects to escape from the constraining power of their evidence, we might spare ourselves the laborious examination of all the dialectical arguments which a transcendent reason adduces in support of its pretensions. For we should know with the most complete certainty that however honest such professions might be, they are null and valueless, because they relate to a kind of knowledge to which no man can by any possibility attain. But as there is no end to discussion, if we cannot discover the true cause of the illusions by which even the wisest are deceived, 
and as the analysis of all our transcendent cognition into its elements is of itself of no slight value as a psychological study, while it is a duty incumbent on every philosopher, it was found necessary to investigate the dialectical procedure of reason in its primary sources. And as the inferences of which this dialectic is apparent, ah, and as the influences of which this dialectic is the parent are not only deceitful, but naturally possess a profound interest for humanity, it was advisable at the same time to give a full account of the momenta of this dialectical procedure, and to deposit it in the archives of human reason, as a warning to all future metaphysicians to avoid these causes of speculative error. End of section 38 39. The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant Transcendental Doctrine of Method Introduction and Chapter 1. The Discipline of Pure Reason Introduction Recorded by Kirsten Ferreri If we regard the sum of the cognition of pure speculative reason as an edifice, the idea of which at least exists in the human mind, it may be said that we have the it may be said that we have in the transcendental doctrine of elements examined the materials and determined to what edifice these belong and what its height and stability we have found indeed that although we had purposed to build for ourselves a tower which should reach to heaven the supply of materials sufficed merely for a habitation which was spacious enough for all terrestrial purposes, and high enough to enable us to survey the level plain of experience, but that the bold undertaking designed necessarily failed for want of materials, not to mention the confusion of tongues, which gave rise to endless disputes among the labourers on the plan of the edifice, and at last scattered them over all the world, each to erect a separate building for himself, according to his own plans and his own inclinations. Our present task relates not to the materials, but to the plan of an edifice. And as we have had sufficient warning not to venture blindly upon a design which may be found to transcend our natural powers, while at the same time we cannot give up the intention of erecting a secure abode for the mind, we must proportion our design to the material which is presented to us, and which is at the same time sufficient for all our wants. I understand, then, by the transcendental doctrine of method, the determination of the formal conditions of a complete system of pure reason. We shall accordingly have to treat of the discipline, the canon, the architectonic, and finally the history of pure reason. This part of our critique will accomplish, from the transcendental point of view, what has been usually attempted but miserably executed under the name of practical logic. It has been badly executed, I say, because general logic, not being limited to any particular kind of cognition, not even to the pure cognition of the understanding, nor to any particular objects, it cannot, without borrowing from other sciences, do more than present merely the titles or signs of possible methods and the technical expressions, which are employed in the systematic parts of all sciences, and thus the pupil is made acquainted with names, the meaning and application of which he is to learn only at some future time. End of section 39 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. THE CRITIQUE OF PURE REASON BY Immanuel KANT THE DISCIPLINE OF PURE REASON IN THE SPHERE OF DOGMATISM The science of mathematics presents the most brilliant example of the extension of the sphere of pure reason without the aid of experience. Examples are always contagious, and they exert an especial influence on the same faculty, which naturally flatters itself that it will have the same good fortune in other case, as fell to its lot in one fortunate instance. Hence pure reason hopes to be able to extend its empire in the transcendental sphere with equal success and security, especially when it applies the same method which was attended with such brilliant results in the science of mathematics. 
it is therefore of the highest importance for us to know whether the method of arriving at demonstrative certainty which is termed mathematical be identical with that by which we endeavor to attain the same degree of certainty in philosophy and which is termed in that science dogmatical philosophical cognition is the cognition of reason by means of conceptions mathematical cognition is cognition by means of the construction of conceptions the construction of a conception is the presentation a priori of the intuition which corresponds to the conception for this purpose a non-empirical intuition is requisite which as an intuition is an individual object while as the construction of a conception a general representation it must be seen to be universally valid for all the possible intuitions which rank under that conception thus i construct a triangle by the presentation of the object which corresponds to this conception either by mere imagination in pure intuition or upon paper in empirical intuition in both cases completely a priori without borrowing the type of that figure from any experience the individual figure drawn upon paper is empirical but it serves notwithstanding to indicate the conception even in its universality because in this empirical intuition we keep our eye merely on the act of the construction of the conception and pay no attention to the various modes of determining it for example its size the length of its sides the size of its angles these not in the least affecting the essential character of the conception philosophical cognition accordingly regards the particular only in the general mathematical the general in the particular nay in the individual this is done however entirely a priori and by means of pure reason so that as this individual figure is determined under certain universal conditions of construction the object of the conception to which this individual figure corresponds as its schema must be cogitated as universally determined the essential difference of these two modes of cognition consists therefore in this formal quality it does not regard the difference of the matter or objects of both those thinkers who aim at distinguishing philosophy from mathematics by asserting that the former has to do with quality merely and the latter with quantity have mistaken the effect for the cause the reason why mathematical cognition can relate only to quantity is to be found in its form alone for it is the conception of quantities only that is capable of being constructed that is presented a priori in intuition while qualities cannot be given in any other than an empirical intuition hence the cognition of qualities by reason is possible only through conceptions no one can find an intuition which shall correspond to the conception of reality except in experience it cannot be presented to the mind a priori and antecedently to the empirical consciousness of a reality we can form an intuition by means of the mere conception of it of a cone without the aid of experience but the color of the cone we cannot know except from experience i cannot present an intuition of a cause except in an example which experience offers to me besides philosophy as well as mathematics treats of quantities as for example of totality infinity and so on mathematics too treats of the difference of lines and surfaces as spaces of different quality of the continuity of extension as a quality thereof but although in such cases they have a common object the mode in which reason considers that object is very different in philosophy from what it is in mathematics the former confines itself to the general conceptions the latter can do nothing with the mere conception it hastens to intuition in this intuition it regards the conception in concreto not empirically but in an a priori intuition which it has constructed and in which all the results which follow from the general conditions of the construction of the conception are in all cases valid for the object of the constructed conception suppose that the conception of a triangle is given to a philosopher and that he is required to discover by the philosophical method what relation the sum of its angles bears to a right angle he has nothing before him but the conception of a figure enclosed within three right lines and consequently with the same number of angles he may analyze the conception of a right line 
or of the number three as long as he pleases but he will not discover any properties not contained in these conceptions but if this question is proposed to a geometrician he at once begins by constructing a triangle he knows that two right angles are equal to the sum of all the contiguous angles which proceed from one point in a straight line and he goes on to produce one side of his triangle thus forming two adjacent angles which are together equal to two right angles he then divides the exterior of these angles by drawing a line parallel with the opposite side of the triangle and immediately perceives that he has thus got an exterior adjacent angle which is equal to the interior proceeding in this way through a chain of inferences and always on the ground of intuition he arrives at a clear and universally valid solution of the question but mathematics does not confine itself to the construction of quantities quanta as in the case of geometry it occupies itself with pure quantity also quantitas as in the case of algebra where complete abstraction is made of the properties of the object indicated by the conception of quantity in algebra a certain method of notation by signs is adopted and these indicate the different possible constructions of quantities the extraction of roots and so on after having thus denoted the general conception of quantities according to their different relations the different operations by which quantity or number is increased or diminished are presented in intuition in accordance with general rules thus when one quantity is to be divided by another the signs which denote both are placed in the form peculiar to the operation of division and thus algebra by means of a symbolical construction of quantity just as geometry with its ostensive or geometrical construction a construction of the objects themselves arrives at results which discursive cognition cannot hope to reach by the aid of mere conceptions now what is the cause of this difference in the fortune of the philosopher and the mathematician the former of whom follows the path of conceptions while the latter pursues that of intuitions which he represents a priori in correspondence with his conceptions the cause is evident from what has been already demonstrated in the introduction to this critique we do not in the present case want to discover analytical propositions which may be produced merely by analyzing our conceptions for in this the philosopher would have the advantage over his rival we aim at the discovery of synthetical propositions such synthetical propositions moreover as can be cognized a priori i must not confine myself to that which i actually cogitate in my conception of a triangle for this is nothing more than the mere definition i must try to go beyond that and to arrive at properties which are not contained in although they belong to the conception now this is impossible unless i determine the object present to my mind according to the conditions either of empirical or of pure intuition in the former case i should have an empirical proposition arrived at by actual measurement of the angles of the triangle which would possess neither universality nor necessity but that would be of no value in the latter i proceed by geometrical construction by means of which i collect in a pure intuition just as i would in an empirical intuition all the various properties which belong to the schema of a triangle in general and consequently to its conception and thus construct synthetical propositions which possess the attribute of universality it would be vain to philosophize upon the triangle that is to reflect on it discursively i should get no further than the definition with which i had been obliged to set out there are certainly transcendental synthetical propositions which are framed by means of pure conceptions and which form the peculiar distinction of philosophy but these do not relate to any particular thing but to a thing in general and announce the conditions under which the perception of it may become a part of possible existence but the science of mathematics has nothing to do with such questions nor with the question of existence in any fashion it is concerned merely with the properties of objects in themselves only in so far as these are connected with the conception of the objects in the above example we merely attempted to show the great difference which exists between the discursive employment of reason in the sphere of conceptions 
and its intuitive exercise by means of the construction of conceptions the question naturally arises what is the cause which necessitates this twofold exercise of reason and how are we to discover whether it is the philosophical or the mathematical method which reason is pursuing in an argument all our knowledge relates finally to possible intuitions for it is these alone that present objects to the mind an a priori or non-empirical conception contains either a pure intuition and in this case it can be constructed or it contains nothing but the synthesis of possible intuitions which are not given a priori in this latter case it may help us to form synthetical a priori judgments but only in the discursive method by conceptions not in the intuitive by means of the construction of conceptions the only a priori intuition is that of the pure form of phenomena space and time a conception of space and time as quanta may be presented a priori in intuition that is constructed either alone with their quality figure or as pure quantity the mere synthesis of the homogeneous by means of number but the matter of phenomena by which things are given in space and time can be presented only in perception a posteriori the only conception which represents a priori this empirical content of phenomena is the conception of a thing in general and the a priori synthetical cognition of this conception can give us nothing more than the rule for the synthesis of that which may be contained in the corresponding a posteriori perception it is utterly inadequate to present an a priori intuition of the real object which must necessarily be empirical synthetical propositions which relate to things in general an a priori intuition of which is impossible are transcendental for this reason transcendental propositions cannot be framed by means of the construction of conceptions they are a priori and based entirely on conceptions themselves they contain merely the rule by which we are to seek in the world of perception or experience the synthetical unity of that which cannot be intuited a priori but they are incompetent to present any of the conceptions which appear in them in an a priori intuition these can be given only a posteriori in experience which however is itself possible only through these synthetical principles if we are to form a synthetical judgment regarding a conception we must go beyond it to the intuition in which it is given if we keep to what is contained in the conception the judgment is merely analytical it is merely an explanation of what we have cogitated in the conception but i can pass from the conception to the pure or empirical intuition which corresponds to it i can proceed to examine my conception in concreto and to cognize either a priori or a posteriori what i find in the object of the conception the former a priori cognition is rational mathematical cognition by means of the construction of the conception the latter a posteriori cognition is purely empirical cognition which does not possess the attributes of necessity and universality thus i may analyze the conception i have of gold but i gain no new information from this analysis i merely enumerate the different properties which i had connected with the notion indicated by the word my knowledge has gained in logical clearness and arrangement but no addition has been made to it but if i take the matter which is indicated by this name and submit it to the examination of my senses i am enabled to form several synthetical although still empirical propositions the mathematical conception of a triangle i should construct that is present a priori in intuition and in this way attain to rational synthetical cognition but when the transcendental conception of reality or substance or power is presented to my mind i find that it does not relate to or indicate either an empirical or pure intuition but that it indicates merely the synthesis of empirical intuitions which cannot of course be given a priori the synthesis in such a conception cannot proceed a priori without the aid of experience to the intuition which corresponds to the conception and for this reason none of these conceptions can produce a determinative synthetical proposition 
they can never present more than a principle of the synthesis of possible empirical intuitions note seventy five in the case of the conception of cause i do really go beyond the empirical conception of an event but not to the intuition which presents this conception in concreto but only to the time conditions which may be found in experience to correspond to the conception my procedure is therefore strictly according to conceptions i cannot in a case of this kind employ the construction of conceptions because the conception is merely a rule for the synthesis of perceptions which are not pure intuitions and which therefore cannot be given a priori End of note seventy five a transcendental proposition is therefore a synthetical cognition of reason by means of pure conceptions and the discursive method and it renders possible all synthetical unity in empirical cognition though it cannot present us with any intuition a priori there is thus a twofold exercise of reason both modes have the properties of universality and an a priori origin in common but are in their procedure of widely different character the reason of this is that in the world of phenomena in which alone objects are presented to our minds there are two main elements the form of intuition space and time which can be cognized and determined completely a priori and the matter of content that which is presented in space and time and which consequently contains a something an existence corresponding to our powers of sensation as regards the latter which can never be given in a determinate mode except by experience there are no a priori notions which relate to it except the undetermined conceptions of the synthesis of possible sensations in so far as these belong in a possible experience to the unity of consciousness as regards the former we can determine our conceptions a priori in intuition inasmuch we are ourselves the creators of the objects of the conceptions in space and time these objects being regarded simply as quanta in the one case reason proceeds according to conceptions and can do nothing more than subject phenomena to these which can only be determined empirically that is a posteriori in conformity however with those conceptions as the rules of all empirical synthesis in the other case reason proceeds by the construction of conceptions and as these conceptions relate to an a priori intuition they may be given and determined in pure intuition a priori and without the aid of empirical data the examination and consideration of everything that exists in space or time whether it is a quantum or not in how far the particular something which fills space or time is a primary substratum or a mere determination of some other existence whether it relates to anything else either as cause or effect whether its existence is isolated or in reciprocal connection with and dependence upon others the possibility of this existence its reality and necessity or opposites all these form part of the cognition of reason on the ground of conceptions and this cognition is termed philosophical but to determine a priori an intuition in space its figure to divide time into periods or merely to cognize the quantity of an intuition in space and time and to determine it by number all this is an operation of reason by means of the construction of conceptions and is called mathematical the success which attends the efforts of reason in the sphere of mathematics naturally fosters the expectation that the same good fortune will be its lot if it applies the mathematical method in other regions of mental endeavor besides that of quantities its success is thus great because it can support all its conceptions by a priori intuitions and in this way make itself a master as it were over nature while pure philosophy with its a priori discursive conceptions bungles about in the world of nature and cannot accredit or show any a priori evidence of the reality of these conceptions masters in the science of mathematics are confident of the success of this method indeed it is a common persuasion that it is capable of being applied to any subject of human thought they have hardly ever reflected or philosophized on their favorite science a task of great difficulty and the specific difference between the two modes of employing the faculty of reason has never entered their thoughts 
rules current in the field of common experience and which common sense stamps everywhere with its approval are regarded by them as axiomatic from what source the conceptions of space and time with which as the only primitive quanta they have to deal enter their minds is a question which they do not trouble themselves to answer and they think it just as unnecessary to examine into the origin of the pure conceptions of the understanding and the extent of their validity all they have to do with them is to employ them in all this they are perfectly right if they do not overstep the limits of the sphere of nature but they pass unconsciously from the world of sense to the insecure ground of pure transcendental conceptions instabilis talus inabilis unda where they can neither stand nor swim and where the tracks of their footsteps are obliterated by time while the march of mathematics is pursued on a broad and magnificent highway which the latest posterity shall frequent without fear of danger or impediment as we have taken upon us the task of determining clearly and certainly the limits of pure reason in the sphere of transcendentalism and as the efforts of reason in this direction are persisted in even after the plainest and most expressive warnings hope still beckoning us past the limits of experience into the splendors of the intellectual world it becomes necessary to cut away the last anchor of this fallacious and fantastic hope we shall accordingly show that the mathematical method is unattended in the sphere of philosophy by the least advantage except perhaps that it more plainly exhibits its own inadequacy that geometry and philosophy are two quite different things although they go hand in hand in the field of natural science and consequently that the procedure of the one can never be imitated by the other the evidence of mathematics rests upon definitions axioms and demonstrations i shall be satisfied with showing that none of these forms can be employed or imitated in philosophy in the sense in which they are understood by mathematicians and that the geometrician if he employs his method in philosophy will succeed only in building card castles while the employment of the philosophical method in mathematics can result in nothing but mere verbiage the essential business of philosophy indeed is to mark out the limits of the science and even the mathematician unless his talent is naturally circumscribed and limited to this particular department of knowledge cannot turn a deaf ear to the warnings of philosophy or set himself above its direction one of definitions a definition is as the term itself indicates the representation upon primary grounds of the complete conception of a thing within its own limits note seventy six the definition must describe the conception completely that is omit none of the marks or signs of which it composed within its own limits that is it must be precise and enumerate no more signs than belong to the conception and on primary grounds that is to say the limitations of the bounds of the conception must not be deduced from other conceptions as in this case a proof would be necessary and the so-called definition would be incapable of taking its place at the head of all the judgments we have to form regarding an object end of note seventy six accordingly an empirical conception cannot be defined it can only be explained for as there are in such a conception only a certain number of marks or signs which denote a certain class of sensuous objects we can never be sure that we do not cogitate under the word which indicates the same object at one time a greater at another a smaller number of signs thus one person may cogitate in his conception of gold in addition to its properties of weight color malleability that of resisting rust while another person may be ignorant of this quality we employ certain signs only so long as we require them for the sake of distinction new observations abstract some and add new ones so that an empirical conception never remains within permanent limits it is in fact useless to define a conception of this kind if for example we are speaking of water and its properties we do not stop at what we actually think by the word water but proceed to observation and experiment and the word with the few signs attached to it is more properly a designation than a conception of the thing a definition in this case would evidently be nothing more than a determination of the word 
In the second place, no a priori conception, such as those of substance, cause, right, fitness, and so on, can be defined. For I can never be sure that the clear representation of a given conception, which is given in a confused state, has been fully developed until I know that the representation is adequate with its object. But inasmuch as the conception, as it is presented to the mind, may contain a number of obscure representations, which we do not observe in our analysis, although we employ them in our application of the conception, I can never be sure that my analysis is complete, while examples may make this probable, although they can never demonstrate the fact. Instead of the word definition, I should rather employ the term exposition, a more modest expression which the critic may accept without surrendering his doubts as to the completeness of the analysis of any such conception. As, therefore, neither empirical nor a priori conceptions are capable of definition, we have to see whether the only other kind of conceptions, arbitrary conceptions, can be subjected to this mental operation. Such a conception can always be defined, for I must know thoroughly what I wish to cogitate in it, as it was I who created it, and it was not given to my mind either by the nature of my understanding or by experience. At the same time, I cannot say that by such a definition I have defined a real object. If the conception is based upon empirical conditions, if, for example, I have a conception of a clock for a ship, this arbitrary conception does not assure me of the existence or even of the possibility of the object. My definition of such a conception would, with more propriety, be termed a declaration of a project than a definition of an object. There are no other conceptions which can bear definition, except those which contain an arbitrary synthesis, which can be constructed a priori. Consequently, the science of mathematics alone possesses definitions. For the object here, thought is presented a priori in intuition, and thus it can never contain more or less than the conception, because the conception of the object has been given by the definition, and primarily, that is, without deriving the definition from any other source. Philosophical definitions are, therefore, merely expositions of given conceptions, while mathematical definitions are constructions of conceptions originally formed by the mind itself. The former are produced by analysis, the completeness of which is never demonstratively certain, the latter by a synthesis. In a mathematical definition the conception is formed, in a philosophical definition it is only explained. From this it follows. A that we must not imitate in philosophy the mathematical usage of commencing with definitions, except by way of hypothesis or experiment. For, as all so-called philosophical definitions are merely analyses of given conceptions, these conceptions, although only in a confused form, must precede the analysis, and the incomplete exposition must precede the complete so that we may be able to draw certain inferences from the characteristics which an incomplete analysis has enabled us to discover, before we attain to the complete exposition or definition of the conception. In one word, a full and clear definition ought, in philosophy, rather to form the conclusion than the commencement of our labors. Note 77 Philosophy abounds in faulty definitions, especially such as contain some of the elements requisite to form a complete definition. If a conception could not be employed in reasoning before it had been defined, it would fare ill with all philosophical thought. But as incompletely defined conceptions may always be employed without detriment to truth, so far as our analysis of the elements contained in them proceeds, Imperfect definitions, that is, propositions which are properly not definitions, but merely approximations thereto, may be used with great advantage. In mathematics, definition belongs ad esse. In philosophy, ad melius esse. It is a difficult task to construct a proper definition. Jurists are still without a complete definition of the idea of right. End of note 77 in mathematics, on the contrary, we cannot have a conception prior to the definition. It is the definition which gives us the conception, 
and it must for this reason form the commencement of every chain of mathematical reasoning b mathematical definitions cannot be erroneous for the conception is given only in and through the definition and thus it contains only what has been cogitated in the definition but although a definition cannot be incorrect as regards its content an error may sometimes although seldom creep into the form this error consists in a want of precision thus the common definition of a circle that it is a curved line every point in which is equally distant from another point called the center is faulty from the fact that the determination indicated by the word curved is superfluous for there ought to be a particular theorem which may be easily proved from the definition to the effect that every line to the effect that every line which has all its points at equal distances from another point must be a curved line that is that not even the smallest part of it can be straight analytical definitions on the other hand may be erroneous in many respects either by the introduction of signs which do not actually exist in the conception or by wanting in that completeness which forms the essential of a definition in the latter case the definition is necessarily defective because we can never be fully certain of the completeness of our analysis for these reasons the method of definition employed in mathematics cannot be imitated in philosophy two of axioms these in so far as they are immediately certain are a priori synthetical principles now one conception cannot be connected synthetically and yet immediately with another because if we wish to proceed out of and beyond a conception a third mediating cognition is necessary and as philosophy is a cognition of reason by the aid of conceptions alone there is to be found in it no principle which deserves to be called an axiom mathematics on the other hand may possess axioms because it can always connect the predicates of an object a priori and without any mediating term by means of the construction of conceptions in intuition such is the case with the proposition three points can always lie in a plane on the other hand no synthetical principle which is based upon conceptions can ever be immediately certain for example the proposition everything that happens has a cause because i require a mediating term to connect the two conceptions of event and cause namely the condition of time determination in an experience and i cannot cognize any such principle immediately and from conceptions alone discursive principles are accordingly very different from intuitive principles or axioms the former always require deduction which in the case of the latter may be altogether dispensed with axioms are for this reason always self-evident while philosophical principles whatever may be the degree of certainty they possess cannot lay any claim to such a distinction no synthetical proposition of pure transcendental reason can be so evident as is often rashly enough declared as the statement twice two are four it is true that in the analytic i introduced into the list of principles of the pure understanding certain axioms of intuition but the principle there discussed was not itself an axiom but served merely to present the principle of the possibility of axioms in general while it was really nothing more than a principle based upon conceptions for it is one part of the duty of transcendental philosophy to establish the possibility of mathematics itself philosophy possesses then no axioms and has no right to impose its a priori principles upon thought until it has established their authority and validity by a thoroughgoing deduction three of demonstrations only an apodictic proof based upon intuition can be termed a demonstration experience teaches us what is but it cannot convince us that it might not have been otherwise hence a proof upon empirical grounds cannot be apodictic a priori conceptions in discursive cognition can never produce intuitive certainty or evidence however certain the judgment they present may be mathematics alone therefore contains demonstrations because it does not deduce its cognition from conceptions but from the construction of conceptions that is from intuition which can be given a priori in accordance with conceptions 
the method of algebra in equations from which the correct answer is deduced by reduction is a kind of construction not geometrical but by symbols in which all conceptions especially those of the relations of quantities are represented in intuition by signs and thus the conclusions in that science are secured from errors by the fact that every proof is submitted to ocular evidence philosophical cognition does not possess this advantage it being required to consider the general always in abstracto by means of conceptions while mathematics can always consider it in concreto in an individual intuition and at the same time by means of an a priori representation whereby all errors are rendered manifest to the senses the former discursive proofs ought to be termed acroamatic proofs rather than demonstrations as only words are employed in them while demonstrations proper as the term itself indicates always require a reference to the intuition of the object it follows from all these considerations that it is not consonant with the nature of philosophy especially in the sphere of pure reason to employ the dogmatical method and to adorn itself with the titles and insignia of mathematical science it does not belong to that order and can only hope for a fraternal union with that science its attempts at mathematical evidence are vain pretensions which can only keep it back from its true aim which is to detect the illusory procedure of reason when transgressing its proper limits and by fully explaining and analyzing our conceptions to conduct us from the dim regions of speculation to the clear region of modest self-knowledge reason must not therefore in its transcendental endeavors look forward with such confidence as if the path it is pursuing led straight to its aim nor reckon with such security upon its premises as to consider it unnecessary to take a step back or to keep a strict watch for errors which overlooked in the principles may be detected in the arguments themselves in which case it may be requisite either to determine these principles with greater strictness or to change them entirely i divide all apodictic propositions whether demonstrable or immediately certain into dogmata and mathemata a direct synthetical proposition based on conceptions is a dogma a proposition of the same kind based on the construction of conceptions is a mathema analytical judgments do not teach us any more about an object than what was contained in the conception we had of it because they do not extend our cognition beyond our conception of an object they merely elucidate the conception they cannot therefore be with propriety termed dogmas of the two kinds of a priori synthetical propositions above mentioned only those which are employed in philosophy can according to the general mode of speech bear this name those of arithmetic or geometry would not be rightly so denominated thus the customary mode of speaking confirms the explanation given above and the conclusion arrived at that only those judgments which are based upon conceptions not on the construction of conceptions can be termed dogmatical thus pure reason in the sphere of speculation does not contain a single direct synthetical judgment based upon conceptions by means of ideas it is as we have shown incapable of producing synthetical judgments which are objectively valid by means of the conceptions of the understanding it establishes certain indubitable principles not however directly on the basis of conceptions but only indirectly by means of the relation of these conceptions to something of a purely contingent nature namely possible experience when experience is presupposed these principles are apodectically certain but in themselves and directly they cannot even be cognized a priori thus the given conceptions of cause and event will not be sufficient for the demonstration of the proposition every event has a cause for this reason it is not a dogma although from another point of view that of experience it is capable of being proved to demonstration the proper term for such a proposition is principle and not theorem although it does require to be proved 
because it possesses the remarkable peculiarity of being the condition of the possibility of its own ground of proof that is experience and of forming a necessary presupposition in all empirical observation if then in the speculative sphere of pure reason no dogmata are to be found all dogmatical methods whether borrowed from mathematics or invented by philosophical thinkers are alike inappropriate and inefficient they only serve to conceal errors and fallacies and to deceive philosophy whose duty it is to see that reason pursues a safe and straight path a philosophical method may however be systematical for our reason is subjectively considered itself a system and in the sphere of mere conceptions a system of investigation according to principles of unity the material being supplied by experience alone but this is not the proper place for discussing the peculiar method of transcendental philosophy as our present task is simply to examine whether our faculties are capable of erecting an edifice on the basis of pure reason and how far they may proceed with the materials at their command End of The Discipline of Pure Reason in the Sphere of Dogmatism Section 41 The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant Transcendental Doctrine of Method Chapter 1 The Discipline of Pure Reason Section 2. The Discipline of Pure Reason in Polemics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Immanuel Kant, The Critique of Pure Reason. The Discipline of Pure Reason in Polemics. Reason must be subject, in all its operations, to criticism, which must always be permitted to exercise its functions without restraint. Otherwise, its interests are imperiled and its influence obnoxious to suspicion. There is nothing, however useful, however sacred it may be, that can claim exemption from the searching examination of this supreme tribunal, which has no respect of persons. The very existence of reason depends upon this freedom, for the voice of reason is not that of a dictatorial and despotic power. It is rather like the vote of the citizens of a free state, every member of which must have the privilege of giving free expression to his doubts, and possess even the right of veto. But while reason can never decline to submit itself to the tribunal of criticism, it has not always cause to dread the judgment of this court. Pure reason, however, when engaged in the sphere of dogmatism, is not so thoroughly conscious of a strict observance of its highest laws, as to appear before a higher judicial reason with perfect confidence. On the contrary, it must renounce its magnificent dogmatical pretensions in philosophy. Very different is the case when it has to defend itself, not before a judge, but against an equal. If dogmatical assertions are advanced on the negative side, in opposition to those made by reason on the positive side, its justification, kat athropon, is complete, although the proof of its propositions is kat alethian, unsatisfactory. By the polemic of pure reason I mean the defense of its propositions made by reason, in opposition to the dogmatical counter-propositions advanced by other parties. The question here is not whether its own statements may not also be false. It merely regards the fact that reason proves that the opposite cannot be established with demonstrative certainty, nor even asserted with a higher degree of probability. Reason does not hold her possessions upon sufferance for although she cannot show a perfectly satisfactory title to them, no one can prove that she is not the rightful possessor. It is a melancholy reflection that reason, in its highest exercise, falls into an antithetic, and that the supreme tribunal for the settlement of differences should not be at union with itself. 
It is true that we had to discuss the question of an apparent antithetic, but we found that it was based upon a misconception. In conformity with the common prejudice, phenomena were regarded as things in themselves, and thus an absolute completeness in their synthesis was required, in the one mode or in the other. It was shown to be impossible in both, a demand entirely out of place in regard to phenomena. There was, then, no real self-contradiction of reason in the propositions. The series of phenomena given in themselves has an absolutely first beginning, and this series is absolutely and in itself without beginning. The two propositions are perfectly consistent with each other, because phenomena as phenomena are in themselves nothing, and consequently the hypothesis that they are things in themselves must lead to self-contradictory inferences. But there are cases in which a similar misunderstanding cannot be provided against, and the dispute must remain unsettled. Take, for example, the theistic proposition, there is a supreme being, and on the other hand, the atheistic counterstatement, there exists no supreme being, or in psychology, everything that thinks possesses the attribute of absolute and permanent unity, which is utterly different from the transitory unity of material phenomena, and the counterproposition, the soul is not an immaterial unity, and its nature is transitory like that of phenomena. The objects of these questions contain no heterogeneous or contradictory elements, for they relate to things in themselves, and not to phenomena. There would arise, indeed, a real contradiction if reason came forward with a statement on the negative side of these questions alone. As regards the criticism to which the grounds of proof on the affirmative side must be subjected, it may be freely admitted without necessitating the surrender of the affirmative propositions, which have, at least, the interest of reason in their favor, an advantage which the opposite party cannot lay claim to. I cannot agree with the opinion of several admirable thinkers, Sulzer among the rest, that, in spite of the weakness of the arguments hitherto in use, we may hope, one day, to see sufficient demonstrations of the two cardinal propositions of pure reason, the existence of a supreme being and the immortality of the soul. I am certain, on the contrary, that this will never be the case. For on what ground can reason base such synthetical propositions, which do not relate to the objects of experience and their internal possibility? But it is also demonstratively certain that no one will ever be able to maintain the contrary with the least show of probability. For as he can attempt such a proof solely upon the basis of pure reason, he is bound to prove that a supreme being and a thinking subject in the character of pure intelligence are impossible. But where will he find the knowledge which can enable him to enounce synthetical judgments in regard to things which transcend the region of experience? We may, therefore, rest assured that the opposite never will be demonstrated. We need not, then, have recourse to scholastic arguments. We may always admit the truth of those propositions which are consistent with the speculative interests of reason in the sphere of experience, and form, moreover, the only means of uniting the speculative with the practical interest. Our opponent, who must not be considered here as a critic solely, we can be ready to meet with a non-liquid which cannot fail to disconcert him, while we cannot deny his right to a similar retort, as we have on our side the advantage of the support of the subjective maxim of reason, and can therefore look upon all his sophistical arguments with calm indifference. From this point of view there is properly no antithetic of pure reason, for the only arena for such a struggle would be upon the field of pure theology and psychology, but on this ground there can appear no combatant whom we need to fear. Ridicule and boasting can be his only weapons, and these may be laughed at as mere child's play. This consideration restores to reason her courage, for what source of confidence could be found if she, whose vocation it is to destroy error, 
were at variance with herself and without any reasonable hope of ever reaching a state of permanent repose everything in nature is good for some purpose even poisons are serviceable they destroy the evil effects of other poisons generated in our system and must always find a place in every complete pharmacopoeia the objections raised against the fallacies and sophistries of speculative reason are objections given by the nature of this reason itself and must therefore have a destination and purpose which can only be for the good of humanity for what purpose has providence raised many objects in which we have the deepest interest so far above us that we vainly try to cognize them with certainty and our powers of mental vision are rather excited than satisfied by the glimpses we may chance to seize it is very doubtful whether it is for our benefit to advance bold affirmations regarding subjects involved in such obscurity perhaps it would even be detrimental to our best interests but it is undoubtedly always beneficial to leave the investigating as well as the critical reason in perfect freedom and permitted to take sides of its own interests which are advanced as much by its limitation as by its extension of its views and which always suffer by the interference of foreign powers forcing it against its natural tendencies to bend to certain preconceived designs allow your opponent to say what he thinks reasonable and combat him only with the weapons of reason have no anxiety for the practical interests of humanity these are never imperiled in a purely speculative dispute such a dispute serves merely to disclose the antimony of reason which as it has its source in the nature of reason ought to be thoroughly investigated reason is benefited by the examination of a subject on both sides and its judgments are corrected by being limited it is not the matter that may give occasion to dispute but the manner for it is perfectly permissible to employ in the presence of reason the language of firmly rooted faith even after we have been obliged to renounce all pretensions to knowledge if we were to ask the dispassionate david hume a philosopher endowed in a degree that few are with a well-balanced judgment what motive induced you to spend so much labor and thought in undermining the consoling and beneficial persuasion that reason is capable of assuring us and presenting us with a determinate conception of a supreme being his answer would be nothing but the desire of teaching reason to know its own powers better and at the same time a dislike of the procedure by which that faculty was compelled to support foregone conclusions and prevented from confessing the internal weaknesses which it cannot but feel when it enters upon a rigid self-examination if on the other hand we were to ask priestly a philosopher who had no taste for transcendental speculation but was entirely devoted to the principles of empiricism what his motives were for overturning those two main pillars of religion the doctrines of the freedom of the will and the immortality of the soul in his view the hope of a future life is but the expectation of the miracle of resurrection this philosopher himself a zealous and pious teacher of religion could give no other answer than this i acted in the interest of reason which always suffers when certain objects are explained and judged by a reference to other supposed laws than those of material nature the only laws which we know in a determinate manner it would be unfair to decry the latter philosopher who endeavored to harmonize his paradoxical opinions with the interests of religion and to undervalue an honest and reflecting man because he finds himself at a loss the moment he has left the field of natural science the same grace must be accorded to hume a man not less well disposed and quite as blameless in his moral character and who pushed his abstract speculations to an extreme length because as he rightly believed the object of them lies entirely beyond the bounds of natural science and within the sphere of pure ideas what is to be done to provide against the danger which seems in the present case to menace the best interests of humanity 
the course to be pursued in reference to this subject is a perfectly plain and natural one let each thinker pursue his own path if he shows talent if he gives evidence of profound thought in one word if he shows that he possesses the power of reasoning reason is always the gainer if you have recourse to other means if you attempt to coerce reason if you raise the cry of treason to humanity if you excite the feelings of the crowd which can neither understand nor sympathize with such subtle speculations you will only make yourself ridiculous for the question does not concern the advantage or disadvantage which we are expected to reap from such inquiries the question is merely how far reason can advance in the field of speculation apart from all kinds of interest and whether we may depend upon the exertions of speculative reason or must renounce all reliance on it instead of joining the combatants it is your part to be a tranquil spectator of the struggle a laborious struggle for the parties engaged but attended in its progress as well as in its result with the most advantageous consequences for the interests of thought and knowledge it is absurd to expect to be enlightened by reason and at the same time to prescribe to her what side of the question she must adopt moreover reason is sufficiently held in check by its own power the limits imposed on it by its own nature are sufficient it is unnecessary for you to place over it additional guards as if its power were dangerous to the constitution of the intellectual state in the dialectic of reason there is no victory gained which need in the least disturb your tranquillity the strife of dialectic is a necessity of reason and we cannot but wish that it had been conducted long ere this with that perfect freedom which ought to be its essential condition in this case we should have had at an earlier period a matured and profound criticism which must have put an end to all dialectical disputes by exposing the illusions and prejudices in which they originated there is in human nature an unworthy propensity a propensity which like everything that springs from nature must in its final purpose be conducive to the good of humanity to conceal our real sentiments and to give expression only to certain received opinions which are regarded as at once safe and promotive of the common good it is true this tendency not only to conceal our real sentiments but to profess those which may gain us favor in the eyes of society has not only civilized but in a certain measure moralized us as no one can break through the outward covering of respectability honor and morality and thus the seemingly good examples which we see around us form an excellent school for moral improvement so long as our belief in their genuineness remains unshaken but this disposition to represent ourselves as better than we are and to utter opinions which are not our own can be nothing more than a kind of provisionary arrangement of nature to lead us from the rudeness of an uncivilized state and to teach us how to assume at least the appearance and manner of the good we see but when true principles have been developed and have obtained a sure foundation in our habit of thought this conventionalism must be attacked with earnest vigor otherwise it corrupts the heart and checks the growth of good dispositions with the mischievous weed of fair appearances i am sorry to remark the same tendency to misrepresentation and hypocrisy in the field of speculative discussion where there is less temptation to restrain the free expression of thought for what can be more prejudicial to the interests of intelligence than to falsify our real sentiments to conceal the doubts which we feel in regard to our statements or to maintain the validity of grounds of proof which we well know to be insufficient so long as mere personal vanity is the source of these unworthy artifices and this is generally the case in speculative discussions which are mostly destitute of practical interest and are incapable of complete demonstration the vanity of the opposite party exaggerates as much on the other side and thus the result is the same 
although it is not brought about so soon as if the dispute had been conducted in a sincere and upright spirit. But where the mass entertains the notion that the aim of certain subtle speculators is nothing less than to shake the very foundations of public welfare and morality, it seems not only prudent but even praiseworthy to maintain the good cause by illusory arguments, rather than to give to our supposed opponents the advantage of lowering our declarations to the moderate tone of a merely practical conviction, and of compelling us to confess our inability to attain to apodictic certainty in speculative subjects. But we ought to reflect that there is nothing in the world more fatal to the maintenance of a good cause than deceit, misrepresentation, and falsehood that the strictest laws of honesty should be observed in the discussion of a purely speculative subject is the least requirement that can be made. If we could reckon with security even upon so little, the conflict of speculative reason regarding the important questions of God, immortality, and freedom would have been either decided long ago, or would very soon be brought to a conclusion." but in general the uprightness of the defence stands in an inverse ratio to the goodness of the cause, and perhaps more honesty and fairness are shown by those who deny than by those who uphold these doctrines. I shall persuade myself, then, that I have readers who do not wish to see a righteous cause defended by unfair arguments. Such will now recognize the fact that, according to the principles of this critique, if we consider not what is, but what ought to be the case, there can be really no polemic of pure reason. For how can two persons dispute about a thing, the reality of which neither can present in actual or even impossible experience? Each adopts the plan of meditating on his idea for the purpose of drawing from the idea, if he can, what is more than the idea, that is, the reality of the object which it indicates? How shall they settle the dispute, since neither is able to make his assertions directly comprehensible and certain, but must restrict himself to attacking and confuting those of his opponent? All statements announced by pure reason transcend the conditions of possible experience, beyond the sphere of which we can discover no criterion of truth while they are at the same time framed in accordance with the laws of the understanding, which are applicable only to experience, and thus it is the fate of all such speculative discussions, that while the one party attacks the weaker side of his opponent, he infallibly lays open his own weaknesses. The critique of pure reason may be regarded as the highest tribunal for all speculative disputes, for it is not involved in these disputes, which have an immediate relation to certain objects and not to the laws of the mind, but is instituted for the purpose of determining the rights and limits of reason. Without the control of criticism, reason is, as it were, in a state of nature, and can only establish its claims and assertions by war. Criticism, on the contrary, deciding all questions according to the fundamental laws of its own institution, secures to us the peace of law and order, and enables us to discuss all differences in the more tranquil manner of a legal process. In the former case, disputes are ended by victory, which both sides may claim and which is followed by a hollow armistice in the latter by a sentence which, as it strikes at the root of all speculative differences, ensures to all concerned a lasting peace. The endless disputes of a dogmatizing reason compel us to look for some mode of arriving at a settled decision by a critical investigation of reason itself, just as Hobbes maintains that the state of nature is a state of injustice and violence, and that we must leave it and submit ourselves to the constraint of law, which indeed limits individual freedom, but only that it may consist with the freedom of others, and with the common good of all. This freedom will, among other things, permit of our openly stating the difficulties and doubts which we are ourselves unable to solve, 
without being decried on that account as turbulent and dangerous citizens. This privilege forms part of the native rights of human reason, which recognizes no other judge than the universal reason of humanity, and as this reason is the source of all progress and improvement, such a privilege is to be held sacred and inviolable. It is unwise, moreover, to denounce as dangerous any bold assertions against, or rash attacks upon, an opinion which is held by the largest and most moral class of the community, for that would be giving them an importance which they do not deserve. When I hear that the freedom of the will, the hope of a future life, and the existence of God have been overthrown by the arguments of some able writer, I feel a strong desire to read his book for I expect that he will add to my knowledge and impart greater clearness and distinctness to my views by the argumentative power shown in his writings. But I am perfectly certain, even before I have opened the book, that he has not succeeded in a single point, not because I believe I am in possession of irrefutable demonstrations of these important propositions, but because this transcendental critique which has disclosed to me the power and the limits of pure reason, has fully convinced me that, as it is insufficient to establish the affirmative, it is as powerless, and even more so, to assure us of the truth of the negative answer to these questions. From what source does this free thinker derive his knowledge that there is, for example, no supreme being? This proposition lies out of the field of possible experience, and therefore beyond the limits of human cognition. But I would not read at all the answer which the dogmatical maintainer of the good cause makes to his opponent, because I know well beforehand that he will merely attack the fallacious grounds of his adversary, without being able to establish his own assertions. Besides, a new illusory argument, in the construction of which talent and acuteness are shown, is suggestive of new ideas and new trains of reasoning, and in this respect the old and everyday sophistries are quite useless. Again, the dogmatical opponent of religion gives employment to criticism and enables us to test and correct its principles, while there is no occasion for anxiety in regard to the influence and results of his reasoning. But it will be said, must we not warn the youth entrusted to academical care against such writings? Must we not preserve them from the knowledge of these dangerous assertions, until their judgment is ripened, or rather until the doctrines which we wish to inculcate are so firmly rooted in their minds as to withstand all attempts at instilling the contrary dogmas from whatever quarter they may come? If we are to confine ourselves to the dogmatical procedure in the sphere of pure reason, and find ourselves unable to settle such disputes otherwise than by becoming a party in them, and setting counter-assertions against the statements advanced by our opponents, there is certainly no plan more advisable for the moment, but, at the same time, none more absurd and inefficient for the future than this retaining of the youthful mind under guardianship for a time, and thus preserving it, for so long at least, from seduction into error. But when, at a later period, either curiosity or the prevalent fashion of thought places such writings into their hands, will the so-called convictions of their youth stand firm? The young thinker, who has in his armory none but dogmatical weapons with which to resist the attacks of his opponent, and who cannot detect the latent dialectic which lies in his own opinions as well as in those of the opposite party, sees the advance of illusory arguments and grounds of proof which have the advantage of novelty, against as illusory grounds of proof destitute of this advantage, and which, perhaps, excite the suspicion that the natural credulity of his youth has been abused by his instructors. He thinks he can find no better means of showing that he has outgrown the discipline of his minority than by despising those well-meant warnings, and, knowing no system of thought but that of dogmatism, he drinks deep draughts of the poison that is to sap the principles in which his early years were trained. Exactly the opposite of the system here recommended ought to be pursued in academical instruction. 
This can only be effected, however, by a thorough training in the critical investigation of pure reason. For, in order to bring the principles of this critique into exercise as soon as possible, and to demonstrate them perfect even in the presence of the highest degree of dialectical illusion, the student ought to examine the assertions made on both sides of speculative questions step by step, and to test them by these principles. It cannot be a difficult task for him to show the fallacies inherent in these propositions, and thus he begins early to feel his own power of securing himself against the influence of such sophistical arguments, which must finally lose, for him, all their illusory power. And although the same blows which overturn the edifice of his opponent are as fatal to his own speculative structures, if such he has wished to rear, he need not feel any sorrow in regard to this seeming misfortune, as he has now before him a fair prospect into the practical region in which he may reasonably hope to find a more secure foundation for a rational system. There is accordingly no proper polemic in the sphere of pure reason. Both parties beat the air and fight with their own shadows as they pass beyond the limits of nature, and can find no tangible point of attack, no firm footing for their dogmatical conflict. Fight as vigorously as they may, the shadows which they hew down immediately start up again, like the heroes in Valhalla, and renew the bloodless and unceasing contest. But neither can we admit that there is any proper skeptical employment of pure reason, such as might be based upon the principle of neutrality in all speculative disputes. To excite reason against itself, to place weapons in the hands of the party on the one side as well as in those of the other, and to remain an undisturbed and sarcastic spectator of the fierce struggle that ensues, seems, from the dogmatical point of view, to be a part fitting only a malevolent disposition. But when the sophist evidences an invincible obstinacy and blindness, and a pride which no criticism can moderate, there is no other practicable course than to oppose to this pride and obstinacy similar feelings and pretensions on the other side, equally well or ill-founded, so that reason, staggered by the reflections thus forced upon it, finds it necessary to moderate its confidence in such pretensions, and to listen to the advice of criticism. But we cannot stop at these doubts, much less regard the conviction of our ignorance, not only as a cure for the conceit natural to dogmatism, but as the settlement of the disputes in which reason is involved with itself. On the contrary, skepticism is merely a means of awakening reason from its dogmatic dreams, and exciting it to a more careful investigation into its own powers and pretensions. But as skepticism appears to be the shortest road to a permanent peace in the domain of philosophy, and as it is the track pursued by the many who aim at giving a philosophical coloring to their contemptuous dislike of all inquiries of this kind, I think it necessary to present to my readers this mode of thought in its true light. Skepticism, not a permanent state for human reason. The consciousness of ignorance, unless this ignorance is recognized to be absolutely necessary, ought, instead of forming the conclusion of my inquiries, to be the strongest motive to the pursuit of them. All ignorance is either ignorance of things or of the limits of knowledge. If my ignorance is accidental and not necessary, it must incite me, in the first case, to a dogmatical inquiry regarding the objects of which I am ignorant, in the second, to a critical investigation into the bounds of all possible knowledge. But that my ignorance is absolutely necessary and unavoidable, and that it consequently absolves from the duty of all further investigation, is a fact which cannot be made out upon empirical grounds, from observation, but upon critical grounds alone, that is, by a thoroughgoing investigation into the primary sources of cognition. It follows that the determination of the bounds of reason can be made only on a priori grounds, 
while the empirical limitation of reason which is merely an indeterminate cognition of an ignorance that can never be completely removed can take place only a posteriori in other words our empirical knowledge is limited by that which yet remains for us to know the former cognition of our ignorance which is possible only on a rational basis is a science the latter is merely a perception and we cannot say how far the inferences drawn from it may extend if i regard the earth as it really appears to my senses as a flat surface i am ignorant how far this surface extends but experience teaches me that how far soever i go i always see before me a space in which i can proceed farther and thus i know the limits merely visual of my actual knowledge of the earth although i am ignorant of the limits of the earth itself but if i have got so far as to know that the earth is a sphere and that its surface is spherical i can cognize a priori and determine upon principles from my knowledge of a small part of this surface say to the extent of a degree the diameter and circumference of the earth and although i am ignorant of the objects which the surface contains i have a perfect knowledge of its limits and extent the sum of all the possible objects of our cognition seems to us to be a level surface with an apparent horizon that which forms the limit of its extent and which has been termed by us the idea of unconditioned totality to reach this limit by empirical means is impossible and all attempts to determine it a priori according to a principle are alike in vain but all the questions raised by pure reason relate to that which lies beyond this horizon or at least in its boundary line the celebrated david hume was one of those geographers of human reason who believe that they have given a sufficient answer to all such questions by declaring them to lie beyond the horizon of our knowledge a horizon which however hume was unable to determine his attention especially was directed to the principle of causality and he remarked with perfect justice that the truth of this principle and even the objective validity of the conception of a cause was not commonly based upon clear insight that is upon a priori cognition hence he concluded that this law does not derive its authority from its universality and necessity but merely from its general applicability in the course of experience and a kind of subjective necessity thence arising which he termed habit from the inability of reason to establish this principle as a necessary law for the acquisition of all experience he inferred the nullity of all the attempts of reason to pass the region of the empirical this procedure of subjecting the facta of reason to examination and if necessary to disapproval may be termed the censura of reason this censura must inevitably lead us to doubts regarding all transcendent employment of principles but this is only the second step in our inquiry the first step in regard to the subjects of pure reason and which marks the infancy of that faculty is that of dogmatism the second which we have just mentioned is that of skepticism and it gives evidence that our judgment has been improved by experience but a third step is necessary indicative of the maturity and manhood of the judgment which now lays a firm foundation upon universal and necessary principles this is the period of criticism in which we do not examine the facta of reason but reason itself in the whole extent of its powers and in regard to its capability of a priori cognition and thus we determine not merely the empirical and ever-shifting bounds of our knowledge but its necessary and eternal limits we demonstrate from indubitable principles not merely our ignorance in respect to this or that subject but in regard to all possible questions of a certain class thus skepticism is a resting place for reason in which it may reflect on its dogmatical wanderings and gain some knowledge of the region in which it happens to be that it may pursue its way with greater certainty but it cannot be its permanent dwelling place it must take up its abode only in the region of complete certitude 
whether this relates to the cognition of objects themselves or to the limits which bound all our cognition reason is not to be considered as an indefinitely extended plane of the bounds of which we have only a general knowledge it ought rather to be compared to a sphere the radius of which may be found from the curvature of its surface that is the nature of a priori synthetical propositions and consequently its circumference and extent beyond the sphere of experience there are no objects which it can cognize nay even questions regarding such suppositious objects relate only to the subjective principles of a complete determination of the relations which exist between the understanding conceptions which lie within this sphere we are actually in possession of a priori synthetical cognitions as is proved by the existence of the principles of the understanding which anticipate experience if any one cannot comprehend the possibility of these principles he may have some reason to doubt whether they are really a priori but he cannot on this account declare them to be impossible and affirm the nullity of the steps which reason may have taken under their guidance he can only say if we perceive their origin and their authenticity we should be able to determine the extent and limits of reason but till we can do this all propositions regarding the latter are mere random assertions in this view the doubt respecting all dogmatical philosophy which proceeds without the guidance of criticism is well grounded but we cannot therefore deny to reason the ability to construct a sound philosophy when the way has been prepared by a thorough critical investigation all the conceptions produced and all the questions raised by pure reason do not lie in the sphere of experience but in that of reason itself and hence they must be solved and shown to be either valid or inadmissible by that faculty we have no right to decline the solution of such problems on the ground that the solution can be discovered only from the nature of things and under pretense of the limitation of human faculties for reason is the sole creator of all these ideas and is therefore bound either to establish their validity or to expose their illusory nature the polemic of skepticism is properly directed against the dogmatist who erects a system of philosophy without having examined the fundamental objective principles on which it is based for the purpose of evidencing the futility of his designs and thus bringing him to a knowledge of his own powers but in itself skepticism does not give us any certain information in regard to the bounds of our knowledge all unsuccessful dogmatical attempts of reason are fascia which it is always useful to submit to the censure of the skeptic but this cannot help us to any decision regarding the expectations which reason cherishes of better success in future endeavors the investigations of skepticism cannot therefore settle the dispute regarding the rights and powers of human reason hume is perhaps the ablest and most ingenious of all skeptical philosophers and his writings have undoubtedly exerted the most powerful influence in awakening reason to a thorough investigation into its own powers it will therefore well repay our labors to consider for a little the course of reasoning which he followed and the errors into which he strayed although setting out on the path of truth and certitude hume was probably aware although he never clearly developed the notion that we proceed in judgments of a certain class beyond our conception of the object i have turned this kind of judgment synthetical as regard the manner in which i pass beyond my conception by the aid of experience no doubts can be entertained experience is itself a synthesis of perceptions and it employs perceptions to increment the conception which i obtain by means of another perception but we feel persuaded that we are able to proceed beyond a conception and to extend our cognition a priori we attempt this in two ways 
either through the pure understanding in relation to that which may become an object of experience or through pure reason in relation to such properties of things or of the existence of things as can never be presented in any experience this sceptical philosopher did not distinguish these two kinds of judgments as he ought to have done but regarded this augmentation of conceptions and if we may so express ourselves the spontaneous generation of understanding and reason independently of the impregnation of experience as altogether impossible the so-called a priori principles of these faculties he consequently held to be invalid and imaginary and regarded them as nothing but subjective habits of thought originating in experience and therefore purely empirical and contingent rules to which we attribute a spurious necessity and universality in support of this strange assertion he referred us to the generally acknowledged principle of the relation between cause and effect no faculty of the mind can conduct us from the conception of a thing to the existence of something else and hence he believed he could infer that without experience we possess no source from which we can augment a conception and no ground sufficient to justify us in framing a judgment that is to extend our cognition a priori that the light of the sun which shines upon a piece of wax at the same time melts it while it hardens clay no power of the understanding could infer from the conceptions which we previously possessed of these substances much less is there any a priori law that could conduct us to such a conclusion which experience alone can certify on the other hand we have seen in our discussion of transcendental logic that although we can never proceed immediately beyond the content of the conception which is given us we can always cognize completely a priori in relation however to a third term namely possible experience the law of its connection with other things for example if i observe that a piece of wax melts i can cognize a priori that there must have been something the sun's heat preceding which this law although without the aid of experience i could not cognize a priori and in a determinate manner either the cause from the effect or the effect from the cause hume was therefore wrong in inferring from the contingency of the determination according to law the contingency of the law itself and the passing beyond the conception of a thing to possible experience which is an a priori proceeding constituting the objective reality of the conception he confounded with our synthesis of objects in actual experience which is always of course empirical thus too he regarded the principle of affinity which has its seat in the understanding and indicates a necessary connection as a mere rule of association lying in the imitative faculty of imagination which can present only contingent and not objective connections the sceptical errors of this remarkably acute thinker arose principally from a defect which was common to him with the dogmatists namely that he had never made a systematic review of all the different kinds of a priori synthesis performed by the understanding had he done so he would have found to take one example among many that the principle of permanence was of this character and that it as well as the principle of causality anticipates experience in this way he might have been able to describe the determinate limits of the a priori operations of understanding and reason but he merely declared the understanding to be limited instead of showing what its limits were he created a general mistrust in the power of our faculties without giving us any determinate knowledge of the bounds of our necessary and unavoidable ignorance he examined and condemned some of the principles of the understanding without investigating all its powers with the completeness necessary to criticism he denies with truth certain powers to the understanding but he goes further and declares it to be utterly inadequate to the a priori extension of knowledge although he has not fully examined all the powers which reside in the faculty and thus the fate which always overtakes scepticism meets him too 
that is to say his own declarations are doubted for his objections were based upon facta which are contingent and not upon principles which can alone demonstrate the necessary invalidity of all dogmatical assertions as hume makes no distinction between the well-grounded claims of the understanding and the dialectical pretensions of reason against which however his attacks are mainly directed reason does not feel itself shut out from all attempts at the extension of an a priori cognition and hence it refuses in spite of a few checks in this or that quarter to relinquish such efforts for one naturally arms oneself to resist an attack and becomes more obstinate in the resolve to establish the claims he has advanced but a complete review of the powers of reason and the conviction thence arising that we are in possession of a limited field of action while we must admit the vanity of higher claims puts an end to all doubt and dispute and induces reason to rest satisfied with the undisturbed possession of its limited domain to the uncritical dogmatist who has not surveyed the sphere of his understanding nor determined in accordance with principles the limits of possible cognition who consequently is ignorant of his own powers and believes he will discover them by the attempts he makes in the field of cognition these attacks of scepticism are not only dangerous but destructive for if there is one proposition in his chain of reasoning which he cannot prove or the fallacy in which he cannot evolve in accordance with a principle suspicion falls on all his statements however plausible they may appear and thus scepticism the bane of dogmatical philosophy conducts us to a sound investigation into the understanding and the reason when we are thus far advanced we need fear no further attacks for the limits of our domain are clearly marked out and we can make no claims nor become involved in any disputes regarding the region that lies beyond these limits thus the skeptical procedure in philosophy does not present any solution of the problems of reason but it forms an excellent exercise for its powers awakening its circumspection and indicating the means whereby it may most fully establish its claims to its legitimate possessions End of Discipline of Pure Reason in Polemics Section 42 The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant Transcendental Doctrine of Method Chapter 1. The Discipline of Pure Reason. Section 3. The Discipline of Pure Reason in Hypothesis. This critique of reason has now taught us that all its efforts to extend the bounds of knowledge by means of pure speculation are utterly fruitless. So much the wider field, it may appear, lies open to hypothesis as where we cannot know with certainty we are at liberty to make guesses and to form suppositions imagination may be allowed under the strict surveillance of reason to invent suppositions but these must be based on something that is perfectly certain and that is the possibility of the object if we are well assured upon this point it is allowable to have recourse to supposition in regard to the reality of the object but this supposition must unless it is utterly groundless be connected as its ground of explanation with that which is really given and absolutely certain such a supposition is termed a hypothesis it is beyond our power to form the least conception a priori of the possibility of dynamical connection in phenomena and the category of the pure understanding will not enable us to cogitate any such connection but merely helps us to understand it when we meet with it in experience for this reason we cannot in accordance with the categories imagine or invent any object or any property of an object not given or that may not be given in experience and employ it in a hypothesis 
otherwise we should be basing our chain of reasoning upon the mere chimerical fancies and not upon conceptions of things thus we have no right to assume the existence of new powers not existing in nature for example an understanding with a non-sensuous intuition a force of attraction without contact or some new kind of substances occupying space and yet without the property of impenetrability and consequently we cannot assume that there is any other kind of community among substances than that observable in experience any kind of presence than that in space or any kind of duration than that in time in one word the conditions of possible experience are for reason the only conditions of the possibility of things reason cannot venture to form independently of these conditions any conceptions of things because such conceptions although not self-contradictory are without object and without application the conceptions of reason are as we have already shown mere ideas and do not relate to any object in any kind of experience at the same time they do not indicate imaginary or possible objects they are purely problematical in their nature and as aids to the heuristic exercise of the faculties form the basis of the regulative principles for the systematic employment of the understanding in the field of experience if we leave this ground of experience they become mere fictions of thought the possibility of which is quite indemonstrable and they cannot consequently be employed as hypotheses in the explanation of real phenomena it is quite admissible to cogitate the soul as simple for the purpose of enabling ourselves to employ the idea of a perfect and necessary unity of all the faculties of the mind as the principle of all our inquiries into its internal phenomena although we cannot cognize this unity in concreto but to assume that the soul is a simple substance a transcendental conception would be announcing a proposition which is not only indemonstrable as many physical hypotheses are but a proposition which is purely arbitrary and in the highest degree rash the simple is never presented in experience and if by substance is here meant the permanent object of sensuous intuition the possibility of a simple phenomenon is perfectly inconceivable reason affords no good grounds for admitting the existence of intelligible beings or of intelligible properties of sensuous things although as we have no conception either of their possibility or of their impossibility it will always be out of our power to affirm dogmatically that they do not exist in the explanation of given phenomena no other things and no other grounds of explanation can be employed than those which stand in connection with the given phenomena according to the known laws of experience a transcendental hypothesis in which a mere idea of reason is employed to explain the phenomena of nature would not give us any better insight into a phenomenon as we should be trying to explain what we do not sufficiently understand from known empirical principles by what we do not understand at all the principles of such a hypothesis might conduce to the satisfaction of reason but it would not assist the understanding in its application to objects order and conformity to aims in the sphere of nature must be themselves explained upon natural grounds and according to natural laws and the wildest hypotheses if they are only physical are here more admissible than a hyperphysical hypothesis such as that of a divine author for such a hypothesis would introduce the principle of ignava ratio which requires us to give up the search for causes that might be discovered in the course of experience and to rest satisfied with a mere idea as regards the absolute totality of the grounds of explanation in the series of these causes this can be no hindrance to the understanding in the case of phenomena because as they are to us nothing more than phenomena we have no right to look for anything like completeness in the synthesis of the series of their conditions transcendental hypotheses are therefore inadmissible and we cannot use the liberty of employing in the absence of physical hyperphysical grounds of explanation and this for two reasons 
first because such hypotheses do not advance reason, but rather stop it in its progress, secondly because this license would render fruitless all its exertions in its own proper sphere, which is that of experience. For when the explanation of natural phenomena happens to be difficult, we have constantly at hand a transcendental ground of explanation, which lifts us above the necessity of investigating nature, and our inquiries are brought to a close, not because we have obtained all the requisite knowledge, but because we abut upon a principle which is incomprehensible, and which, indeed, is so far back in the track of thought as to contain the conception of the absolutely primal being. The next requisite for the admissibility of a hypothesis is its sufficiency. That is, it must determine a priori the consequences which are given in experience and which are supposed to follow from the hypothesis itself. If we require to employ auxiliary hypotheses, the suspicion naturally arises that they are mere fictions, because the necessity for each of them requires the same justification as in the case of the original hypothesis, and thus their testimony is invalid. If we suppose the existence of an infinitely perfect cause, we possess sufficient grounds for the explanation of the conformity to aims, the order and the greatness which we observe in the universe, but we find ourselves obliged, when we observe the evil in the world and the exceptions to these laws, to employ new hypotheses in support of the original one. We employ the idea of the simple nature of the human soul as the foundation of all the theories we may form of its phenomena, but when we meet with difficulties in our way, when we observe in the soul phenomena similar to the changes which take place in matter, we require to call in new auxiliary hypotheses. These may, indeed, not be false, but we do not know them to be true, because the only witness to their certitude is the hypothesis which they themselves have been called in to explain. We are not discussing the above-mentioned assertions regarding the immaterial unity of the soul and the existence of a supreme being as dogmata which certain philosophers profess to demonstrate a priori, but purely as hypotheses. In the former case, the dogmatist must take care that his arguments possess the apodictic certainty of a demonstration. For the assertion that the reality of such ideas is probable is as absurd as a proof of the probability of a proposition in geometry. Pure abstract reason, apart from all experience, can either cognize nothing at all, and hence the judgments it announces are never mere opinions, they are either apodictic certainties, or declarations that nothing can be known on the subject. Opinions and probable judgments on the nature of things can only be employed to explain given phenomena, or they may relate to the effect, in accordance with empirical laws, of an actually existing cause. In other words, we must restrict the sphere of opinion to the world of experience and nature. Beyond this region, opinion is mere invention, unless we are groping about for the truth on a path not yet fully known, and have some hopes of stumbling upon it by chance. But although hypotheses are inadmissible in answers to the questions of pure speculative reason, they may be employed in the defense of these answers. That is to say, hypotheses are admissible in polemic, but not in the sphere of dogmatism. By the defense of statements of this character, I do not mean an attempt at discovering new grounds for their support, but merely the refutation of the arguments of opponents. All a priori synthetical propositions possess the peculiarity that, although the philosopher who maintains the reality of the ideas contained in the proposition is not in possession of sufficient knowledge to establish the certainty of his statements, his opponent is as little able to prove the truth of the opposite. This equality of fortune does not allow the one party to be superior to the other in the sphere of speculative cognition, and it is this sphere, accordingly, that is the proper arena of these endless speculative conflicts. But we shall afterwards show that, in relation to its practical exercise, reason has the right of admitting what, in the field of pure speculation, 
she would not be justified in supposing, except upon perfectly sufficient grounds, because all such suppositions destroy the necessary completeness of speculation, a condition which the practical reason, however, does not consider to be requisite. In this sphere, therefore, reason is mistress of a possession, her title to which she does not require to prove, which, in fact, she could not do. The burden of proof, accordingly, rests upon the opponent. But as he has just as little knowledge regarding the subject discussed, and is as little able to prove the non-existence of the object of an idea, as the philosopher on the other side is to demonstrate its reality, it is evident that there is an advantage on the side of the philosopher who maintains his proposition as a practically necessary supposition, melior est conditio possidentis, for he is at liberty to employ in self-defense the same weapons as his opponent makes use of in attacking him, that is, he has a right to use hypotheses not for the purpose of supporting the arguments in favor of his own propositions, but to show that his opponent knows no more than himself regarding the subject under discussion, and cannot boast of any speculative advantage. Hypotheses are, therefore, admissible in the sphere of pure reason only as weapons for self-defense, and not as supports to dogmatical assertions. But the opposing party we must always seek for in ourselves. For speculative reason is, in the sphere of transcendentalism, dialectical in its own nature. The difficulties and objections we have to fear lie in ourselves. They are like old but never superannuated claims, and we must seek them out and settle them once and forever, if we are to expect a permanent peace. External tranquillity is hollow and unreal. The root of these contradictions which lies in the nature of human reason must be destroyed, and this can only be done by giving it, in the first instance, freedom to grow, nay, by nourishing it, that it may send out shoots and thus betray its own experience. It is our duty, therefore, to try to discover new objections, to put weapons in the hands of our opponent, and to grant him the most favorable position in the arena that he can wish. We have nothing to fear from these concessions. On the contrary, we may rather hope that we shall thus make ourselves master of a possession which no one will ever venture to dispute. The thinker requires to be fully equipped the hypotheses of pure reason, which, although but leaden weapons, for they have not been steeled in the armory of experience, are as useful as any that can be employed by his opponents. If, accordingly, we have assumed, from a non-speculative point of view, the immaterial nature of the soul, and are met by the objection that experience seems to prove that the growth and decay of our mental faculties are mere modifications of the sensuous organism, we can weaken the force of this objection by the assumption that the body is nothing but the fundamental phenomenon to which, as a necessary condition, all sensibility, and consequently all thought, relates in the present state of our existence, and that the separation of soul and body forms the conclusion of the sensuous exercise of our power of cognition and the beginning of the intellectual. The body would, in the view of the question, be regarded not as the cause of thought, but merely as its restrictive condition, as promotive of the sensuous and animal, but as a hindrance to the pure and spiritual life, and the dependence of the animal life on the constitution of the body would not prove that the whole life of man was also dependent on the state of the organism. We might go still farther and discover new objections, or carry out to their extreme consequences those which have already been adduced. Generation in the human race, as well as among the irrational animals, depends on so many accidents of occasion, of proper sustenance, of the laws enacted by the government of a country, of vice even, that it is difficult to believe in the eternal existence of a being whose life has begun under circumstances so mean and trivial, and so entirely dependent upon our own control. As regards the continuance of the existence of the whole race, we need have no difficulties, for accident in single cases is subject to general laws, 
but in the case of each individual it would seem as if we could hardly expect so wonderful an effect from causes so insignificant but in answer to these objections we may adduce the transcendental hypothesis that all life is properly intelligible and not subject to changes of time and that it neither began in birth nor will end in death we may assume that this life is nothing more than a sensuous representation of pure spiritual life that the whole world of sense is but an image hovering before the faculty of cognition which we exercise in this sphere and with no more objective reality than a dream and that if we could intuit ourselves and other things as they really are we should see ourselves in a world of spiritual natures our connection with which did not begin at our birth and will not cease with the destruction of the body and so on we cannot be said to know what has been above asserted nor do we seriously maintain the truth of these assertions and the notions therein indicated are not even ideas of reason they are purely fictitious conceptions but this hypothetical procedure is in perfect conformity with the laws of reason our opponent mistakes the absence of empirical conditions for a proof of the complete impossibility of all that we have asserted and we have to show him that he has not exhausted the whole sphere of possibility and that he can as little compass that sphere by the laws of experience and nature as we can lay a secure foundation for the operations of reason beyond the region of experience such hypothetical defences against the pretensions of an opponent must not be regarded as declarations of opinion so soon as the opposite party renounces its dogmatical conceit to maintain a simply negative position in relation to propositions which rest on an insecure foundation well befits the moderation of a true philosopher but to uphold the objections urged against an opponent as proofs of the opposite statement is a proceeding just as unwarrantable and arrogant as it is to attack the position of a philosopher who advances affirmative propositions regarding such a subject it is evident therefore that hypotheses in the speculative sphere are valid not as independent propositions but only relatively to opposite transcendent assumptions for to make the principles of possible experience conditions of the possibility of things in general is just as transcendent a procedure as to maintain the objective reality of ideas which can be applied to no objects except such as lie within the limits of possible experience the judgments announced by pure reason must be necessary or they must not be announced at all reason cannot trouble herself with opinions but the hypotheses we have been discussing are merely problematical judgments which can neither be confuted nor proved while therefore they are not personal opinions they are indispensable as answers to objections which are liable to be raised but we must take care to confine them to this function and guard against any assumption on their part of absolute validity a proceeding which would involve reason in inextricable difficulties and contradictions end of the discipline of pure reason in hypothesis section forty three the Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant Transcendental Doctrine of Method Chapter 1. The Discipline of Pure Reason Section 4. The Discipline of Pure Reason in Relation to Proofs It is a peculiarity which distinguishes the proofs of transcendental synthetical propositions from those of all other a priori synthetical cognitions that reason in the case of the former does not apply its conceptions directly to an object but is first obliged to prove a priori the objective validity of these conceptions and the possibility of their syntheses this is not merely a prudential rule it is essential to the very possibility of the proof of a transcendental proposition if i am required to pass a priori beyond the conception of an object 
I find that it is utterly impossible without the guidance of something which is not contained in the conception. In mathematics it is a priori intuition that guides my synthesis, and, in this case, all our conclusions may be drawn immediately from pure intuition. In transcendental cognition, so long as we are dealing only with the conceptions of the understanding, we are guided by possible experience. That is to say, a proof in the sphere of transcendental cognition does not show that the given conception, that of an event, for example, leads directly to another conception, that of a cause, for this would be a saltus, which nothing can justify, but it shows that experience itself, and consequently the object of experience, is impossible without the connection indicated by these conceptions. It follows that such a proof must demonstrate the possibility of arriving, synthetically and a priori, at a certain knowledge of things, which was not contained in our conception of those things. Unless we pay particular attention to this requirement, our proofs, instead of pursuing the straight path indicated by reason, follow the tortuous road of mere subjective association. The illusory conviction, which rests upon subjective causes of association, and which is considered as resulting from the perception of a real and objective natural affinity, is always open to doubt and suspicion. For this reason, all the attempts which have been made to prove the principle of sufficient reason have, according to the universal admission of philosophers, been quite unsuccessful, and, before the appearance of transcendental criticism, it was considered better, as this principle could not be abandoned, to appeal boldly to the common sense of mankind, a proceeding which always proves that the problem, which reason ought to solve, is one in which philosophers find great difficulties, rather than attempt to discover new dogmatical proofs. But if the proposition to be proved is a proposition of pure reason, and if I aim at passing beyond my empirical conceptions by the aid of mere ideas, it is necessary that the proof should first show that such a step in synthesis is possible, which it is not, before it proceeds to prove the truth of the proposition itself. The so-called proof of the simple nature of the soul from the unity of a perception is a very plausible one, but it contains no answer to the objection that, as the notion of absolute simplicity is not a conception which is directly applicable to a perception, but is an idea which must be inferred, if at all from observation, it is by no means evident how the mere fact of consciousness, which is contained in all thought, although in so far a simple representation, can conduct me to the consciousness and cognition of a thing, which is purely a thinking substance. When I represent to my mind the power of my body as in motion, my body in this thought is so far absolute unity, and my representation of it is a simple one, and hence I can indicate this representation by the motion of a point, because I have made abstraction of the size or volume of the body. But I cannot hence infer that given merely the moving power of a body, the body may be cogitated as simple substance, merely because the representation in my mind takes no account of its content in space, and is consequently simple. The simple in abstraction is very different from the objectively simple, and hence the ego, which is simple in the first sense, may, in the second sense, as indicating the soul itself, be a very complex conception with a very various content. Thus it is evident that in all such arguments there lurks a paralogism. We guess, for without some such surmise our suspicion would not be excited in reference to a proof of this character, at the presence of the paralogism, by keeping ever before us a criterion of the possibility of those synthetical propositions which aim at proving more than experience can teach us. This criterion is obtained from the observation that such proofs do not lead us directly from the subject of the proposition to be proved to the required predicate, but find it necessary to presuppose the possibility of extending our cognition a priori by means of ideas. We must accordingly always use the greatest caution, 
we require before attempting any proof to consider how it is possible to extend the sphere of cognition by the operations of pure reason and from which source we are to derive knowledge which is not obtained from the analysis of conceptions nor relates by anticipation to possible experience we shall thus spare ourselves much severe and fruitless labor by not expecting from reason what is beyond its power or rather by subjecting it to discipline and teaching it to moderate its vehement desires for the extension of the sphere of cognition the first rule for our guidance is therefore not to attempt a transcendental proof before we have considered from what source we are to derive the principles upon which the proof is to be based and what right we have to expect that our conclusions from these principles will be veracious if they are principles of the understanding it is vain to expect that we should attain by their means to ideas of pure reason for these principles are valid only in regard to objects of possible experience if they are principles of pure reason our labor is alike in vain for the principles of reason if employed as objective are without exception dialectical and possess no validity or truth except as regulative principles of the systematic employment of reason in experience but when such delusive proofs are presented to us it is our duty to meet them with the non-liquid of a matured judgment and although we are unable to expose the particular sophism upon which the proof is based we have a right to demand a deduction of the principles employed in it and if these principles have their origin in pure reason alone such a deduction is absolutely impossible and thus it is unnecessary that we should trouble ourselves with the exposure and confutation of every sophistical illusion we may at once bring all dialectic which is inexhaustible in the production of fallacies before the bar of critical reason which tests the principles upon which all dialectical procedure is based the second peculiarity of transcendental proof is that a transcendental proposition cannot rest upon more than a single proof if i am drawing conclusions not from conceptions but from intuition corresponding to a conception be it pure intuition as in mathematics or empirical as in natural science the intuition which forms the basis of my inferences presents me with materials for many synthetical propositions which i can connect in various modes while as it is allowable to proceed from different points in the intention i can arrive by different paths at the same proposition but every transcendental proposition sets out from a conception and posits the synthetical condition of the possibility of an object according to this conception there must therefore be but one ground of proof because it is the conception alone which determines the object and thus the proof cannot contain anything more than the determination of the object according to the conception in our transcendental analytic for example we infer the principle every event has a cause from the only condition of the objective possibility of our conception of an event this is that an event cannot be determined in time and consequently cannot form a part of experience unless it stands under this dynamical law this is the only possible ground of proof for our conception of an event possesses objective validity that is is a true conception only because the law of causality determines an object to which it can refer other arguments in support of this principle have been attempted such as that from the contingent nature of a phenomenon but when this argument is considered we can discover no criterion of contingency except the fact of an event of something happening that is to say the existence which is preceded by the non-existence of an object and thus we fall back on the very thing to be proved if the proposition every thinking being is simple is to be proved we keep to the conception of the ego which is simple and to which all thought has a relation the same is the case with the transcendental proof of the existence of a deity which is based solely upon the harmony and reciprocal fitness of the conceptions of an ens realissimum and a necessary being and cannot be attempted in any other manner 
This caution serves to simplify very much the criticism of all propositions of reason. When reason employs conceptions alone, only one proof of its thesis is possible, if any. When, therefore, the dogmatist advances with ten arguments in favor of a proposition, we may be sure that not one of them is conclusive. For if he possessed one which proved the proposition he brings forward to demonstration, as must always be the case with the propositions of pure reason, what need is there for any more? His intention can only be similar to that of the advocate, who had different arguments for different judges, this availing himself of the weakness of those who examine his arguments, who, without going into any profound investigation, adopt the view of the case which seems most probable at first sight, and decide according to it. The third rule for the guidance of pure reason in the conduct of a proof is that all transcendental proofs must never be apogogic or indirect, but always ostensive or direct. The direct or ostensive proof not only establishes the truth of the proposition to be proved, but exposes the grounds of its truth. The apogogic, on the other hand, may assure us of the truth of the proposition, but it cannot enable us to comprehend the grounds of its possibility. The latter is, accordingly, rather an auxiliary to an argument than a strictly philosophical and rational mode of procedure. In one respect, however, they have an advantage over direct proofs. From the fact that the mode of arguing by contradiction, which they employ, renders our understanding of the question more clear, and approximates the proof to the certainty of an intuitional demonstration. The true reason why indirect proofs are employed in different sciences is this. When the grounds upon which we seek to base a cognition are too various or too profound, we try whether or not we may not discover the truth of our cognition from its consequences. The modus ponens of reasoning from the truth of its inferences to the truth of a proposition would be admissible if all the inferences that can be drawn from it are known to be true, for in this case there can be only one possible ground for these inferences, and that is the true one. But this is a quite impracticable procedure, as it surpasses all our powers to discover all the possible inferences that can be drawn from a proposition. But this mode of reasoning is employed, under favor, when we wish to prove the truth of a hypothesis, in which case we admit the truth of the conclusion, which is supported by analogy. That is, if all the inferences we have drawn and examined agree with the proposition assumed, all other possible inferences will also agree with it. But, in this way, an hypothesis can never be established as a demonstrated truth. The modus tollens of reasoning from known inferences to the unknown proposition is not only a rigorous but a very easy mode of proof. For, if it can be shown that but one inference from a proposition is false, then the proposition must itself be false. Instead, then, of examining in an ostensive argument the whole series of the grounds on which the truth of a proposition rests, we need only take the opposite of this proposition, and if one inference from it be false, then must the opposite be itself false, and consequently the proposition which we wish to prove must be true. The apagogic method of proof is admissible only in those sciences where it is impossible to mistake a subjective representation for an objective cognition. Where this is possible, it is plain that the opposite of a given proposition may contradict merely the subjective conditions of thought, and not the objective cognition. Or it may happen that both propositions contradict each other only under a subjective condition, which is incorrectly considered to be objective, and, as the condition is itself false, both propositions may be false and it will, consequently, be impossible to conclude the truth of the one from the falseness of the other. In mathematics, such subreptions are impossible, and it is in this science, accordingly, that the indirect mode of proof has its true place. In the science of nature, where all assertion is based upon empirical intuition, 
Such subruptions may be guarded against by the repeated comparison of observations, but this mode of proof is of little value in this sphere of knowledge. But the transcendental efforts of pure reason are all made in the sphere of the subjective, which is the real medium of all dialectical illusion, and thus reason endeavors, in its premises, to impose upon us subjective representations for objective cognitions. In the transcendental sphere of pure reason, then, and in the case of synthetical propositions, it is inadmissible to support a statement by disproving the counterstatement. For only two cases are possible. Either the counterstatement is nothing but the announcement of the inconsistency of the opposite opinion with the subjective conditions of reason, which does not affect the real case. For example, we cannot comprehend the unconditioned necessity of the existence of a being, and hence every speculative proof of the existence of such a being must be opposed on subjective grounds, while the possibility of this being in itself cannot with justice be denied. Or, both propositions being dialectical in their nature, are based upon an impossible conception. In this latter case the rule applies, non entis nulla sunt predicata, that is to say, what we affirm and what we deny respecting such an object are equally untrue, and the apagogic mode of arriving at the truth is in this case impossible. If, for example, we presuppose that the world of sense is given in itself in its totality, it is false, either that it is infinite, or that it is finite and limited in space. Both are false because the hypothesis is false. For the notion of phenomena as mere representations, which are given in themselves as objects, is self-contradictory, and the infinitude of this imaginary whole would, indeed, be unconditioned, but would be inconsistent, as everything in the phenomenal world is conditioned, with the unconditioned determination and finitude of quantities which is presupposed in our conception. The apagogic mode of proof is the true source of those illusions which have always had so strong an attraction for the admirers of dogmatical philosophy. It may be compared to a champion who maintains the honor and claims of the party he has adopted by offering battle to all who doubt the validity of these claims and the purity of that honor, while nothing can be proved in this way except the respective strength of the combatants, and the advantage in this respect is always on the side of the attacking party. Spectators, observing that each party is alternately conqueror and conquered, are led to regard the subject of dispute as beyond the power of man to decide upon. But such an opinion cannot be justified, and it is sufficient to apply to these reasoners the remark, Non defensoribus istis, tempus egit. Each must try to establish his assertions by a transcendental deduction of the grounds of proof employed in his argument, and thus enable us to see in what way the claims of reason may be supported. If an opponent bases his assertions upon subjective grounds, he may be refuted with ease, not, however, to the advantage of the dogmatist, who likewise depends upon subjective sources of cognition, and is in like manner driven into a corner by his opponent. But if parties employ the direct method of procedure, they will soon discover the difficulty, nay, the impossibility, of proving their assertions, and will be forced to appeal to prescription and precedence, or they will, by the help of criticism, discover with ease the dogmatical illusions by which they had been mocked and compel reason to renounce its exaggerated pretensions to speculative insight, and to confine itself within the limits of its proper sphere, that of practical principles. End of The Discipline of Pure Reason in Relation to Proofs Section 44 the Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant Transcendental Doctrine of Method Chapter 2 The Canon of Pure Reason Introduction and Section 1 of The Ultimate End 
of the pure use of reason. It is a humiliating consideration for human reason that it is incompetent to discover truth by means of pure speculation, but, on the contrary, stands in need of discipline to check its deviations from the straight path and to expose the illusions which it originates. But, on the other hand, this consideration ought to elevate and to give it confidence, for this discipline is exercised by itself alone, and it is subject to the censure of no other power. The bounds, moreover, which it is forced to set to its speculative exercise, form likewise a check upon the fallacious pretensions of opponents, and thus what remains of its possessions, after these exaggerated claims have been disallowed, is secure from attack or usurpation. The greatest, and perhaps the only, use of all philosophy of pure reason is, accordingly, of a purely negative character. It is not an organon for the extension, but a discipline for the determination of the limits of its exercise, and without laying claim to the discovery of new truths, it has the modest merit of guarding against error. At the same time, there must be some source of positive cognitions which belong to the domain of pure reason, and which become the causes of error only from our mistaking their true character, while they form the goal towards which reason continually strives. How else can we account for the inextinguishable desire in the human mind to find a firm footing in some region beyond the limits of the world of experience? It hopes to attain to the possession of a knowledge in which it has the deepest interest. It enters upon the path of pure speculation, but in vain. We have some reason, however, to expect that, in the only other way that lies open to it, the path of practical reason, it may meet with better success. I understand by a canon a list of the a priori principles of the proper employment of certain faculties of cognition. This general logic, in its analytical department, is a formal canon for the faculties of understanding and reason. In the same way, transcendental analytic was seen to be a canon of the pure understanding, for it alone is competent to enounce true a priori synthetical cognitions. But when no proper employment of a faculty of cognition is possible, no canon can exist. But the synthetical cognition of pure speculative reason is, as has been shown, completely impossible. There cannot, therefore, exist any canon for the speculative exercise of this faculty, for its speculative exercise is entirely dialectical, and consequently transcendental logic, in this respect, is merely a discipline and not a canon. If, then, there is any proper mode of employing the faculty of pure reason, in which case there must be a canon for this faculty, this canon will relate not to the speculative but to the practical use of reason. This canon we now proceed to investigate. Section 1. Of the Ultimate End of the Pure Use of Reason There exists in the faculty of reason a natural desire to venture beyond the field of experience, to attempt to reach the utmost bounds of all cognition by the help of ideas alone, and not to rest satisfied until it has fulfilled its course and raised the sum of its cognitions into a self-subsistent systematic whole. Is the motive for this endeavor to be found in its speculative or in its practical interests alone? Setting aside at present the results of the labors of pure reason in its speculative exercise, I shall merely inquire regarding the problems the solution of which forms its ultimate aim, whether reached or not, and in relation to which all other aims are but partial and intermediate. These highest aims must, from the nature of reason, possess complete unity, otherwise the highest interest of humanity could not be successfully promoted. The transcendental speculation of reason relates to three things, the freedom of the will, the immortality of the soul, and the existence of God. The speculative interest which reason has in those questions is very small, and for its sake alone we should not undertake the labor of transcendental investigation, a labor full of toil and ceaseless struggle. 
we should be loath to undertake this labor, because the discoveries we might make would not be of the smallest use in the sphere of concrete or physical investigation. We may find out that the will is free, but this knowledge only relates to the intelligible cause of our volition. As regards the phenomena or expressions of this will, that is, our actions, we are bound, in obedience to an inviolable maxim, without which reason cannot be employed, in the sphere of experience, to explain these in the same way as we explain all the other phenomena of nature, that is to say, according to its unchangeable laws. We may have discovered the spirituality and immortality of the soul, but we cannot employ this knowledge to explain the phenomena of this life, nor the peculiar nature of the future, because our conception of an incorporeal nature is purely negative, and does not add anything to our knowledge, and the only inferences to be drawn from it are purely fictitious. If, again, we prove the existence of a supreme intelligence, we should be able from it to make the conformity to aims existing in the arrangement of the world comprehensible, but we should not be justified in deducing from it any particular arrangement or disposition, or inferring anywhere it is not perceived. For it is a necessary rule of the speculative use of reason that we must not overlook natural causes, or refuse to listen to the teaching of experience, for the sake of deducing what we know and perceive from something that transcends all our knowledge. In one word, these three propositions are, for the speculative reason, always transcendent, and cannot be employed as imminent principles in relation to the objects of experience. They are, consequently, of no use to us in this sphere, being but the valueless results of the severe but unprofitable efforts of reason. If, then, the actual cognition of these three cardinal propositions is perfectly useless, while reason uses her utmost endeavors to induce us to admit them, it is plain that their real value and importance relate to our practical and not to our speculative interest. I term all that is possible through free will practical, but if the conditions of the exercise of free volition are empirical, reason can have only a regulative, and not a constitutive, influence upon it and is serviceable merely for the introduction of unity into its empirical laws. In the moral philosophy of prudence, for example, the sole business of reason is to bring about a union of all the ends, which are aimed at by our inclinations, into one ultimate end, that of happiness, and to show the agreement which should exist among the means of attaining that end. In this sphere, accordingly, Reason cannot present to us any other than pragmatical laws of free action for our guidance toward the aims set up by the senses, and is incompetent to give us laws which are pure and determined completely a priori. On the other hand, pure practical laws, the ends of which have been given by reason entirely a priori, and which are not empirically conditioned, but are, on the contrary, absolutely imperative in their nature, would be products of pure reason. Such are the moral laws, and these alone belong to the sphere of the practical exercise of reason and admit of a canon. All the powers of reason in the sphere of what may be termed pure philosophy are, in fact, directed to the three above-mentioned problems alone. These again have a still higher end, the answer to the question, what we ought to do. If the will is free, if there is a God, in a future world. Now, as this problem relates to our conduct in reference to the highest aim of humanity, it is evident that the ultimate intention of nature in the constitution of our reason has been directed to the moral alone. We must take care, however, in turning our attention to an object which is foreign. Footnote 78 All practical conceptions relate to objects of pleasure and pain and consequently, in an indirect manner, at least, to objects of feeling. But as feeling is not a faculty of representation, but lies out of the sphere of our powers of cognition, the elements of our judgments, in so far as they relate to pleasure or pain, that is, the elements of our practical judgments, 
do not belong to transcendental philosophy, which has to do with pure a priori cognitions alone. End footnote. To the sphere of transcendental philosophy, not to injure the unity of our system by digressions, nor, on the other hand, to fail in clearness by saying too little on the new subject of discussion. I hope to avoid both extremes, by keeping as close as possible to the transcendental, and excluding all psychological, that is, empirical, elements. I have to remark, in the first place, that at present I treat of the conception of freedom in the practical sense only, and set aside the corresponding transcendental conception, which cannot be employed as a ground of explanation in the phenomenal world, but is itself a problem for pure reason. A will is purely animal, arbitrium brutum, when it is determined by sensuous impulses or instincts only, that is, when it is determined in a pathological manner. A will, which can be determined independently of sensuous impulses, consequently by motives presented by reason alone, is called a free will, arbitrium liberum, and everything which is connected with this free will, either as principle or consequence, is termed practical. The existence of practical freedom can be proved from experience alone. For the human will is not determined by that alone which immediately affects the senses. On the contrary, we have the power, by calling up the notion of what is useful or hurtful in a more distant relation, of overcoming the immediate impressions on our sensuous faculty of desire. But these considerations of what is desirable in relation to our whole state, that is, is in the end good and useful, are based entirely upon reason. This faculty, accordingly, announces laws, which are imperative or objective laws of freedom, and which tell us what ought to take place, thus distinguishing themselves from the laws of nature, which relate to that which does take place. The laws of freedom or of free will are hence termed practical laws. Whether reason is not itself, in the actual delivery of these laws, determined in its turn by other influences, and whether the action which, in relation to sensuous impulses, we call free, may not, in relation to higher and more remote operative causes, really form a part of nature, these are questions which do not here concern us. They are purely speculative questions, and all we have to do, in the practical sphere, is to inquire into the rule of conduct which reason has to present. Experience demonstrates to us the existence of practical freedom as one of the causes which exist in nature, that is, it shows the causal power of reason in the determination of the will. The idea of transcendental freedom, on the contrary, requires that reason, in relation to its causal power of commencing a series of phenomena, should be independent of all sensuous determining causes, and thus it seems to be in opposition to the law of nature and to all possible experience. It therefore remains a problem for the human mind. But this problem does not concern reason in its practical use, and we have, therefore, in a canon of pure reason, to do with only two questions, which relate to the practical interest of pure reason. Is there a God, and is there a future life? The question of transcendental freedom is purely speculative, and we may therefore set it entirely aside when we come to treat of practical reason. Besides, we have already discussed this subject in the antinomy of pure reason. End of section 44 Section 45 The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant Transcendental Doctrine of Method Chapter 2 The Canon of Pure Reason Section 2 Of the Ideal of the Summum Bonum as a Determining Ground of the Ultimate End of Pure Reason Read by M. L. Cohen, Cleveland, Ohio April 2007 Section 2 Of the Ideal of the Summum Bonum as a Determining Ground of the Ultimate End of Pure Reason 
reason conducted us in its speculative use through the field of experience and as it can never find complete satisfaction in that sphere from thence to speculative ideas which however in the end brought us back again to experience and thus fulfilled the purpose of reason in a manner which though useful was not at all in accordance with our expectations it now remains for us to consider whether pure reason can be employed in a practical sphere and whether it will here conduct us to those ideas which attain the highest ends of pure reason as we have just stated them we shall thus ascertain whether from the point of view of its practical interest reason may not be able to supply us with that which on the speculative side it wholly denies us the whole interest of reason speculative as well as practical is centered in the three following questions one what can i know two what ought i to do three what may i hope the first question is purely speculative we have as i flatter myself exhausted all the replies of which it is susceptible and have at last found the reply to which reason must contend itself and with which it ought to be content so long as it pays no regard to the practical but from the two great ends of the attainment of which all these efforts of pure reason were in fact directed we remain just as far removed as if we had consulted our ease and declined the task at the outset so far then as knowledge is concerned this much at least is established that in regard to those two problems it lies beyond our reach the second question is purely practical as such it may indeed fall within the province of pure reason but still it is not transcendental but moral and consequently cannot in itself form the subject of our criticism the third question if i act as i ought to do what may i then hope is at once practical and theoretical the practical forms a clue to the answer of the theoretical and in its highest form speculative question for all hoping is happiness for its object and stands in precisely the same relation to the practical and the law of morality as knowing to the theoretical cognition of things and the law of nature the former arrives finally at the conclusion that something is prens, which determines the ultimate end and prens, because something ought to take place the latter that something is parens which operates as the highest cause and parens because something does take place happiness is the satisfaction of all our desires extensive in regard to their multiplicity intensive in regard to their degree and protensive in regard to their duration the practical law based on the motive of happiness i term pragmatical law friends or prudential rule close friends but that law assuming such to exist which has no other motive than the worthiness of being happy i term a moral or ethical law the first tells us what we have to do if we wish to become possessed of happiness the second dictates how we ought to act in order to deserve happiness the first is based upon empirical principles for it is only by experience that i can learn either what inclinations exist which desire satisfaction or what are the natural means of satisfying them the second takes no account of our desires or the means of satisfying them and regards only the freedom of a rational being and the necessary conditions under which alone this freedom can harmonize with the distribution of happiness according to the principles this second law may therefore rest upon mere ideas of pure reason and may be cognized a priori i assume that there are pure moral laws which determine entirely a priori parens, without regard to empirical motives that is to happiness close parens, the conduct of a rational being or in other words to use which it makes of its freedom and that these laws are absolutely imperative parens, not merely hypothetically on the supposition of other empirical ends close parens, and therefore in all respects necessary i am warranted in assuming this not only by the arguments of the most enlightened moralists but by the moral judgment of every man who will make the attempt to form a distinct conception of such a law 
Pure reason then contains not indeed in its speculative, but in its practical or more strictly its moral use, principles of the possibility of experience, of such actions namely as, in accordance with ethical precepts, might be met within the history of man. For since reason commands that such actions should take place, it must be possible for them to take place, and hence a particular kind of systematic unity, the moral, must be possible. We have found, it is true, that the systematic unity of nature could not be established according to speculative principles of reason, because, while reason possesses a causal power in relation to freedom, it has none in relation to the whole sphere of nature. And, while moral principles of reason can produce free actions, they cannot produce natural laws. It is, then, in its practical, but especially in its moral use, that the principles of pure reason possess objective reality. I call the world a moral world in so far as it may be in accordance with all the ethical laws, which, by virtue of the freedom of reasonable beings, it can be, and according to the necessary laws of morality, it ought to be. But this world must be conceived only as an intelligible world, inasmuch as abstraction is therein made of all conditions, parens, ends, and parens, and even of all impediments to morality, parens, the weakness or pravity of human nature, and parens. So far, then, it is a mere idea, though still a practical idea, which may have and ought to have an influence on the world of sense, so as to bring it as far as possible into conformity with itself. The idea of a moral world has, therefore, objective reality, not as referring to an object of intelligible intuition, for of such an object we can form no conception whatever, but to the world of sense, conceived, however, as an object of pure reason in its practical use, and to a corpus mysticum of rational beings in it, in so far as the liberum arbitrium of the individual is placed, under and by virtue of moral laws, in complete systematic unity both with itself and with the freedom of all others. That is the answer to the first of the two questions of pure reason, which relate to its practical interest. Do that which will render thee worthy of happiness. The second question is this. If I conduct myself so as not to be unworthy of happiness, may I hope thereby to obtain happiness? In order to arrive at the solution of this question, we must inquire whether the principles of pure reason, which prescribe a priori the law, necessarily also connect this hope with it. I say, then, that just as the moral principles are necessary according to reason in its practical use, so is it equally necessary according to reason in its theoretical use to assume that every one has a ground to hope for happiness in the measure in which he has made himself worthy of it in his conduct, and that therefore the system of morality is inseparably, parens, though only in the idea of pure reason, close parens, connected with that of happiness. Now, in an intelligible, that is, in the moral world, in the conception of which we make abstraction of all the impediments to morality, Parens, sensuous desires, and parens, such a system of happiness connected with and proportioned to morality may be conceived as necessary, because freedom of volition, partially incited and partially restrained by moral laws, would be itself the cause of general happiness, and thus rational beings, under the guidance of such principles, would be themselves the authors both of their own enduring welfare and that of others. But such a system of self-rewarding morality is only an idea, the carrying out of which depends upon the condition that everyone acts as he ought. In other words, that all actions of reasonable beings be such as they would be if they sprung from a supreme will, comprehending in or under itself all particular wills. But since the moral law is binding on each individual in the use of his freedom of volition, even if others should not act in conformity with this law, Neither the nature of things, nor the causality of actions and their relation to morality, determine how the consequences of these actions will be related to happiness. And the necessary connection of the hope of happiness with the unceasing endeavor to become worthy of happiness cannot be cognized by reason, if we take nature alone for our guide. This connection can be hoped for only on the assumption that the cause of nature is a supreme reason, which governs according to moral laws. I term the idea of an intelligence in which the morally most perfect will, united with supreme blessedness, 
is the cause of all happiness in the world, so far as happiness stands in strict relation to morality, parens, as the worthiness of being happy, close parens, the ideal of the supreme good. It is only, then, in the ideal of the supreme original good, that pure reason can find the ground of the practically necessary connection of both elements of the highest derivative good, and accordingly of an intelligible, that is, moral world. Now, since we are necessitated by reason to conceive ourselves as belonging to such a world, while the senses present to us nothing but a world of phenomena, we must assume the former as a consequence of our conduct in the world of sense, parens, since the world of sense gives us no hint of it, and parens, and therefore as future in relation to us. Thus God and a future life are two hypotheses which, according to the principles of pure reason, are inseparable from the obligation which this reason imposes upon us. Morality, per se, constitutes a system, but we can form no system of happiness except in so far as it is dispensed in strict proportion to morality. But this is only possible in the intelligible world, under a wise author and ruler. Such a ruler, together with life in such a world, which we must look upon as future, reason finds itself compelled to assume or it must regard the moral laws as idle dreams, since the necessary consequence which the same reason connects with them must, without this hypothesis, fall to the ground. Hence also the moral laws are universally regarded as commands, which they could not be, did they not connect a priori adequate consequences with their dictates, and thus carry with them promises and threats. But this again they could not do, did they not reside in a necessary being, as the supreme good, which alone can render such a teleological unity possible. Leibniz termed the world, when viewed in relation to the rational being which it contains, and the moral relations in which they stand to each other, under the government of the supreme good, the kingdom of grace, and distinguished it from the kingdom of nature, in which these rational beings live, under moral laws, indeed, but expect no other consequences from their actions than such as follows according to the course of nature in the world of sense. To view ourselves, therefore, as in the kingdom of grace, in which all happiness awaits us except in so far as we ourselves limit our participation in it by actions which render us unworthy of happiness, is a practically necessary idea of reason. Practical Laws in so far as they are subjective grounds of action, that is, subjective principles, are termed maxims. The judgments of morality, in its purity and ultimate results, are framed according to ideas, the observance of its laws according to maxims. The whole course of our life must be subject to moral maxims, but this is impossible unless with the moral law, which is a mere idea, reason connects an efficient cause which ordains to all conduct which is in conformity with the moral law an issue either in this or in another life, which is in exact conformity with our highest aims. Thus, without a God and without a world, invisible to us now but hoped for, the glorious ideas of morality are indeed objects of approbation of admiration, but cannot be the springs of purpose and action for they do not satisfy all the aims which are natural to every rational being, and which are determined a priori by pure reason itself, and necessary. Happiness alone is, in the view of reason, far from being the complete good. Reason does not approve of it, parens, however much inclination may desire it, and parens, except as united with desert. On the other hand, morality alone, and with it mere desert, is likewise far from being the complete good. To make it complete, he who conducts himself in a manner not unworthy of happiness must be able to hope for the possession of happiness. Even reason, unbiased by private ends or interested considerations, cannot judge otherwise if it puts itself in the place of being whose business it is to dispense all happiness to others. For in the practical idea both points are essentially combined, though in such a way that participation in happiness is rendered possible by the moral disposition as its condition, and not conversely, the moral disposition by the prospect of happiness. For a disposition which should require the prospect of happiness as its necessary condition would not be moral, and hence also would not be worthy of complete happiness, a happiness which, in the view of reason, 
recognizes no limitation but such as arises from its own immoral conduct. Happiness, therefore, in exact proportion with the morality of rational beings, parens, whereby they are made worthy of happiness, and parens, constitutes alone the supreme good of a world into which we absolutely must transport ourselves according to commands of pure but practical reason. The world is, it is true, only an intelligible world, for of such a systematic unity of ends as it requires, the world of sense gives us no hint. Its reality can be based on nothing else but the hypothesis of a supreme original good. In it, independent reason, equipped with all the sufficiency of a supreme cause, founds, maintains, and fulfills the universal order of things with the most perfect teleological harmony however much this order may be hidden from us in the world of sense. This moral theology has the peculiar advantage, in contrast with speculative theology, of leading inevitably to the conception of a sole, perfect, and rational first cause, whereof speculative theology does not give us any indication on objective grounds, far less any convincing evidence. For we find neither in transcendental nor in natural theology, however far reason may lead us in these, any ground to warrant us in assuming the existence of one only being, which stands at the head of all natural causes and on which these are entirely dependent. On the other hand, if we take our stand on moral unity as a necessary law of the universe, and from this point of view consider what is necessary to give this law adequate efficiency and, for us, obligatory force, we must come to the conclusion that there is one only supreme will which comprehends all these laws in itself for how under different wills should we find complete unity of ends this will must be omnipotent that all nature and relation to morality in the world may be subject to it omniscient that it may have knowledge of the most secret feelings and their moral worth omnipresent that it may be at hand to supply every necessity to which the highest wheel of the world may give rise eternal, that this harmony of nature and liberty may never fail, and so on. But this systematic unity of ends in this world of intelligences, which, as mere nature, is only a world of sense, but as a system of freedom of volition may be termed an intelligible, that is, moral world, parens regnum gratiae, close parens, leads inevitably also to the teleological unity of all things which constitute this great whole, according to universal natural laws just as the unity of the former is according to universal and necessary moral laws, and unites the practical with the speculative reason. The world must be represented as having originated from an idea if it is to harmonize with the use of reason without which we cannot even consider ourselves as worthy of reason, namely, the moral use, which rests entirely on the idea of the supreme good. Hence the investigation of nature receives a teleological direction, and becomes, in its widest extension, physico-theology. But this, taking its rise in moral order as a unity founded on the essence of freedom, and not accidentally instituted by external commands, establishes the teleological view of nature on grounds which must be inseparably connected with the internal possibility of things. This gives rise to a transcendental theology, which takes the ideal of the highest ontological perfection as a principle of systematic unity, and this principle connects all things according to universal and necessary natural laws, because all things have their origin in the absolute necessity of the one, only, primal being. What use can we make of our understanding, even in respect of experience, if we do not propose ends to ourselves? But the highest ends are those of morality, and it is only pure reason that can give us the knowledge of these. Though supplied with these, and putting ourselves under their guidance, we can make no teleological use of the knowledge of nature as regards cognition, unless nature itself has established teleological unity. For without this unity, we should not even possess reason, because we should have no school for reason, and no cultivation through objects which afford the materials for its conception. But ideological unity is a necessary unity and founded on the essence of the individual will itself. Hence this will, which is the condition of the application of this unity in concreto, must be so likewise. 
In this way, the transcendental enlargement of our rational cognition would be not the cause, but merely the effect of the practical teleology which pure reason imposes upon us. Hence, also, we find in the history of human reason that before the moral conceptions were sufficiently purified and determined, and before men had attended to the perception of systematic unity of ends according to the conceptions and from necessary principles, the knowledge of nature, and even a considerable amount of intellectual culture and many other sciences, could produce only rude and vague conceptions of the deity, sometimes even admitting of an astonishing indifference with regard to this question altogether. But the more enlarged treatment of moral ideas, which was rendered necessary by the extremely pure moral law of our religion, awakened the interest, and thereby quickened the perception of reason in relation to this object. In this way, without the help either of an extended acquaintance with nature or of a reliable transcendental insight, parens, for these having been wanting in all ages, close parens, a conception of the divine being was arrived at, which we now hold to be the correct one, not because speculative reason convinces us of its correctness, but because it accords with the moral principles of reason. Thus it is the pure reason, but only in its practical use, that we must describe the merit of having connected with our highest interest to cognition, of which mere speculation was able only to form a conjecture, but the validity of which it was unable to establish, and of having thereby rendered it, not indeed a demonstrated dogma, but a hypothesis absolutely necessary to the essential ends of reason. But a practical reason has reached this elevation, and has attained to the conception of a sole primal being as the supreme good, it must not, therefore, imagine that it has transcended the empirical conditions of its application, and risen to the immediate cognition of new objects. It must not presume to start from the conception which it has gained, and to deduce from it the moral laws themselves. For it was these very laws, the internal practical necessity of which led us to the hypothesis of an independent cause, or of a wise rule over the universe, who should give them effect. Hence we are not entitled to regard them as accidental and derived from the mere will of the ruler, especially as we have no conception of such a will except as formed in accordance with these laws. So far, then, as practical reason has the right to conduct us, we shall not look upon actions as binding on us, because they are the commands of God, but we shall regard them as divine commands because we are internally bound by them. We shall study freedom under the teleological unity which accords with the principles of reason. We shall look upon ourselves as acting in conformity with the divine will only in so far as we hold sacred the moral law which reason teaches us from the nature of actions themselves, and we shall believe that we can obey that will only by promoting the will of the universe in ourselves and in others. Moral theology is, therefore, only of imminent use. It teaches us to fulfill our destiny here in the world by placing ourselves in harmony with the general system of ends, and warns us against the fanaticism nay, the crime of depriving reason of its legitimate authority in the moral conduct of life, for the purpose of directly connecting this authority with the idea of the Supreme Being. For this would be, not an imminent, but a transcendent use of moral theology, and like the transcendent use of mere speculation, would inevitably pervert and frustrate the ultimate ends of reason. End of section 45 Section 46 The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant Transcendental Doctrine of Method Chapter 2 The Canon of Pure Reason Section 3 Of Opinion, Knowledge, and Belief This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Carl Manchester, 2007. The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant. Book 2, Chapter 3, Section 3. Of Opinion, Knowledge and Belief. 
The holding of a thing to be true is a phenomenon in our understanding which may rest upon objective grounds, but requires also subjective causes in the mind of the person judging. If a judgment is valid for every rational being, then its ground is objectively sufficient, and it is termed a conviction. If, on the other hand, it has its ground in the particular character of the subject, it is termed a persuasion. Persuasion is a mere illusion, the ground of the judgment which lies solely in the subject being regarded as objective. Hence a judgment of this kind has only private validity. It is only valid for the individual who judges, and the holding of a thing to be true in this way cannot be communicated. But truth depends upon agreement with the object, and consequently the judgments of all understandings, if true, must be in agreement with each other. Consentientia uni tertio consentient inter se. Conviction may, therefore, be distinguished from an external point of view, from persuasion, by the possibility of communicating it, and by showing its validity for the reason of every man. For in this case, the presumption, at least, arises that the agreement of all judgments with each other, in spite of the different characters of individuals, rests upon the common ground of the agreement of each with the object, and thus the correctness of the judgment is established. Persuasion, accordingly, cannot be subjectively distinguished from conviction, that is, so long as the subject views its judgment simply as a phenomenon of its own mind. But if we inquire whether the grounds of our judgment, which are valid for us, produce the same effect on the reason of others as on our own, we have then the means, though only subjective means, not indeed of producing conviction, but of detecting the merely private validity of the judgment, in other words, of discovering that there is in it the element of mere persuasion. If we can, in addition to this, develop the subjective causes of the judgment, which we have taken for its objective grounds, and thus explain the deceptive judgment as a phenomenon in our mind, apart altogether from the objective character of the object, we can then expose the illusion and need be no longer deceived by it, although, if its subjective cause lies in our nature, we cannot hope altogether to escape its influence. I can only maintain, that is, affirm as necessarily valid for every one, that which produces conviction. Persuasion I may keep for myself, if it is agreeable to me, but I cannot, and ought not, to attempt to impose it as binding upon others. Holding for true, or the subjective validity of a judgment in relation to conviction, which is, at the same time, objectively valid, has the three following degrees. Opinion, belief, and knowledge. Opinion is a consciously insufficient judgment, subjectively as well as objectively. Belief is subjectively sufficient, but is recognised as being objectively insufficient. Knowledge is both subjectively and objectively sufficient. Subjective sufficiency is termed conviction for myself. Objective sufficiency is termed certainty for all. I need not dwell longer on the explanation of such simple conceptions. I must never venture to be of opinion without knowing something, at least, by which my judgment, in itself merely problematical, is brought into connection with the truth, which connection, although not perfect, is still something more than an arbitrary fiction. Moreover, the law of such a connection must be certain. For if, in relation to this law, I have nothing more than opinion, my judgment is but a play of the imagination, without the least relation to truth. In the judgments of pure reason, opinion has no place. For as they do not rest on empirical grounds, and as the sphere of pure reason is that of necessary truth and a priori cognition, the principle of connection in it requires universality and necessity, and consequently perfect certainty, otherwise we should have no guide to the truth at all. Hence it is absurd to have an opinion in pure mathematics. We must know or abstain from forming a judgment altogether. The case is the same with the maxims of morality, for we must not hazard an action on the mere opinion that it is allowed, but we must know it to be so. 
In the transcendental sphere of reason, on the other hand, the term opinion is too weak, while the word knowledge is too strong. From the merely speculative point of view, therefore, we cannot form a judgment at all, for the subjective grounds of a judgment, such as produce belief, cannot be admitted in speculative inquiries, inasmuch as they cannot stand without empirical support, and are incapable of being communicated to others in equal measure. But it is only from the practical point of view that a theoretically insufficient judgment can be termed belief. Now the practical reference is either to skill or to morality, to the former when the end proposed is arbitrary and accidental, to the latter when it is absolutely necessary. If we propose to ourselves any end whatever, the conditions of its attainment are hypothetically necessary. The necessity is subjectively, but still only comparatively, sufficient, if I am acquainted with no other conditions under which the end can be attained. On the other hand, it is sufficient absolutely and for everyone, if I know for certain that no one can be acquainted with any other conditions under which the attainment of the proposed end would be possible. In the former case, my supposition, my judgment with regard to certain conditions, is a merely accidental belief. In the latter, it is a necessary belief. The physician may pursue some course in the case of a patient who is in danger, but is ignorant of the nature of the disease. He observes the symptoms, and concludes, according to the best of his judgment, that it is a case of phthisis. His belief is, even in his own judgment, only contingent. Another man might perhaps come nearer the truth. Such a belief, contingent indeed, but still forming the ground of the actual use of means for the attainment of certain ends, I term pragmatical belief. The usual test whether that which anyone maintains is merely his persuasion or his subjective conviction, at least that is, his firm belief, is a bet. It frequently happens that a man delivers his opinions with so much boldness and assurance that he appears to be under no apprehension as to the possibility of his being in error. The offer of a bet startles him and makes him pause. Sometimes it turns out that his persuasion may be valued at a ducat, but not at ten, for he does not hesitate, perhaps, to venture a ducat, but if it is proposed to stake ten, he immediately becomes aware of the possibility of his being mistaken, a possibility which has hitherto escaped his observation. If we imagine to ourselves that we have to stake the happiness of our whole life on the truth of any proposition, our judgment drops its air of triumph, and we take the alarm and discover the actual strength of our belief. Thus pragmatical belief has degrees, varying in proportion to the interests at stake. Now, in cases where we cannot enter upon any course of action in reference to some object, and where, accordingly, our judgment is purely theoretical, we can still represent to ourselves, in thought, the possibility of a course of action, for which we suppose that we have sufficient grounds, if any means existed, of ascertaining the truth of the matter. Thus we find in purely theoretical judgments an analogon of practical judgments, to which the word belief may properly be applied, and which we may term doctrinal belief. I should not hesitate to stake my all on the truth of the proposition, if there were any possibility of bringing it to the test of experience, that at least some one of the planets which we see is inhabited. Hence I say that I have not merely the opinion, but the strong belief on the correctness of which I would stake even many of the advantages of life, that there are inhabitants in other worlds. Now we must admit that the doctrine of the existence of God belongs to doctrinal belief. For, although in respect to the theoretical cognition of the universe, I do not require to form any theory which necessarily involves this idea as the condition of my explanation of the phenomena which the universe presents, but, on the contrary, am rather bound so to use my reason, as if everything were mere nature. Still, teleological unity is so important a condition of the application of my reason to nature, that it is impossible for me to ignore it, especially since, in addition to these considerations, 
abundant examples of it are supplied by experience but the sole condition so far as my knowledge extends under which this unity can be my guide in the investigation of nature is the assumption that a supreme intelligence has ordered all things according to the wisest ends consequently the hypothesis of a wise author of the universe is necessary for my guidance in the investigation of nature is the sole condition under which i can fulfil an end which is contingent indeed but by no means unimportant moreover since the result of my attempt so frequently confirms the unity of this assumption and since nothing decisive can be adduced against it it follows that it would be saying far too little to term my judgment in this case a mere opinion and that even in this theoretical connection i may assert that i firmly believe in god still if we use words strictly this must not be called a practical but a doctrinal belief which the theology of nature physico theology must also produce in my mind in the wisdom of a supreme being and in the shortness of life so inadequate to the development of the glorious powers of human nature we may find equally sufficient grounds for a doctrinal belief in the future life of the human soul the expression of belief is in such cases an expression of modesty from the objective point of view but at the same time of firm confidence from the subjective if i should venture to term this merely theoretical judgment even so much as a hypothesis which i am entitled to assume a more complete conception with regard to another world and to the cause of the world might then be justly required of me than i am in reality able to give for if i assume anything even as a mere hypothesis i must at least know so much of the properties of such a being as will enable me not to form the conception but to imagine the existence of it but the word belief refers only to the guidance which an idea gives me and to its subjective influence on the conduct of my reason which forces me to hold it fast though i may not be in a position to give a speculative account of it but mere doctrinal belief is to some extent wanting in stability we often quit our hold of it in consequence of the difficulties which occur in speculation though in the end we inevitably return to it again it is quite otherwise with moral belief for in this sphere action is absolutely necessary that is i must act in obedience with the moral law in all points the end is here incontrovertibly established and there is only one condition possible according to the best of my perception under which this end can harmonize with all other ends and so have practical validity namely the existence of a god and of a future world i know also to a certainty that no one can be acquainted with any other conditions which conduct to the same unity of ends under the moral law but since the moral precept is at the same time my maxim as reason requires that it should be i am irresistibly constrained to believe in the existence of god and in a future life and i am sure that nothing can make me waver in this belief since i should thereby overthrow my moral maxims the renunciation of which would render me hateful in my own eyes thus while all the ambitious attempts of reason to penetrate beyond the limits of experience end in disappointment there is still enough left to satisfy us in a practical point of view no one it is true will be able to boast that he knows that there is a god and a future life for if he knows this he is just the man whom i have long wished to find all knowledge regarding an object of mere reason can be communicated and i should thus be enabled to hope that my own knowledge would receive this wonderful extension through the instrumentality of his instruction no my conviction is not logical but moral certainty and since it rests on subjective grounds of the moral sentiment i must not even say it is morally certain that there is a god etc but i am morally certain that is my belief in god and in another world is so interwoven with my moral nature that i am under as little apprehension of having the former torn from me as of losing the latter 
The only point in this argument that may appear open to suspicion is that this rational belief presupposes the existence of moral sentiments. If we give up this assumption and take a man who is entirely indifferent with regard to moral laws, the question which reason proposes becomes then merely a problem for speculation and may, indeed, be supported by strong grounds from analogy, but not by such as will compel the most obstinate scepticism to give way. Footnote. The human mind, as I believe every rational being must of necessity do, takes a natural interest in morality, although this interest is not undivided and may not be practically in preponderance. If you strengthen and increase it, you will find the reason become docile, more enlightened, and more capable of uniting the speculative interest with the practical. But if you do not take care at the outset, or at least midway, to make men good, you will never force them into an honest belief. End footnote. But in these questions no man is free from all interest. For though the want of good sentiments may place him beyond the influence of moral interests, still even in this case, enough may be left to make him fear the existence of God and a future life, for he cannot pretend to any certainty of the non-existence of God and of a future life, unless, since it could only be proved by mere reason, and therefore apodeictically, he is prepared to establish the impossibility of both, which certainly no reasonable man would undertake to do. This would be a negative belief, which could not, indeed, produce morality and good sentiments, but still could produce an analogon of these, by operating as a powerful restraint on the outbreak of evil dispositions. But, it will be said, is this all that pure reason can effect in opening up prospects beyond the limits of experience? Nothing more than two articles of belief? Common sense could have done as much as this, without taking the philosophers to counsel in the matter. I shall not here eulogise philosophy for the benefits which the laborious efforts of its criticism have conferred on human reason, even granting that its merit should turn out in the end to be only negative. For on this point, something more will be said in the next section. But, I ask, do you require that that knowledge which concerns all men should transcend the common understanding, and should only be revealed to you by philosophers? The very circumstance which has called forth your censure is the best confirmation of the correctness of our previous assertions, since it discloses what could not have been foreseen, that nature is not chargeable with any partial distribution of her gifts in those matters which concern all men without distinction, and that, in respect to the essential ends of human nature, we cannot advance further, with the help of the highest philosophy, than under the guidance which nature has vouchsafed to the meanest understanding. End of section 3section 47 the critique of pure reason by immanuel kant transcendental doctrine of method chapter 3 the architectonic of pure reason read by m l cohen cleveland ohio april 2007 the architectonic of pure reason by the term architectonic i mean the art of constructing a system Without systematic unity, our knowledge cannot become science. It will be an aggregate and not a system. Thus, architectonic is the doctrine of the scientific in cognition, and therefore necessarily forms part of our methodology. Reason cannot permit our knowledge to remain in an unconnected and rhapsodistic state, but requires that the sum of our cognitions should constitute a system. It is thus alone that they can advance the end of reason. By a system I mean the unity of various cognitions under one idea. The idea is the conception, given by reason, of the form of a whole, in so far as the conception determines a priori not only the limits of its content, but the place which each of its parts is to occupy. The scientific idea contains, therefore, the end and the form of the whole which is in accordance with that end. 
the unity of the end to which all parts of the system relate and through which all have a relation to each other communicates unity to the whole system so that the absence of any part can be immediately detected from our knowledge of the rest and it determines a priori the limits of the system thus excluding all contingent or arbitrary additions the whole is thus an organism prens articulatio and prens and not an aggregate prens conservatio close prens it may grow from within prens per intersusceptionum close prens but it cannot increase by external additions prens per apocynicinum it is thus like an animal body the growth of which does not add any limb but without changing their proportions makes each in its sphere stronger and more active we require for the execution of the idea of a system a schema that is a content and an arrangement of parts determined a priori by the principle which the aim of the system prescribes a schema which is not projected in accordance with an idea that is from the standpoint of the highest aim of reason but merely empirically in accordance with the accidental aims and purposes parens, the number of which cannot be predetermined close parens, can give us nothing more than a technical unity but the schema which is originated from an idea parens, in which case reason presents us with aims a priori and does not look for them to experience close parens, forms the basis of an architectonical unity a science in the proper exception of that term cannot be formed technically that is from observation of the similarity existing between different objects and the purely contingent use we make of our knowledge in concreto with reference to all kinds of arbitrary external aims its constitution must be framed on architectonical principles that is its parts must be shown to possess an essential affinity and be capable of being deduced from one supreme and internal aim or end which forms the condition of the possibility of the scientific whole the schema of a science must give a priori the plan of it parens, monogramma, close parens, and a division of the whole into parts in conformity with the idea of the science and it must also distinguish this whole from all others according to certain understood principles no one will attempt to construct a science unless he have some idea to rest on as a proper basis but in the elaboration of the science he finds that the schema nay even the definition which he at first gave of the science rarely corresponds with his idea for this idea lies like a germ in our reason its parts undeveloped and hid even from microscopical observation for this reason we ought to explain and define sciences not according to the description which the originator gives of them but according to the idea which we find based in reason itself and which is suggested by the natural unity of the parts of the science already accumulated for it will often be found that the originator of a science and even his latest successors remain attached to an erroneous idea which they cannot render clear to themselves and that they thus file in determining the true content the articulation or systematic unity and the limits of their science it is unfortunate that only after having occupied ourselves for a long time in the collection of materials under the guidance of an idea which lies undeveloped in the mind but not according to any definite plan of arrangement nay only after we have spent much time and labor in the technical disposition of our materials does it become possible to view the idea of a science in a clear light and to project according to architectonical principles a plan of the whole in accordance with the aims of reason systems seem like certain worms to be formed by a kind of generatio equivoca by the mere confluence of conceptions and to gain completeness only with the progress of time but the schema or germ of all lies in reason and thus is not only every system organized according to its own idea but all are united into one grand system of human knowledge of which they form members for this reason it is possible to frame an architectonic of all human cognition the formation of which at the present time considering the immense materials collected or to be found in the ruins of old system would not indeed be very difficult our purpose at present is merely to sketch the plan of the architectonic of all cognition given by pure reason and we begin from the point where the main root of human knowledge divides into two one of which is reason by reason 
I understand here the whole higher faculty of cognition, the rational being, placed in contradistinction to the empirical. If I make complete abstraction of the content of cognition, objectively considered, all cognition is, from a subjective point of view, either historical or rational. Historical cognition is cognito ex status, rational, cognito ex principius. Whatever may be the original source of a cognition, it is, in relation to the person who possesses it, merely historical, if he knows only what has been given him from another quarter, whether that knowledge was communicated by direct experience or by instruction. Thus, the person who has learned a system of philosophy, say the Wolfian, although he has a perfect knowledge of all the principles, definitions, and arguments in that philosophy, as well as of the divisions that have been made by the system, he possesses really no more than a historical knowledge of the Wolfian system. He knows only what has been told to him. His judgments are only those which he has received from his teachers. Dispute the validity of a definition, and he is completely at a loss to find another. He has formed his mind on another's, but the imitative faculty is not the productive. His knowledge has not been drawn from reason, and although objectively considered, it is rational knowledge, subjectively it is merely historical. He has learned this or that philosophy, and is merely a plaster cast of a living man. Rational cognitions which are objective, that is, which have their source in reason, can be so termed from a subjective point of view only when they have been drawn by the individual himself from the sources of reason, that is, from principles. And it is in this way alone that criticism, or even the rejection of what has been already learned, can spring up in the mind. All rational cognition is, again, based either on conceptions or on the construction of conceptions. The former is termed philosophical, the latter mathematical. I have already shown the essential difference of these two methods of cognition in the first chapter. A cognition may be objectively philosophical and subjectively historical, as is the case with the majority of scholars and those who cannot look beyond the limits of their system, and who remain in a state of pupillage all their lives. But it is remarkable that mathematical knowledge, when committed to memory, is valid from the subjective point of view, as rational knowledge also, and that the same distinction cannot be drawn here, as is the case of philosophical cognition. The reason is that the only way of arriving at this knowledge is through the essential principles of reason, and thus it is always certain and indisputable, because reason is employed in concreto, but at the same time a priori, that is, in pure and therefore infallible intuition, and thus all causes of illusion and error are excluded. Of all the a priori sciences of reason, therefore, mathematics alone can be learned. Philosophy unless it be in an historical manner, cannot be learned. We can, at most, learn to philosophize. Philosophy is the system of all philosophical cognition. We must use this term in an objective sense, if we understand by it the archetype of all attempts at philosophizing, and the standard by which all subjective philosophies are to be judged. In this sense, philosophy is merely the idea of a possible science, which does not exist in concreto, but to which we endeavor in various ways to approximate, until we have discovered the right path to pursue, a path overgrown by the errors and illusion of sense, and the image we have hitherto tried to shape in vain has become a perfect copy of the great prototype. Until that time, we cannot learn philosophy. It does not exist. If it does, where is it? Who possesses it? And how shall we know it? We can only learn to philosophize, in other words, we can only exercise our powers of reasoning in accordance with the general principles, retaining at the same time the right of investigating the sources of these principles, of testing, and even of rejecting them. Until then, our conception of philosophy is only a scholastic conception, a conception, that is, of a system of cognition which we are trying to elaborate into a science all that we at present know being the systematic unity of thus cognition, and consequently the logical completeness of the cognition for the desired end. But there is also a cosmical conception, parens conceptus cosmicus, close parens, of philosophy, which has always formed the true basis of this term, especially when philosophy was personified and presented to us in the ideal of a philosopher.
In this view, philosophy is the science of the relation of all cognition to the ultimate and essential aims of human reason, open parens, teleologico rationis humani, close parens, and the philosopher is not merely an artist who occupies himself with conceptions, but a lawgiver, legislating for human reason. In this sense of the word, it would be in the highest degree arrogant to assume the title of philosopher and to pretend that we had reached the perfection of the prototype which lies in the idea alone. The mathematician, the natural philosopher, and the logician, how far the first may have advanced in rational, and the two latter in philosophical knowledge, are merely artists engaged in the arrangement and formation of conceptions. They cannot be termed philosophers. Above them all, there is the ideal teacher, who employs them as instruments for the advancement of the essential aims of human reason. Him alone can we call philosopher, but he nowhere exists. But the idea of his legislative power resides in the mind of every man, and it alone teaches us what kind of systematic unity philosophy demands in view of the ultimate aims of reason. This idea is, therefore, a cosmical conception. Footnote. By a cosmical conception, I mean one in which all men necessarily take an interest. The aim of a science must accordingly be determined according to scholastic conceptions, if it is regarded merely as a means to certain arbitrary proposed ends. End footnote. In view of the complete systematic unity of reason, there can only be one ultimate end of all the operations of the mind. To this all other aims are subordinate, and nothing more than means for its attainment. This ultimate end is the destination of man, and the philosophy which relates to it is termed moral philosophy. The superior position occupied by moral philosophy, above all other spheres the operations of reason, sufficiently indicates the reason why the ancients always included the idea, and, in an especial manner, a moralist in that of philosopher. Even at the present day, we call a man who appears to have the power of self-government, even although his knowledge may be very limited, by the name of philosopher. The legislation of human reason, or philosophy, has two objects, nature and freedom, and thus contains not only the laws of nature, but also those of ethics, at first in two separate systems, which finally merge into one grand philosophical system of cognition. The philosophy of nature relates to that which is, that of ethics to that which ought to be. But all philosophy is either cognition on the basis of pure reason, or the cognition of reason on the basis of empirical principles. The former is termed pure, the latter empirical philosophy. The philosophy of pure reason is either propedeutic, that is, an inquiry into the powers of reason in regard to pure a priori cognition, and is termed critical philosophy, or it is, secondly, the system of pure reason, a science containing the systematic presentation of the whole body of philosophical knowledge, true as well as illusory, given by pure reason, and is called metaphysic. This name may, however, be also given to the whole system of pure philosophy, critical philosophy included, and may designate the investigation into the sources or possibility of a priori cognition, as well as the presentation of the a priori cognitions which form a system of pure philosophy, excluding at the same time all empirical and mathematical elements. Metaphysic is divided into that of the speculative and that of the practical use of pure reason, and is accordingly either the metaphysic of nature or the metaphysic of ethics. The former contains all the pure rational principles, based upon conceptions alone, parens, and thus excluding mathematics, of all the theoretical cognition, the latter the principles which determine and necessitate a priori all action. Now moral philosophy alone contains a code of laws, for the regulation of our actions, which are deduced from principles entirely a priori. Hence the metaphysic of ethics is the only pure moral philosophy, and it is not based upon anthropological or other empirical considerations. The metaphysic of speculative reason is what is commonly called metaphysic in the more limited sense. But as pure moral philosophy properly forms a part of this system of cognition, 
we must allow it to retain the name of metaphysic, although it is not requisite that we should insist on so terming it in our present discussion. It is of highest importance to separate those cognitions which differ from others, both in kind and in origin, and to take great care that they are not confounded with those with which they are generally found connected. What the chemist does in the analysis of substrates, what the mathematician in pure mathematics is, in still higher degree, the duty of the philosopher, that of the value of each different kind of cognition, and the part it takes in the operations of the mind, may be clearly defined. Human reason has never wanted a metaphysic of some kind, since it attained a power of thought, or rather of reflection, but it has never been able to keep this sphere of thought and cognition pure from all admixture of foreign elements. The idea of a science of this kind is as old as speculation itself, and what mind does not speculate, either in the scholastic or in the popular fashion? At the same time, it must be admitted that even thinkers by profession have been unable clearly to explain the distinction between the two elements of our cognition, the one completely a priori, the other a posteriori, and hence the proper definition of a peculiar kind of cognition and with it the just idea of a science which has so long and so deeply engaged the attention of the human mind has never been established. When it was said, quote, metaphysics is the science of the first principles of human cognition, end quote, this definition did not signalize a peculiarity in kind, but only a difference in degree. These first principles were thus declared to be more general than others, but no criterion of distinction from empirical principles was given. Of these, some are more general, and therefore higher than others, and, as we cannot distinguish what is completely a priori from that which is known to be a posteriori, where shall we draw the line which is to separate the higher and so-called first principles from the lower and subordinate principles of cognition? What would be said if we were asked to be satisfied with the division of the epochs of the world into the earlier centuries and those following them? Quote, does the fifth or the 10th century belong to the earlier centuries?" End quote. It would be asked, in the same way I ask, does the conception of extension belong to metaphysics? You answer, yes. Well, that of body too? Yes. And that of a fluid body? You stop. You are unprepared to admit this, for if you do, everything will belong to metaphysics. From this, it is evident that the mere degree of subordination of the particular to the general cannot determine the limits of a science and that in the present case, we must expect to find a difference in the conceptions of metaphysics both in kind and in origin. The fundamental idea of metaphysics was obscured on another side by the fact that this kind of a priori cognition showed a certain similarity in character with the science of mathematics. Both have the property in common of possessing an a priori origin, but in the one, our knowledge is based upon conceptions, in the other, on the construction of conceptions. Thus, a decided dissimilarity between philosophical and mathematic cognition comes out, a dissimilarity which was always felt, but which could not be made distinct for want of an insight into the criteria of the difference. And thus it happened that, as philosophers themselves failed in the proper development of the idea of their science, the elaboration of the science could not proceed with a definite aim or under trustworthy guidance. Thus, too, philosophers, ignorant of the path they ought to pursue and always disputing with each other regarding the discoveries which each asserted he had made, brought their science into disrepute with the rest of the world, and finally even among themselves. All pure a priori cognition forms, therefore, in the view of the peculiar faculty which originates it, a peculiar and distinct unity. And metaphysic is the term applied to the philosophy which attempts to represent that cognition in this systematic unity. The speculative part of metaphysic, which has especially appropriated this appellation, that which we have called the metaphysic of nature, and which considers everything, as it is, prens, not as it ought to be, and prens, by means of a priori conceptions, is divided in the following manner. Metaphysic, in the more limited exception of the term, consists of two parts, transcendental philosophy and the physiology of pure reason. The former presents the system of all the conceptions and principles belonging to the understanding and the reason, and which relate to the objects in general, but not to any particular given objects. Prens, ontologia, close prens. The latter has nature for its subject matter, that is, the sum of given objects, 
whether given to the senses, or, if we will, to some other kind of intuition, and is accordingly physiology, although only rationalis. But the use of the faculty of reason in this rational mode of regarding nature is either physical or hyperphysical, or more properly speaking, imminent or transcendent. The former relates to nature, in so far as our knowledge regarding it may be applied in experience, parens in concreto, close parens, the latter to that connection of the objects of experience which transcends all experience. Transcendent philosophy has, again, an internal and an external connection with its object, both, however, transcending possible experience. The former is the physiology of nature as a whole, or transcendental cognition of the world, the latter of the connection with the whole of nature with a being above nature, or transcendental cognition of God. Imminent physiology, on the contrary, considers nature as the sum of all sensuous objects, consequently as it is presented to us, but still according to a priori conditions, for it is under these alone that nature can be presented to our minds at all. The objects of imminent physiology are of two kinds, one, those of the external senses or corporeal nature, two, the object of the internal sense, the soul, or in accordance with our fundamental conceptions of it, thinking nature. The metaphysics of corporeal nature is called physics, but as it must contain only the principles of an a priori cognition of nature, we must term it rational physics. The metaphysics of thinking nature is called psychology, and for the same reason is to be regarded as merely the rational cognition of the soul. Thus, the whole system of metaphysics consists of four principal parts. 1. Ontology. 2. Rational physiology. 3. Rational cosmology. and 4. Rational theology. The second part, that of the rational doctrine of nature, may be subdivided into two, physica rationalis and psychologia rationalis. Footnote. It must not be supposed that I mean by this appellation what is generally called physical generalis, and which is rather mathematics than a philosophy of nature. For the metaphysics of nature is completely different from mathematics, nor is it so rich in results, although it is of great importance as a critical test of the application of pure understanding and cognition to nature. For want of its guidance, even mathematicians, adopting certain common notions which are in fact metaphysical, have unconsciously crowded the theories of nature with hypotheses, the fallacy of which becomes evident upon the application of the principles of this metaphysics, without detriment, however, to the employment of mathematics in the sphere of cognition. End footnote. The fundamental idea of a philosophy of pure reason of necessity dictates this division. It is, therefore, architectonical, in accordance with the highest aims of reason, and not merely technical, or according to certain accidentally observed similarities existing between the different parts of the whole science. For this reason, though, is the division immutable and of legislative authority. But the reader may observe in it a few points to which he ought to demur, and which may weaken his conviction of its truth and legitimacy. In the first place, how can I desire an a priori cognition or metaphysic of objects, in so far as they are given a posteriori? And how is it possible to cognize the nature of things according to a priori principles, and to attain to a rational physiology? The answer is this. We take from experience nothing more than is requisite to present us with an object, friends in general, close friends, of the external or of the internal sense. In the former case, by the mere conception of matter parens, impenetrable and inanimate extension, close parens, in the latter, by the conception of a thinking being, given in the internal empirical representation, I think. As to the rest, we must not employ in our metaphysic of these objects any empirical principles, parens which add to the content of our conceptions by means of experience, for the purpose of forming by their help any judgments respecting these objects. Secondly, what place shall we assign to empirical psychology, which has always been considered a part of metaphysics, and from which, in our time, such important philosophical results have been expected, after the hope of constructing an a priori system of knowledge had been abandoned? I answer, it must be placed by the side of empirical physics or physics proper. That is, must be regarded as forming a part of applied philosophy the a priori principles of which are contained in pure philosophy, which is therefore connected, although it must not be confounded, with psychology. 
Empirical psychology must therefore be banished from the sphere of metaphysics, and is indeed excluded by the very idea of that science. In conformity, however, with scholastic usage, we must permit it to occupy a place in metaphysics, but only as an appendix to it. We adopt this course from motives of economy, as psychology is not yet full enough to occupy our attention as an independent study, while it is at the same time of too great importance to be entirely excluded or placed where it has still less affinity than it has with the subject of metaphysics. It is a stranger who has been long a guest, and we make it welcome to stay until it can take up a more suitable abode in a complete system of anthropology, dependent to empirical physics. The above is the general idea of metaphysics, which, as more was expected from it than can be looked for with justice, and as these pleasant expectations were unfortunately never realized, fell into general disrepute. Our critique must have fully convinced the reader that, although metaphysics cannot form the foundation of religion, it must always be one of its most important bulwarks, and that human reason, which naturally pursues a dialectical course, cannot do without this science, which checks its tendency towards dialectic and, by elevating reason to a scientific and clear self-knowledge, prevents the ravages which a lawless speculative reason would infallibly commit in the sphere of morals as well as in that of religion. We may be sure, therefore, whatever contempt may be thrown upon metaphysics by those who judge a science not by its own nature, but according to the accidental effects it may have produced, that it can never be completely abandoned, that we must always return to it as a beloved one who has for a time been estranged, because the questions with which it is engaged relate to the highest aims of humanity, and reason must always labor either to attain to settled views in regard to these, or to destroy those which others have already established." Metaphysics, therefore, that of nature as well as that of ethics, but in an especial manner the criticism which forms the propedeutic to all the operations of reason, forms properly that department of knowledge which may be termed, in the truest sense of the word, philosophy. The path which it pursues is that of science, which, when it has once been discovered, is never lost and never misleads. Mathematics, natural science, the common experience of men, have a high value as means for the most part to accidental ends, but at last also to those which are necessary and essential to the existence of humanity. But to guide them to this high goal they require the aid of rational cognition on the basis of pure conceptions, which, be it termed as it may, is properly nothing but metaphysics. For the same reason, metaphysics forms likewise the completion of the culture of human reason. In this respect it is indispensable setting aside altogether the influence which it exerts as a science. For its subject matter is the elements and highest maxims of reason, which form the basis of the possibility of some sciences and of the use of all. That, as a purely speculative science, it is more useful in preventing error than in the extension of knowledge, does not detract from its value. On the contrary, the supreme office of censor which it occupies assures to it the highest authority and importance. This office it administers for the purpose of securing order, harmony, and well-being to science, and of directing its noble and fruitful labors to the highest possible aim, the happiness of all mankind. End of section 47 Section 48 The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant Transcendental Doctrine of Method Chapter 4 The History of Pure Reason Recorded by Gesine The History of Pure Reason This title is placed here merely for the purpose of designating a division of the system of pure reason of which I do not intend to treat at present. I shall content myself with casting a cursory glance, from a purely transcendental point of view, that of the nature of pure reason, on the labours of philosophers up to the present time. They have aimed at erecting an edifice of philosophy, but to my eye this edifice appears to be in a very ruinous condition. It is very remarkable 
although naturally it could not have been otherwise, that in the infancy of philosophy the study of the nature of God and the constitution of a future world form the commencement rather than the conclusion, as we should have it, of the speculative efforts of the human mind. However rude the religious conceptions generated by the remains of the old manners and customs of a less cultivated time, the intelligent classes were not thereby prevented from devoting themselves to free inquiry into the existence and nature of God, and they easily saw that there could be no surer way of pleasing the invisible ruler of the world and of attaining to happiness in another world at least, than a good and honest course of life in this. Thus theology and morals formed two chief motives, or rather the points of attraction, in all abstract inquiries. But it was the former that especially occupied the attention of speculative reason, and which afterwards became so celebrated under the name of metaphysics. I shall not at present indicate the periods of time at which the greatest changes in metaphysics took place, but shall merely give a hasty sketch of the different ideas which occasioned the most important revolutions in this sphere of thought. There are three different ends in relation to which these revolutions have taken place. 1. In relation to the object of the cognition of reason, philosophers may be divided into sensualists and intellectualists. Epicurus may be regarded as the head of the former, Plato of the latter. The distinction here signalized, subtle as it is, dates from the earliest times and was long maintained. The former asserted that reality resides in sensuous objects alone, and that everything else is merely imaginary. The latter, that the senses are the parents of illusion, and that truth is to be found in the understanding alone. The former did not deny to the conceptions of the understanding a certain kind of reality, but with them it was merely logical. With the others, it was mystical. The former admitted intellectual conceptions, but declared that sensuous objects alone possessed real existence. The latter maintained that all real objects were intelligible, and believed that the pure understanding possessed a faculty of intuition apart from sense, which, in their opinion, served only to confuse the ideas of the understanding. 2. In relation to the origin of pure cognitions of reason, we find one school maintaining that they are derived entirely from experience, and another that they have their origin in reason alone. Aristotle may be regarded as the head of the empiricists, and Plato of the noologists. Locke, the follower of Aristotle in modern times, and Leibniz of Plato, although he cannot be said to have imitated him in his mysticism, have not been able to bring this question to a settled conclusion. The procedure of Epicurus in his sensual system, in which he always restricted his conclusions to the sphere of experience, was much more consequent than that of Aristotle and Locke. The latter especially, after having derived all the conceptions and principles of the mind from experience, goes so far in the employment of these conceptions and principles as to maintain that we can prove the existence of God and the existence of God and the immortality of the objects lying beyond the soul, both of them of possible experience, with the same force of demonstration as any mathematical proposition. 3. 
in relation to method. Method is procedure according to principles. We may divide the methods at present employed in the field of inquiry into the naturalistic and the scientific. The naturalist of pure reason lays down as his principle that common reason, without the aid of science, which he calls sound reason or common sense, can give a more satisfactory answer to the most important questions of metaphysics than speculation is able to do. He must maintain, therefore, that we can determine the content and circumference of the moon more certainly by the naked eye than by the aid of mathematical reasoning. But this system is mere mythology reduced to principles. And what is the most absurd thing in this doctrine, the neglect of all scientific means is paraded as a peculiar method of extending our cognition. As regards those who are naturalists because they know no better, they are certainly not to be blamed. They follow common sense, without parading their ignorance as a method which is to teach us the wonderful secret, how we are to find the truth which lies at the bottom of the well of Democritus. Quod sapio satis est mihi, non ego curo esse quod arcesilus eram nosique solones. Perseus is their motto, under which they may lead a pleasant and praiseworthy life without troubling themselves with the science, or troubling science with them. Footnote Satire 3.78-79 What I know is enough, for I don't care to be what Archesilus was, and the wretched Solons. End of footnote as regards those who wish to pursue a scientific method, they have now the choice of following either the dogmatical or the sceptical, while they are bound never to desert the systematic mode of procedure. When I mention in relation to the former the celebrated Wolf, and as regards the latter, David Hume, I may leave, in accordance with my present intention, all others unnamed. The critical path alone is still open. If my reader has been kind and patient enough to accompany me on this hitherto untravelled route, he can now judge whether, if he and others will contribute their exertions towards making this narrow footpath a high road of thought, that which many centuries have failed to accomplish may not be executed before the close of the present, namely to bring reason to perfect contentment in regard to that which has always, but without permanent results, occupied her powers and engaged her ardent desire for knowledge. End of chapter 4 And end of The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant Recorded by Gesine in January 2007